Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight we'll be continuing our journey through the art of war. And we're at, currently at chapter 11, uh, verse five. Uh, so we'll be starting there. Um, we're gonna be trying to get through this uh, chapter 11 this evening. So uh, we'll try and keep, uh, you know, uh, uh, comments brief, and then if we have time afterwards, we can come back to some anything that resonated with anybody. Uh, we'll have one reading, and then we'll go through Jason's translation, and then we'll open it up for comments from there. So with that, uh, James, would you mind uh, going ahead and reading number five? Not at all, Joseph. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thus the skillful general conducts his army just as though he were leading a single man willy-nilly by the hand. It is the business of a general to be quiet and thus ensure secrecy, upright and just, and thus maintain order. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances, and thus keep them in total ignorance. By altering his arrangements and changing his plans, he keeps the enemy without definite knowledge. By shifting his camp and taking circuitous routes, he prevents the enemy from anticipating his purposes. At the critical moment, the leader of the army acts like one who has climbed up a height and then kicks away the ladder behind him. He carries his men deep into hostile territory before he shows his hand. He burns his boats and breaks his cooking pots. Like a shepherd driving a flock of sheep, he drives his men this way and that, and noth nothing knows whither he is going. Thank you. Uh, to, I have a, you, a little more, yeah, yeah, a little more, I'm sorry. So, okay. Yeah. To muster his host and bring it to danger, this may be termed the business of the general. The different measures suited to the nine varieties of ground, the expediency of aggressive and defensive tactics, and the fundamental laws of human nature, these are things that must most certainly be studied. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, so we'll go to Amon. All right. Let me. Make sure, can everyone see my screen all right? Yes. Okay. You'll notice some variation here with the Giles and Jason's translation, um, mostly towards the end. Therefore, those who are good at military operations can take the army in hand like using one person without his choice. This is a general's business. To be calm and isolated, to be righteous and orderly, and to obscure the ears and eyes of officers and soldiers so they remain unwittingly oblivious. To alter the arrangements and to change the strategy so people remain ignorant. To alter his office residence and to take indirect routes so people may not predict anything. The commander should expect his army to move forward without any chance of returning like one climbs high and then has the ladder removed. The commander who takes his army deep into the land of a foreign warlord should make his army act like a launched crossbow bolt or like they have sunk the boats and broken the cooking pots, burning bridges behind them. He drives his army like a shepherd drives a flock. He drives them to go here and there. They don't know where to go. Mustering three armies of many people and leading them into a dangerous place is the business of a general. The adaptations of nine grounds, the strength of bending, defense, and stretching, offense, and the logic of human psychology are the subjects that must be examined. I was struck most distinctly by the choice of um, Giles to use these two words, wrenching, as the fundamental laws of humanity, I think he said, 
this wren we've encountered many times. It's a term for man or men, but Qing is a term that Jason translates as the human psychology. And the word itself can mean passion or feeling or um, emotion. And so to me, that was a very interesting choice on Giles' part because the very title of the Sun Tzu being Fa, Fa, that last word we've talked about long and hard as being the root for what was deemed legalism. So it can be translated as law. It's glaringly omitted in this last line. Nowhere does it actually say the word Fa anywhere along here. And so I'm curious as to Giles' translation choices. Um, Jason and I had an interesting time working on this one because so much is a little difficult to get both the meaning across and to stay as true as you can to the original Chinese. But I think he did a real great job. And I appreciate that he retained some of my uh, suggestions. Thank you, Amon. Um, and could you post the link in the chat just so everybody has it? Um, to the uh, translation. I'm not, does he want to share the one that we're editing or did he have another PDF version that he was sharing? Oh, he, um, I believe he may have had, he has been sharing a PDF version. Um, right. But yeah, so, um, all right, that's no problem. Um, we, we can just put it back on the screen if anybody has any questions. Absolutely. Uh, so from, there, we'll go ahead and start with James. Yeah, I was just going to respond to your uh, points about Giles. Um, the uh, where he says psychology, uh, laws of psychology. I, 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 Giles says the fundamental laws of human nature. So human nature is a little bit like psychology. I don't know if that if, 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 if human nature is a definite mistranslation. Um, I. I just think it was an interesting choice, given how much emphasis is on that word law. But yeah, I see where you're seeing the parallel. And what was the other one that uh, you noticed? That, um, that, that was, was probably the most primary. I also found it interesting. He omits the expression crossbow bolt, which is actually very clearly in the Chinese. He, but he what? Crossbow? Crossbow, crossbow bolt? Crossbow bolt, yeah. Oh, OK. So he left it out. OK, thank you. Um, are you, you finished with your comments, uh, James? That's all. I just wanted okay. to clarify uh, the Giles uh, bringing up of um, the, the substitution of human nature for psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting choice. Um, and I, I find it this whole, this, this is actually more about psychology than anything else. Um, John, you're next. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, look, that just picking up on uh, Erman said there, um, uh, in the uh, um, uh, Ralph Sawyer translation, it talks about um, the nine transformations of terrain, the advantages deriving from contraction and expansion, the patterns of human emotions must be investigated. So that was what you were saying, I want about emotions. So that's picked up in another translation. And um, this actually, this whole stanza that was just read, I think is really interesting because it links very, very much to other parts of the book. Um, and uh, um, in this translation, it talks about not releasing the crossbow, but it, it says uh, the general advances with them deep into the territory of the feudal lords and then releases the trigger. Um, and in a uh, previous uh, chapter, there was a talk of, of power being like constraint and release of the crossbow. So I, I guess they're um, coming back to that concept that your preparation constitutes the constraint of the crossbow and then your um, uh, momentum constitutes the release the, at the point of action. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing uh, I thought was interesting was when it talked about at the start there, um, in this, um, uh, um, uh, it talks about, ex thus one who excels at employing the army leads them by, uh, by the hand as if they're only one man so they cannot avoid it. Uh, where I noted that other translation, the Giles one seemed to indicate they where, where they uh, don't have autonomy to make a choice. So this this is going to that idea of um, um, uh, again earlier in this translation, it talked about um, uh, power being like water running down a hill. 
um, in that it, it blows with the force of gravity. It's not force, but rather it has a natural momentum to it. So I think that's a distinction. It's not a removal of control or autonomy uh, from the people who are following, but rather uh, uh, the setting the setting up of preparations in such a way that uh, they feel a sense of momentum irrespective of their thoughts. More like a Dallas perspective, uh, in the sense that it's just going and happening, uh, and they're in a state of flow. Yes. Um, oh, what so, John just said, can I, can I just throw one thing in? That, please, uh, really quick. Yeah, yeah, just the, the misinformation aspect of the general's uh, job here in letting out false things and leading people around, I think that it's even saying more than letting it flow like water. It's like constantly keeping the directedness, even through misinformation in your own ranks, guiding the entire process intentionally, which it speaks further against autonomy, even further. Mm -hmm. Nine percent. Thank. Go ahead. Uh, respond, and then we'll go on. We'll go to Quan. Just quickly um, on that uh, passage um, uh, in this translate, it talks about stupefying the eyes and the ears of the officers and troops. And earlier in the text, it talked about being able to uh, bring your troops together by unifying the, the, the banners or, the, or the, the icons they see and the things that they hear. So I, I, I relate this passage back to that in the sense that stupefying isn't necessarily a, a notion of dumbing them down, but rather uh, unifying them through the means of, of uh, sounds, drums and icons, uh, the, the, the banners that they, they fill. And that uh, keeping them ignorant um, I, I think is uh, not not uh, uh, ignorant to um, the purpose or their mission, but rather ignorant to the uh, the game plan for purposes of keeping that from the opponent. You know, because again, you, later in the book it talks about the five types of spies, and of course, double agents is one of them. So, being aware of that, um, uh, you know, the ignorance is more of a a, a posture of information rather than a, a deception of individuals. Hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you for those comments, John. Uh, I, def I definitely want to come back to uh, this idea of how deception is used and why it's used and uh, in the sense that uh, not only for uh, to misguide the enemy, but to actually uh, uh, to protect secrets. Uh, so anyway, uh, so Quan. Don't tell Donald, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, can okay. we apply what's going on? In okay. uh, all right, no, no, not today. We're, we're going to try and stay away from politics. <laughs> what do you mean politics? That's not politics. Okay. <laughs> uh, Juan. Okay, so what I am, what I want to stress in that extraordinary paragraph is that uh, how, uh, what uh, a certain that it expresses with a certain refinement, but at the same time, with the most glaring brutality, what is modern war is, okay? So I want to read that lines. Um, he carries his man deep into hostile territory before he shows his hand. Like a shepherd driving a flock of sheep, he drives his man this way and that, and nothing knows whither is going. I think that it's one of the most obvious expression of what is being a canon father. Because once again, I always insist on the transition from the aristocratic world of the Zhou royal house to the non-aristocratic world. Because in the aristocratic world, the young nobleman would go willingly into war because it's an occasion for them to reach to glory or to achieve glory. So there is no need to for secrecy or to bring them like a shepherd, a flock of sheep. But here we feel that we are moving into another world that war is becoming industrial, if I may use the word industrial. And uh, those people, after all, are cannon fodder that are manipulated into hostile land or into dangerous situations unwittingly. 
So, uh, and of course, uh, Ran Sin is, I, I would uh, translate it, uh, human nature is perfect, but it can also be translated that human mind, and uh, it has been explained in the five minutes ago by many, it means psychology or how to know the human mind in order to manipulate it. And let's not forget, and I, I remind again that Sun Tzu was born in 544 BCE, and he disappeared from history in 495 BCE. We don't know if he died in 495 BCE, but after 495 BCE, we have no uh, news from him, so to speak. And from that moment of his book, the Sun Tzu Ping Fa, uh, I want to say, I want to mention three battles. 636 BCE, the battle of Chen Pu, uh, led by Duke Wen of Jing. And it was a kind of industrial battle too, even if it, it was more than a century before Sun Tzu. Uh, the, the thing that I want to mention is that when a book is written about something, that something most of the time existed four to six generations before the book, okay? So the book only put in writing certain operational realities which existed much more before. And between that battle of Chen Pu and the battle led by King Zhuang of Chu in 597 BCE, which is the battle of PBI, also a industrial battle, and to the battle, the famous battle of Boju, B-O-J-U, led by Sun Tzu himself in 506 BCE against the kingdom of Chu, against one of the offspring of King Chuang of Chu precisely, but three generations later. Uh, we have 130 years of difference. So 130 years is about uh, the time frame between Napoleon and the Second World War, more or less, okay? 1800 to 1936, 39 to be exact. So uh, that is to say that what is interesting that the kind, except for the technology, of course, would change a lot between Napoleon and the Second World War. Uh, the basic strategy of Ewing Ransin, of knowing the human nature or human mind, did not change a lot. And I would say that it not changed a lot nowadays either. And I would like to finish by a sad note. When you see how the Ukrainians are dying in Ukraine, uh, that idea of cannon father being massacred on the battlefields because some people know to manipulate the human mind is a blatant illustration of that paragraph and still manifesting nowadays. And I finish here. Very well said. Um, I have one question. You know that does this. Thank you for that one. By the way, I think that that was really chilling and honest, uh, shall I say, um, uh, and as well as insightful. Um, but doesn't this essentially violate one of the principles, the moral laws that? are stated earlier in the text. Um, uh, it, it, and what, isn't there some conflict there? Well, Joe, you are at the center of the Chinese civilization, okay? Because the Chinese civilization or any civilization, I would say, but I, of course I'm a little bit obsessed by Chinese civilization. It's my personal problem, uh, but it's at the center of Chinese civilization in the sense you have in one, because the first three chapters, okay, it's pervasive in the 13 chapters, but let's say that in the first three chapters, it's much more Confucian. It's much more Confucianist, okay? It's more, it's more about the universal principles, it's about justice and et cetera. But if you remember our discussions in the last week, um, in the last many weeks, the best is not to go to war, okay? That's the subject of the first three chapters. The best is not to go to war. And I would say that we already arrive at the conclusion that the core of the Sun Tzu, the supreme warrior is to stop war. And you know that the Chinese character for warrior, Wu, is to stop the weapons, okay? That is a supreme warrior not to go to war. 
But if it's not possible to avoid war, once that we have decided that we have to go to war, the goal is to win and in uh, and to win at all costs. Okay, because if we decide that to go to war, it is it the goal is to win. To lose would be completely a betrayal of the nation and of the people. So a lot of energy has to be put into the into the goal not to go to war, of course. But if we cannot imagine a bright way, a brilliant way, a human way to avoid that, and we have to go to war, well, I suppose that it's a moment that we have to be humane and to be just toward our nations and our people precisely, is to, to be as ruthless as possible to the enemies in order to get a victory. I would say that uh, there's no way to go out that uh, dilemma unless we are bright enough to succeed what the first three chapters suggest, meaning not to go to war. Thank you for that. Uh, and it actually highlights the uh, importance of um, intelligence gathering as well um, on two different levels, not only in the sense that when you're in battle and having information, but also the idea of having information to prevent uh, war in the first place. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I want to come back to these comments. Uh, so I have Madeline followed by Laura, then Paul. Yes, uh, thank you, Kwan. That was that was fantastic. Really nice. uh, my comment is just on this, um, just on this one section. It made me think of an example from um, just regular modern life, uh, which has probably been going on uh, in all time which is, uh, let's say, in a work situation where you have someone who's just out of control. Everyone is, they generate chaos. Everyone's running around, sort of picking up the pieces. The things they do are erratic. You, you, you're trying to keep up with what they're asking you to do. They're issuing contradictory, you know, emails and memos. And it just seems like they're completely out of control and generating all the chaos. The person generating the chaos is the person who's in control. And when I finally got my head around that, it cleared up a lot of things in life. I mean, not just sort of my own little life, but I look at you know the political landscape, I look at other things and I can see that the person who seems the most out of control and is generating all the chaos, they're the one who's in control, even though they may not even feel like it themselves. They're the one who's in control. Unless you stop engaging, uh, unless you stop picking up the pieces. Oh, wow. Um, that, that's, I, that's another theme that actually we can come back to is that there is this uh, I don't know, a spontaneous order to it is it one way of saying it, um, but it's being driven by one individual. But uh, anyway, um, next up we have uh, Laura, followed by Paul. Yeah, um, one thing uh, earlier, I remember reading that the general liked to um, remain sort of, not stoic, but he never wanted to give anything away to his troops, you know, any sense of fear. He didn't want anything. He didn't want him to think that maybe he wasn't quite sure that they were taking the right approach and so forth. So I sort of felt that that was somewhat contradictory to some of the things that were just said about the role of the general, you know, in being so aggressive with his soldiers. Not to say that he couldn't be both, but he seemed sort of a, a kinder general in some ways of not wanting to, you know, he wanted to set his troops out there in the best possible way with the most energy and the most belief that they could win. And that was his way. But he, he wasn't going, okay, let's go, let's go, you know, in a hard sense, you know, the sense of great force, come on, extra. He just, he kept it as normal as possible. Let's put it that way. He didn't want to give his hand away. 
when taking the troops into battle. So does that contradict some of what was just said? Um, I don't believe it does actually. Uh, yeah, can, can I, I'll comment real yeah, quick. Yeah, I, I, I would like to hear what other people have to say. Yeah, I, I just I, wanted to. I, I, I need to think about it, but. Yeah, okay. if you don't mind, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, in answer to the question, I think that uh, there's high points and low points in the text, emotional high points and emotional low points. And as, as in every text, as in every situation, we had the last chapter, we had the crying soldiers, right? So, so, the, so, so that doesn't contradict the idea of the general maintaining secrecy, the general keeping, keeping his cards under his vest. You know, the, 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 it's the, it's the, uh, the idea of uh, secrecy is completely in line with the idea that there's actually multiple levels of psychology going on. And the, uh, the general's responsibility though, is to control, according to Sun Tzu, I think he's saying here that not only his own emotional state, but he has to look out for the uh, emotional, uh, the, the, the constitution, uh, he has to try to manipulate the enemies. He's talked about that, manipulating the enemy's outlook and also uh, control, uh, manipulating the outlook of his officers and men. Mm -hmm. Does that satisfy your question, uh, your question uh, Laura? Yeah, I just want to make sure. Um, so next we'll go to Paul and Mark. Yeah, I'll be brief because I know I'm honest worried about getting through all this. But um, uh, the the to your point, Joe, about whether we're contradicting an earlier principle, I think there's a subtext, especially to what Quan was saying, uh, which I loved, but the subtext is there's work that the prince or the people above the general needed to do to put this general programming into the population about the cause. And that, that has to be there to get the devotion that the general needs to do that. And once that devotion is there with that blindness, the example might be the Japanese emperor in World War II. Like on Iwo Jima, you're supposed to kill 10 Americans and then die. You don't have a choice of what, and you have that blind, that's your plan, or the kamikaze. But if you have that blind devotion, then you accept completely that you might be part of a fate. Your troop might be sent to a, kill, a hill to die, but it's not the real general's place. It's his job to deploy you where you will, but it needs this context of, and then there's no principle violated because the soldiers are bought in. They're like, I'll do whatever is needed to win this. And I, I can't know everything or that will impede our chances. So those are my thoughts. No, I mean, that, that, that's actually interesting. And then there's the, the idea of like why you're doing it in the first place, what's at stake. It's not only this, just your honor, but it's the actual material things that actually, uh, um, you know, the idea of going to war even earlier in the text talks about uh, the costs, the economic costs, like almost a guns or butter kind of uh, scenario that you're choosing between your rice fields and your ability to produce food and all these other things in order to go to war. Um, so when the idea of losing in that particular, with that, in that context, uh, you know, you almost have nothing to lose at a certain point or nothing to go back to because, you know, that, that if you're going to be conquered. Um, so uh, in that particular instance, it's, I can see why individuals would be behind the cause, uh, um, you know, and willing to die for it in that particular, especially if it were going to be conquered by um, someone that they feel would be, uh, you know, basically uh, almost a tyrant per se. Uh, so Mark. Laura, if you want to go first, go ahead. This one thing, he talks about how the terrain is so important, you know, and he needs to know about the terrain. So that means that some scout has to go out and check out the terrain and get back to him in order to make a, 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 
play. Now, I don't know how long all that takes in the scope of things, you know, do they have all that time, all the time, every time? You know, what happens if that one guy who goes out doesn't make it back? You know, what do they do in these cases? Or do they that will to- actually be addressed when we get to chapter 13 to some oh, degree. I'll be ready for that then. <laughs> and now I'll shut up. Yeah, I, I was gonna, I was going to comment on. Then uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There was a, a part of the passage where he's saying that the general has to keep the information to himself and not disperse it, not share it. Um, that was very common, you know. And I don't know Chinese history, uh, but I know European history, military history to a certain extent. That was very common up to the imperial imperial German um, military in World War One. That and and that's why you had those colorful uniforms so they could tell which side it was which they weren't you know and they, they and when when the greeks invented the phalanx you still had phalanxes um through the the u.s civil war because it was a, an easy way for the commanders to control the troops and that's one reason why the u.s civil war was so deadly is because the the rifles the rifle um uh technology became cheap and it existed for 200 years beforehand, but it all of a sudden it got cheap and you could manufacture uh, en masse those kind of rifles and it, they were deadly, much more accurate. And so, and the generals didn't adapt or it took them a long time to adapt. And the now the NATO standard is what the Imperial German army was in World War I of allowing sub officers and even warrant officers to know at least their section of the plan so that when the officers get killed, if they get killed, well, they can take over. So you always want a couple, a little bit depth of people who know what's going on, because if the, the, the only people who know what the plan is die, well, then the soldiers aren't going to do anything. You know, so it, it goes to technology, it goes to culture, it goes to um, communications, and I would imagine education. I mean, you can't, yeah, I bet it would be harder to have that depth of knowledge if the the warrant sar- the the sergeants can't read or if they don't know how to read a map. You know, it's one thing that I know that with the Soviet army, uh, it was v- only a, a very small fraction of them ever learned to read a map because they controlled all that information. Which is in the U.S. Army, almost everybody learns how to read a map. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'll take my hand down. There. Yeah, well, no, no. I mean, that's there. There are some fantastic points there. I mean, in a way, you're, you bring up a survivability analysis in the sense that how you're basically uh, going to communicate if something else goes wrong. And then on top of that, I actually bring up a lot about risk management um, is as well. You know, what what's the risk of actually allowing this information to be dispersed? Uh-huh. Uh, and and how much information would be needed to be dispersed, um, and and yeah, and that's that's a calculated risk, and that's one of the things that's most interesting about this text is the probabilistic nature, the calculations that are continuously made by the generals uh, in order to determine the likelihood of success. Um, so this is a chapter actually with when we're talking about laying plans it's more of the tactical aspect of it and actually what you just highlighted it was a very interesting way of describing the tactics that a general would actually employ uh and so this is in many ways i i always i found this up you know going through this text the way we have um to kind of see how uh how almost uh just calculated and, and analytical uh, Sun Tzu was. Uh, and, and it's it's pretty remarkable for that period of time. I, so I think that that's, uh, you know, those are fantastic points. Um, and I, I had a question if you don't mind. Um, Please do. Uh, maybe um, Amon, is that, I don't know how to pronounce your first yeah, name. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I'm wondering, it, it, when I think of uh, this book, I also I, I think of The Prince, and Machiavelli's reason for um, writing that was a cover letter for a job, basically. Mm. And he purposefully wrote it in a rather, sim- not simplistic, that's not quite right, but a very clear, concise way, because he wanted some prince to read it and read it, you know, very easily. Is that, is there some of that behind Sun Tzu as well? There's almost no escaping the similarities, um, especially it, I, 
Mark, I don't remember uh, seeing you in the earlier chapters. Of no, the I, just, of I just literally just picked up on this. Uh, um, so. so that actually makes perfect sense, because if you step in probably from a few chapters back, but definitely from this point forward, those parallels are going to be stark in terms of how uncompromising and unabashed the text is about the best ways of going about achieving something. And in some ways, Sun Tzu's Bing Va as a resume, yes, it really was, but it's not the only reason it was given the honorific Tzu, which it, you've heard Lao Tzu, you've heard Kung Fu Tzu. These are all titles that mean honorable sir, no, our learned scholar. Sun Tzu, is the first military man to gain that honorific as a result of this text. Um, and it's attributed to a person prior to him, but the interview is actually a story I've told a few times about applying these principles in actually interviewing for a position from a marquee, a princeling, someone of note. Um, I, I want to, try and get us moving on and i'm trying to hold comment to to do that but i'm going to bring this up just so briefly because it was just june 6th which was the anniversary of d-day anyone who knows their military history knows d-day was a bloody battle to take the beaches of normandy on the uh western front in the battle in that battle of world war ii eisenhower was out on june 5th the day before the invasion, glad handing the troops, smiling, laughing, encouraging them. He was the one making the call. He would not have made the call had he not believed in the possibility of success. But he wrote a second letter that was not released until after, I believe, his death that night. Let me see if I can actually, I can actually quote some of it. Um, our landing in the Shabrohava area has failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. I won't read the rest of the letter. The point oh. is that letter was in case it went wrong. And one of the things he was not doing with the troops was telling them, yeah, it could go wrong. It was not to be shared widely. He needed his troops to believe that this was a foolproof plan. And that really is the essence of the general's dilemma, the paradox of being in that position of operating with your best information, trying to be as genuine to your soldiers as possible and still withholding from them what might be valuable information, i.e. this could all go belly up and we may lose this war. We look back at history and often think of a certain degree of inevitability of outcomes, but there was absolute uncertainty at the storming of the beach of Normandy. And as there was in the American Revolutionary War, the Civil War, any of these outcomes were not preordained. They weren't known at the time. And making those very tough and very ruthless decisions about what is best to share, what is best to keep to yourself, who do you share it with, those responsibilities fall upon the head of that military. Getting the action plan or getting the vision statement right in the first place, that falls to who's ever in charge of your country. And that was the first part of the Sun Tzu, was trying to extol the importance of don't do this stupidly. Don't do this capriciously. Don't do this because you've got a grudge. Don't do it because it sounded like a good idea at the time. Human sacrifice sounded like a good idea at the time. It wasn't, and it's not. And this is that on a mass scale. And so if you're going to do it, only do it under the direst of circumstances that it will actually profit your people, your nation, your country. Um, 
yeah, I want to try and get us moving on if we can. To yeah, definitely. I mean, very well said. And I, I think that that was, uh, and I appreciate your share. I mean, that too. And I, because there are things with this particular passage that I do want to come back to the idea of patterns and emotions being involved in that. That to me is one of the most interesting parts of this passage overall. Um, and how we, you know, emotions can be manipulated and how patterns are identified and how misdirection and all of this. And, We'll equate it maybe to poker or something. But anyway, um, the, the uh, so James, would you mind uh, reading that uh, right. number, number six? Yeah, number six. Okay. When invading hostile territory, the general principle is that penetrating deeply brings cohesion. Penetrating but a short way means dispersion. When you leave your own country behind and take your army across neighborhood territory, you find yourself on critical ground. When there are means of communication on all four sides, the ground is one of intersecting highways. When you penetrate deeply into a country, it is serious ground. When you penetrate but a little way, it is facile ground. When you have the enemy's strongholds in your rear and narrow passes in front, it is hemmed in ground. When there is no place of refuge at all, it is desperate ground. Therefore, on dispersive ground, I would inspire my men with unity of purpose. On facile ground, I would see that there is close connection between all parts of my army. On contentious ground, I would hurry up my rear. On open ground, I would keep a vigilant eye on my defenses. Mm. On ground of intersecting highways, I would consolidate my alliances. On serious ground, I would try to ensure a continuous stream of supplies. On difficult ground, I would keep pushing along the road. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. Yeah, that was pushing uh, on, pushing on along the road, sorry. Okay. Thank you, uh, Amon. Oh no! Wait. When there's there's two more. Yeah, there's I'm a sorry. little more. On yeah, hemmed that's I, I'm I'm looking at that. Yeah. Go okay, ahead. I'm awfully sorry. On hemmed in ground, I would block any way of retreat. On desperate ground, I would proclaim to my soldiers the hopelessness of saving their lives. For it is the soldier's disposition to offer an obstinate resistance when surrounded, to fight hard when he cannot help himself, and to obey promptly when he has fallen into danger. There you go. So. I had a lot you. of uh, colors on my, uh, on my no, no mar quite, marking no colors quite. and I got confused. Yeah. No problem at all, no problem at all. Uh, thank you for reading. Uh, so next, I'm on. And there, can everyone see my screen all right? Okay. <clears throat> 11, six. In general, the Tao of being an intruder, uninvited visitor, is to concentrate, concentrate one's forces when entering deeply or to disperse one's forces when entering shallowly. When leaving our country behind and taking our army across neighboring countries to fight, we are in cutoff ground. When reaching the spot connecting all directions, we are in intersecting ground. When entering deeply, we are in heavy ground. When entering shallowly, we are in light ground. When the strongholds are on our back and narrow passages in front, we are in encircled ground. When we have no other place to go, we are in dead ground. Therefore, in dispersive ground, our wills should be one. In light ground, our troops should be well connected. In striving ground, our rear army should hurry up. In trafficked ground, we should defend prudently. In intersecting ground, we should solidify our allies. In heavy ground, we should secure the lines of supplies. In difficult ground, we should advance through the passages. In encircled ground, we should block the entrance. In dead ground, we should reveal our determination to die, not live. Regarding warfare, the soldiers the soldiers resist when they are summoned, fight when they have no choice, 
and follow the leader when they are pressed. I was attempting to draw out the parallels of ground categories. I don't think the categories, although this reads as a jargon list of categories, and if A, then B, if A, then B, if you know C, then D, if e, and so on. I don't think there's as much to be gained from that in sort of a current read of this as there is to understanding the principle behind it. There are types of grounds that have certain advantages and certain disadvantages. And there are proper strategies for taking advantage of each of those types of grounds or situations, you could say. Applying the wrong solution to the wrong category or the wrong type of situation is a recipe for disaster. It, it kind of reminds me of something I used to say to students years ago when talking about medicine writ large. Medicine is good. The right medicine for the right problem is better. Seeing a proctologist for a dental exam is probably a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> and that's really what this formula kind of in, ex, ex, or, uh, attempts to express, is that there's a right formula to be used and mis, miscategorize, misuse these, and you may wind up in very serious dire straits. Thank you, Amon. Now I know why my teeth are giving me trouble. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> go ahead, James. I told okay. you. This is, uh, this is uh, kind of a review. There's a review of the, the first section here, uh, you know, with the, uh, the grounds, the types of grounds, the kinds of grounds. Um, but there's also uh, a listing of uh, measures that the general should have in mind that are appropriate to each ground. And I think that's the important feature of this section. And uh, the uh, and, and then summarized in the summary, he simply says that uh, regarding uh, in general, regarding warfare in general, uh, soldiers resist when they're surrounded. They fight when there's no choice. In other words, you know, there's nothing to do but live or die, in other words. And then if you're in, in a situation where you're pressed or in trouble, well, make sure you follow the leader. So, uh, but of course, you're, you're really responsible for yourself too. So, but it's interesting, you know, he's summing up a lot of, a lot of concepts in this chapter. Uh, in, in addition, the uh, types of terrain and a quick summary of measures that are appropriate to each type of, um, I'm sorry for using the word terrain for each type of ground for each because uh, the ground is a situation. Uh, each ground is a kind of um, battle situation, not a type of terrain. Anyway, uh, so so that uh, so I think uh, the, the the chapter is very useful for that. It adds a little bit of flesh onto the principal concept of the nine grounds. That's a great analysis, and I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, making the distinction between the actual physical ground and the situational part about it, and then obviously that I thought the key was uh, as well that um, essentially when uh, soldiers are put in a position that they're you know have to live or die, that they'll continue to fight. Uh, so that uh, yeah, that to me is. And that sums up this uh, this section, but it also gets into the what you were just talking about. It's situational that does th that that occurs. It's not the actual physical terrain per se. Um, so thank you for that, uh, Quan. Yes, and um, this uh, paragraph, uh, I would say that is a development of the one just before, because if I read the last sentence. Uh, to fight hard when the soldier cannot help himself and to obey promptly when the soldier has fallen into danger. I would say that once again, I would like to keep on my uh, brutal analysis like for the, the former paragraph. Uh, 
Political power can be explained in many ways, but I would say that on a very low down to earth level, political power is to make people obey. And especially in a situation of danger and of war. And once again, I want to come back to that dialectics between the epistemological growth as proposed by the Rujia or by Confucianism, and which is always the foundation of the Chinese civilization. But as uh, I think Mark said uh, about Machiavelli, uh, the practical application is always about Fajia, okay? And Fajia, we said many times, it has been very badly translated at legalism because a short way to translate Fajia is precisely the art of the ruler. Okay, so you have always the, the Rujia, the school of the scholars that would propose the epistemological development. But at the same time, above that foundation, you have the different school proposing different arts of the ruler, depending of the author, but ultimately, it's the one art with a capital A of the ruler or the long translation for Fajia would be, as I already said in the past, principles and practices of statecraft and administration. And Sun Tzu is probably one of the most comprehensive author that we can classify into that Fajia, okay? Proposing a comprehensive uh, understanding and methods for any ruler in his practices of statecraft and administration. And once again, he is capable to write in a brutal manner that political power ultimately in dangerous situation is to make people obey promptly and having a commander in chief directing the general operation and capable of imagination and secrecy, but also capable to lead his people, including manipulating them and bringing them into dangerous situation where they can die. Let's, let's stop here. Thank you for that, uh, Kwan. Uh, next up, we have Alison. Um, that passage really reminded me of something that my yoga teacher said many times. Um, that the idea is that you have to listen to your body and you have to know when to push your edge and when to um, when to pull back and to relax and go in a child's pose. And I feel like it's like a really good philosophy for life because I think that sometimes the uh, people who sort of like make a plan and go, this is the plan and I'm only sticking to the plan, they don't really do that well in life. But people who are constantly monitoring their situation and adjusting and adapting based on what, information they're getting generally tend to be more successful um, because you can't just like ignore everything that's around you. you've got to pay attention to everything that's around you and if want you know sometimes you're going to have to act this way sometimes your troops need to do that um, but it's just a really good philosophy of life that as things go along you need to constantly monitor your surroundings monitor how things are going and then adjust accordingly it just kind of makes more sense. It's a good philosophy of life, I think. Uh, thank you, Allison. Um, the ability to adjust is something I want to come back to was uh, a little bit, uh, even relating to the last passage as well. Um, so uh, speaking of being aware of your surroundings, I see Paul as an explanation point in the chat. I think it's Paul then John, if that's okay with you, John. Yeah, just a pretty a quick question, probably maybe for Quan, because of the historical context you bring to the table. In the part about, you know, if you're in desperate ground, everyone just has to be ready to die. It reminds me of what I had said previously about that ethic, that ethos, that that uh, there is no such thing as surrender. And I, so far in the art of war, I don't see such a thing as pulling back or surrender, am I reading that right? Or do you have any comments on the concept of surrender in the, in the historical context or of a different, you know, if you're in that much trouble where you're just gonna have everyone die, like I know one story in World War II where 
it was the end of the war they lost and Hitler said, you know, go and die and destroy everything. And some generals said, you have an option. You're free now. Go, you know, go where you will or surrender. You know, like, just curious on your comments on those things. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, with your permission, it will take the 30 seconds. Please you? do. Please do. Oh, okay. Um, I would say that once again, uh, I think there are many possible answers, but, but the answer that comes spontaneously to my mind is the historical and psychological evolution of Chinese society between 1000 BCE and uh, 220 BCE. Okay, let's say during that almost millennium. Okay, uh, we start from an aristocratic society where we have noblemen eager to go to war because they want to achieve glory. And uh, with time, you have uh, principalities in competition because your question is, is it possible to retreat, to surrender and to have a kind of diplomatic arrangement, okay? Uh, it was more possible between, a thousand, well, first between 1000, 1046 BCE and 770 BCE, there was a kingdom called the Chou Kingdom and the Chou King was ruling and most of the time, the people were living in a peaceful kingdom. But after 770 BCE, they lost their power and their authority, except for the control domain. And at the beginning, it was still okay to have a conversation between gentlemen and to end a battle with some compromission and uh, negotiations, okay? Around uh, the time of Sun Tzu, you have the beginning of the theory of uh, creation of empire, okay? Because uh, at, in 770 BCE, the Chinese people still believe in the Chou dynasty that maybe they would come back to their heyday. But around 500 BCE, meaning 270 uh, years after the, the fall of the kingly, pa kingly powers, the Chinese people were certain now that we have to go to another dynasty. And from then on, the feudal lords in their mind, because here we come back to the first three chapters of the Sun Tzu, okay? Those three first chapters of epistemological growth is the legacy of the higher philosophy from the Chao dynasty. But at the same time, from chapter seven to chapter 13, which is more the operational aspect, but still infused with philosophy, it's the idea that we have to be ruthless because uh, those principalities have to be reunited to a kingdom, but the solution that would be uh, achieved in 221 BCE is not a kingdom, but it's the first Chinese empire. So, and I would say that once again, it's always my answer, okay? The epistemological, epistemological growth, which is the legacy of the Chou dynasty and transmitted by the Rujia that the Westerner call Confucianism, is the uh, invitation to higher behavior and to higher ethics, okay? But that ground is always superseded in lower reality by principles and practices of uh, statecraft and administration by down to earth realities that the Chinese call fajia, very badly translated as legalism that I suggest to use instead the art of the ruler. And it goes to my favorite concept that I know that I bother you guys from time to time, which is universal history. Okay, because universal history for me is the evolution of mankind to a higher mode of living, okay? But we have to wait for everyone to reach to that higher epistemological development or growth, which in the Chinese civilization is the educational program for that is Confucianism. But do we have to wait 500 years, 1000 years, 20,000 years? I don't know. But meanwhile, before we achieve as mankind to that level of epistemological 
uh, development that would be uh, that would touch, let's say, at least 50% of mankind, we have to resort to the principles and practices of statecraft and administration or the art of the ruler to get things done. Okay. And China nowadays is still a state ruled by a foundation of Confucianism, but with a framework of legalism or of the art of the ruler. I would say in the West is the same with all the words. Thank you. Ne Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to move to John and then we're going to move on. Uh, so we got to keep it going. Uh, thank you, Quan. Uh, yeah, just uh, on these passages, um, uh, I think these uh, uh, nine formations of terrain uh, um, um, are, are, are quite fascinating because, in fact, uh, it, it, uh, as others were saying, it describes the various patterns of engagement. But um, when I tried to connect all these things together to other parts of the book, um, it became somewhat apparent to me that, in fact, um, these nine patterns of terrain um, talk about uh, different contexts of engagement. And what I mean by that is, uh, and the translations don't assist, um, uh, on my translation, because I was, I, I, in selecting, I, I used all the translations, obviously, but the one that I seem to be drawn to more often than not was Ralph Sawyer's. And that last sentence in terms of the, uh, the nine conditions talked about on fatal terrain, um, I showed them that we will not live. I think others have called it dead terrain uh, or um, uh, there was another term as well. Desperate. Uh, desperate, thank you. Um, uh, it, the way I uh, discerned this when I connected up other aspects in the text was, in fact, of these nine terrains, there's only one terrain where you're actually fighting. Um, and that is the uh, what's called fatal terrain, which is perhaps why I prefer that reference as opposed to dead or desperate, um, because uh, um, um, in the other terrains, um, they're more about manoeuvring um, or uh, avoiding situations where you can be manoeuvred by your opponent. It's not actually the engagement. Um, so uh, the reference in this area is, in fact, there's only one of these nine in my mind that actually is the point of engagement, the actual uh, battle between opponents. Uh, the other terrains are positional. Um, and... Uh, um, um, and so if I liken that, and in fact, it's counterintuitive because when you read the translations, if you read it as dead or desperate, it sounds like that's the worst terrain. That's right. the terrain you don't want to be in, when in fact, that's the third best terrain to be in, not the worst. Of the nine, it's the third best. Uh, you might recall uh, uh, in earlier sessions, I mentioned that uh, uh, open terrain or focal terrain, uh, as it's right. referred to in my text, was the best because that's where your opponent isn't. And then and contentious terrain is the next best because that's where um, uh, you both have an advantage. Fatal terrain is where you end up fighting. And so if I liken that to, um, 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 if I liken that to um, say a, a football game, open terrain, you're trying to kick the ball into space it then moves to contentious terrain when defenders and opponents move into that space. The ball perhaps hasn't been won at this point. And then at the point the ball's, perhaps I'll use the American vernacular, the point the ball's caught in the air and then the defender converges to the tackle, that's then the fatal terrain. And so if, if the person who receives the receiver who gets the ball in the air can in fact run past or run, run beyond the defender, he, he, he avoids the fatal terrain, the actual engagement, uh, by moving through the contentious terrain um, where they both could come into contact but don't. And so um, that's, that, uh, I think, is an interesting um, pattern because, as I said, the, the, some of those translations lend themselves to thinking this is the worst terrain. But if I put it in market terms, just to make that point again, uh, you know, Apple comes along with a new idea. Let's call it an iPhone. That's open terrain. Samsung, you know, Google says, well, we'll do a phone too. Well, they're in contentious terrain because they're you know, essentially the second player into the marketplace. They're both competing, but at this point, they're not, if you like, in a direct battle for market share. Everyone else who then enters the market right. is in is right. in fatal terrain. And once you've got multiple people, multiple entrants in the market, you're all in fatal terrain until, until one of those parties asserts a new 
open terrain defensive position by developing something new. So those those three terrains, open, contentious, and fatal, are in fact the three best terrains, um, and the others are all positioning. They're not engagement terrains. Thank you, John. Um, David, and then we'll go to back to the text uh, for the next two. We're going to keep our comments work uh, to keep our comments uh, under two minutes, uh, and then move on uh, just to make sure we uh, get done this chapter. This will be brief. Um, sure, I want to uh, riff off something I think James started with, which is terrain or what we're going to call it ground. Uh, this is the general knowing what is. It's it's knowing the what you're starting with, but the knowledge of these principles is about how you flow through the changes and what happens during the war too, because you have an awareness of what was, which is concrete. Yeah, there were rocks there. It's structured a certain way. And that's a limited knowledge. That's just the starting point. But you have to know that to start. And you, you now know what it is now, which is something else. It's in action. It has an interpretation as it is now. And you're taking it for what it's worth now. Something can you know, become hemmed in or become hostile, uh, depending on what's happening. And again, it brings these terms to the metaphorical value. It's not just about the physically obvious, it's about the whole thing you're subsuming in the project pertaining to rocks on the ground and troop movements and their attitudes and how effective they're going to be and the, the significance of that. And your neighbors, the neighbors' attitudes are going to matter if they're potentially engaged in you know, your boundary or an intersecting area. And the weather and the light and the wind go back to Eisenhower when he's preparing for D-Day. So uh, the astronomical. So you have the flux of things. So this can't just be referring to the, the immediate concrete that you started with. This is about your readiness to recognize these changes and what each type of change pushes you towards, a more active, aggressive, a more uh, staunch uh, you know, attention to your supply lines. And the general is the one who has to have, even if he's not informing everyone else, the knowledge and recognition so he knows what's there and he recognizes how it flows. So it's, so it's, you know, terrain, we know it means all that, right? I appreciate that. Thank you for those comments, David. And that actually relates a lot to number five uh, as well. Um, so- uh, I was uh, going to suggest since eight is very short, why don't we read seven and eight together right now just to make sure we capture that'll be great yeah absolutely that'll be sure and then people can extend their comments a little bit as well uh if they if they hang up yeah with that will open it up cool all right then uh james we did, did the honors all right i roll up my sleeves <laughs> we cannot enter into alliance with neighboring princes until we are, are acquainted with their designs we are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. We should be unable to turn natural advantages to account unless we make use of local guides. To be ignorant of any one of the following four or five principles does not befit a warlike prince. When a warlike prince attacks a powerful state, his generalship shows itself in preventing the concentration of the enemy's forces. He overawes his opponents, and their allies are, preventing, are prevented from joining against him. Hence, he does not strive to ally himself with all and sundry, nor does he foster the power of other states. He carries out his own secret designs, keeping his antagonists in awe. Thus, he is able to capture their cities and overthrow their kingdoms. Bestow rewards without regard to rule. Issue orders without regard to previous arrangements, and you will be able to handle a whole army as, a, as though you had to do with but a single man. Confront your soldiers with the deed itself. Never let them know your design. When the outlook is bright, 
bring it before their eyes and tell them nothing when the situation is gloomy. Place your army in deadly peril and it will survive. Plunge it into desperate straits and it will come off in safety. For it is precisely when a force has fallen into harm's way that it is capable of striking a blow for victory. Success in warfare is gained by carefully accommodating ourselves to the enemy's purpose. By persistently hanging on the enemy's flank, we shall succeed in the long run in killing the commander in chief. This is called ability to accomplish a thing by sheer cunning. On the day, this is uh, section next, it's, uh, eight. On You're the right. day, on the day you are to take up your command, block the frontier passes, destroy the official tallies, and stop the passage of all emissaries. Be stern in the council chamber so that you may control the situation. If your enemy leaves the door open, you must rush in. Forestall your opponent by seizing what he holds dear and subtly contrive to time his arrival on the ground. Walk in the path defined by rule and accommodate yourself to the enemy until you can fight a decisive battle. At first then, exhibit the coyness of a maiden until the enemy gives you an opening. Afterwards, emulate the rapidity of a running hare, and it will be too late for the enemy to oppose you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, James. Very well done. Very well very written. Very, very, very excellent creative translation. translation you know. And pretty good. I, I have to admit, Giles is pretty good. Um, okay, 11-7. <clears throat> Same as before. Second verse, same as the first. Thus, we do not form alliances with feudal lords unless we know their intentions. We cannot send our armies unless we know the configurations of mountains, forests, precipice, barriers, swamps, and lakes. We cannot have the advantageous location unless we employ local guides. Hold that thought. That's my editorial. If you ignore any one of these four or five principles, your army cannot be hegemonic. When a hegemonic army attacks a large state, the state cannot assemble its people to resist. When it shows its power over the enemy, the allies of the enemy dare not to join. Thus, a hegemonic general needs not to strive to make alliances with anyone in the world, need not foster any regime in the world. He just needs to trust his own will and show his power over the enemy. He can seize their cities and overthrow their state. Give out rewards that are not in the law. Issue rights that are not in the policy and confront command all people in the three armies like commanding one person. Confront, interfere, soldiers with duties without explaining. Confront, drive them with advantages without telling them the disadvantages. When they are thrown into a lost land, they will strive to survive. When they are plunged into a dead ground, they will fight to live. Only when all people have fallen into danger can they turn defeat into victory. Therefore, warfare is deceptively is to deceptively accommodate the the intentions of the enemy to concentrate forces on the onto the enemy and to kill their commanders thousands of miles away this is called skillfully completing a task therefore on the day of declare 11.8 therefore on the day of declaring war close the borders invalidate all passports, and stop the passage of all emissaries. Repeatedly review the plan in the royal court in order to, to totally control the warfare. When the enemy leaves a door open, you must rush in immediately. 
sees what they care what they care first never match that should be what they care for first never match what they ex what they expected follow your plan according to the enemy's situation in order to fight a decisive battle hence at first you are quiet as a virgin once the enemy has open has the door open you move in like an escaped rabbit your enemy has no time to repel to repel this is quite the apotheosis or nadir of the story so far your goal is to be a hegemonic power to be able to ruin your enemy without the need of your alliances without worry that their alliances will start to rally to their side um you need to sometimes deceive your own soldiers into believing that they are in a much more dire strait than they actually are you don't want them to see that there is a route for them to retreat home um i believe it was an earlier chapter that said your if home is within sight your army won't operate as well as it will when home is a distant memory and they don't have a hope of going there then they will commit fully to the task in front of them and then we get to this rejoiner on the day you declare war close your borders and validate passports stop emissaries and review your plan repeatedly in the royal court be crystal clear that this is not that nobody's misinterpreting the plan that nobody has you know, any last minute reservations, make sure that it's reviewed by all. So everybody's on the same page who needs to be on the same page in that war room. And then go out. And although you have a plan, if the opportunity presents itself, seize it, because that's more important than merely following the plan. I read that and all I can think of is the capture of, I believe it was Moctezuma by Cortez, that they invited him in and they're like, these guys don't have armor. They think we're conquerors. They think we're kings. Kill everyone and take him hostage. And that's what they did. And they wound up, you know, trying to figure out what to do about that after the fact. But nobody can argue that Spain didn't successfully conquer the Aztecs. Um, I love this final image because it's so antithetical to all this sort of gory, gruesome, bloodthirsty warfare. Be quiet as a virgin. Wait for a door to open and move like an escaped rabbit. Not a lion, not a tiger, but something that's even faster. Something that's even more compelled to action because that is the kind of anima that your enemy will not be able to repel. Thank you for that. Uh, and now we got a half an hour just to discuss chapter 11. Actually, that should be fun. Uh, and um, go ahead, David. Actually, go ahead next. Just a, a brief reaction. This was a lot of this is, this is a high action section of the text here uh the part on hegemony or um th that was Haman commented on uh the idea of being a single power i think you've already formed your allegiances your alliances with people you've understood and what this is sort of more the general's take than the politician's take possibly that we're talking about here that Anyone who's undecided, if they see you acting powerfully, is going to fall towards your side. Like maybe when the Ukraine war started, uh, there was a lot of potential for Belarus to just jump in. You know, anyone who could join in on Russia's side. But seeing the power of the response, I think, deterred people from forming 
alliances with Russia. And, you know, so maybe there's some sense the, in terms of fighting the battle on the ground, not, not at the political level, which is already, I think that was an earlier section. The, he's suggesting that the powerful direction with these rules will um, make your already existent alliances and armies sufficiently strong to carry out uh, what you need. So don't worry about further compromises in order to do a diplomacy once you're in the action. You seal the borders. Hmm. Uh, it's, and I like the, it's an interesting analogy as well. Um, you know, obviously if it were a quick, if you, and, and, you know, gratefully, I'm thankful that it wasn't, uh, you know, taken over quickly, but if Ukraine had been, you wonder who would be Russia's alliance today? Um, and, uh, you know, probably some of the same groups, but, uh, you know, they, at the same time, um, you know, you have to envision that they wouldn't necessarily be as uh, seen as um, unfavorably as they currently are. Um, exactly. Yeah. Sorry to bring up the contemporary, but I just thought, you know, it struck. I think it's a it's an appropriate example. I, I really I think in, in this particular instance as well. Um, so, John. Yeah, look, um, uh, j just on this one, <clears throat> I thought that the opening uh, paragraph uh, where it referred to the topography of, uh, in my translation, mountains and forests, ravines and defiles, wetlands and marshes, um, denotes the separation between the physical aspects of the terrain and then how those, uh, how that to topography might be uh, formed, if you like, or how it might uh, present in terms of the formations, the, the, the nine aspects that were mentioned earlier, just before that. So really separating the physicality of what you encounter, which is essentially rivers, uh, wetlands, forests, and mountains, and of course, our plains, open plains. And so taking those things and then saying, out of the arrangements of those things, uh, will form the the, uh, the nine uh, configurations, of terrain, nine formations of terrain. Um, so mm. oh, that was interesting. And then the other thing is, um, I think when it talks about the plans of the feudal lords and preparatory alliances, um, that that also goes to uh, the overall idea of the treaties, which is to avoid war through uh, through you know uh, preparations and 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 structuring and thought. And so you talk about Ukraine, but um, uh, argu uh, arguably uh, when NATO expanded um, to include all those old Eastern Bloc countries, despite their uh, undertakings with Gorbachev that they wouldn't. Uh, part of what they were doing was understanding the, the feudal lords, meaning that, you know, if you like the, the people who influenced power in all of those Eastern Bloc countries who wanted that umbrella of protection, knowing the history of, of Russia and, and, of course, the Soviet bloc, bloc that they lived under. And so in a lot of ways, that expansion uh, it speaks, to, this passage speaks to that expansion. Uh, there's some argument about the morality of that expansion. Did the West bring on uh, this conflict by the virtue of not keeping to its original agreement with Gorbachev not to expand NATO? And yet um, this passage makes it fairly clear that uh, to be a hegemonic power, uh, you need to forge those alliances and understand the feudal lords, which in this, in this case uh, were all the people, the elite, if you like, the intelligentsia of the various countries who then join NATO or wish to. And of course, since the war started, we've seen a number of countries who previously didn't want to join NATO uh, move very quickly to do so. Um, uh, perhaps indicating again, uh, the strength of fighting a battle from the arrangement of plans and alliances uh, rather than with armies and cities. Uh, I'll perhaps stop there and I'll come back to other comments that other people thought. Sure, uh, we'll go with uh, Amman uh, then um, uh, Paul. I, since the subject of Ukraine and, and Russia has come up so much with this passage, I wanted to use it as an illustration of one of the other principles that Sun Tzu is extolling here, which is the absolute supreme value of information control and how that has was sort of led as an antecedent into that conflict where you had U.S. intelligence reporting the intentions and movements of Russian military 
machinations weeks ahead of uh, what was actually exactly as they executed. That sort of demonstration of the control of intel and what it communicated subtextually to the rest of the world was we not only do we know what they are up to and will advertise it out there and that makes their play fall flat and facile when they make these claims that we've already said they're going to make and we've told the world these are untrue things it also threw up a flag to their potential allies when you were talking about belarus possibly jumping in or who else might be their ally even china as a erstwhile ally is really playing it close to the vest because that sort of demonstration that we know your plans as well as you and we are more than happy to put them on display and for the world to see made all those other countries much much more gun shy about taking up their cause because they don't want their plans laid bare before the world either and so this this thesis that Sun Tzu has, your ability to gain control and use information is the most powerful weapon you have. And it can be used to prevent ever setting foot on a battlefield in the first place was demonstrated in real time in that sort of example. And so I, I wanted to put that out there for everyone to chew on a little bit, because to me, it is the absolute exemplar of Sun Tzu's idea of information to stop war before it occurs, not between Ukraine and Russia, but between anyone else who might have jumped to Russia's aid and anyone else who might have been drawn in by the, an escalation that could have become World War Three. That's, uh, that's a lot, John, and I will we'll come back to that. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I, I like how this group really tries to be careful with the equation of current events with these texts. And I'm just not feeling, I love it. I think there's so much to be learned from it, but at the same time, I'm, I'm very cautious, back to historical context and things. Uh, Iman was kind of starting to relate to it when, um, in his last thoughts there, but um, this particular passage and what we're talking about here is to be hegemonic is assuming all that almost like when they were not in the Confucianistic world that Quan dreams of with uh, moral principles being exchanged. We're in a head to head. I'm going to kill you or you're going to kill me. And if once you're in that mode, this is the way to be. But now we're applying this to the world situation right now. And I, it's hard to apply it. And we're using hindsight to go, well, what were we doing back when NATO made some agreements with the other countries? I don't think, I guess we could take the stance that we're still not where Quan dreams of. And we're still, I'm going to kill you unless you're going to kill me. And so these all apply exactly the same way. Or are we in a different situation because of the threat of complete annihilation of all of humanity that Buckminster Fuller and others talk about that did not face Sun Tzu? So I question whether we can apply this this way. That's my only thought. Um, it's an interesting question for anybody to take up, uh, but it it's like a game theory question. I, I mean, I, I, that that's the way I look at this is that now and we're still in it. Um, but uh, there are ways of reducing risk. Um, that's all. I'll keep my comments there for now. But Quan. 
Yeah, I think that Paul's command is truly interesting because <laughs> it's obvious that the big difference, uh, if we compare Sun Tzu's time to our times, is of course the atomic weapons, okay? And that stuff makes a big difference. However, I would say that nothing at the time of Sun Tzu can be compared to the atomics, that's for sure. Uh, but the smaller equivalent at the time of Sun Tzu would be the annihilation of the principality of, of the kingdom if a bad decision is taken, okay? That would be the biggest stuff that could happen to a principality. It's utter annihilation by the enemy, okay? But of course it doesn't have uh, that uh, comprehensive impact on all mankind than the atomics could have nowadays, that's for sure. And for those who are a little bit interested in uh, military theories, you know that now we are at the fifth generation warfare and uh, the third generation warfare was to World War II, okay, at the end. But what make the difference post pre and post 1945 is precisely uh, the atomic weapons, okay? We enter in the, into the fourth generation warfare because of the appearance of the atomics precisely. And now we are at the fifth generation warfare, including the atomics from the fourth generation warfare, but also a, a kind of higher presence of uh, information warfare okay because um, uh, I think that it was Churchill or maybe some someone else uh, but the first victim of any war of any war is truth so because uh, either in uh, the time of Sun Tzu in, in China in the West or even now uh, the first element to control in the situation of conflict of a war is the information okay propaganda disinformation etc and we know perfectly that uh, if we take the case of Ukraine, that uh, we have propaganda on every side. And I would say that it's uh, the big thing. Uh, and uh, however, I think that there are some universal truths that are in the Sun Tzu and that would always be relevant, even when we would have battles in space or in other galaxies is precisely the capacity to control the information or to make the enemy think certain things which are not true. I stop here. Thank you, Quan. John. Yeah, I concur with Quan. Uh, the, treaty, the, the, the treaty starts with the uh, compelling premise that uh, warfare is the greatest affair of state of the state because it leads to either victory or defeat, which either leads to uh, uh, progress or a death, uh, uh, which leads to prosperity or extinction. Um, so whether that's uh, a global extinction or whether that's extinction of the principality, as, as Quan said, or you know the country or the or the ideology, the theory, uh, you know the Nazi Germany uh, ideology was defeated in that way. So I think that so the premise is right, and uh, well, I would describe the entire book as referring to what I term um, patterns of movement. Um, so for me, all, the entire book is a description of patterns of movement, and uh, those patterns are uh, able to then be overlaid uh, onto uh, not only historical events, but also to projecting future events to try to work out uh, what the likely patterns of movements would be based on the patterns you've seen to that point. Um, when Juan talked about information, the fifth generation warfare, that's, that's true too, but that also goes to uh, plans and alliances being superior to, uh, you know, battles of plans and alliances being superior to battles of uh, armies and cities. And uh, um, so obviously information warfare is a battle of plans and alliances, as is cyber warfare. Um, uh, not necessarily physical things, though they can spill over into physical, physical effects. They're not direct physical engagements. Um, and uh, uh, that whole issue of plans and alliances and information warfare goes to the concept of um, aligning your army's eyes and their ears. Um, and this passage particularly talks about 
um, the treaties of the art of war going beyond just the army, but to in fact entire societies, um, the masses. Um, you know how a he hegemonic power uh, achieves that is to um, uh, deconstruct their opponent's uh, total society in terms of um, the way that they control that information. As Amon, uh, I think, said quite correctly, which is that's the highest form of engagement. So information is the pivotal point when you consider attacking by clans is the highest form of engagement. So I think that, um, um, yeah, the patterns of movement is the essence of it. Uh, and these different degrees of engagement are really just reflecting the sophistication of our society as we've moved more towards uh, the plans and alliances realm, which is the realm of thought, <laughs> rather than the realm of physical interaction, because we understand that there's losses on both sides. As the, of course, as the book says, the problem with um, uh, battles of armies and cities is you destroy the very treasure that you're seeking to take. <laughs> uh, plans and alliances, you can preserve them. Um, uh, and I'll stop there for a minute. You know, it, it, it's interesting because everybody is going, and rightfully so, don't get me wrong, to the, especially since we're talking about uh, the, the nine situations or however you want to title it, it's... Uh, we're all looking at it from a um, uh, from a weapons standpoint, uh, but there's also this can be still applied. I think in terms of um, maybe not, not when we're talking about specific um, uh, situations. Maybe it's a little bit harder to draw analogies, but I think overall the text. Uh, still holds true in terms of how you look at the economic aspect of this. Um, so I think that that's something else to think about how warfare has evolved uh, in you know modern day with with uh, you know international finance. And I think that that's something to consider. It has evolved, but uh, tactically, it's interesting to explore. Um, there are. Uh, you know, there are acts of aggression that may not be merely physical. Um, and so they may be in sense uh, to um, conquer a nation without any necessarily putting any boots on the ground at all. Um, and there are, are ways to do that. Uh, Madeline. Uh, let's see. Well, I have read that um, at the time the first the first nuclear weapon was detonated as a test, the men who had designed and created it were not a hundred percent sure. In fact, they had their doubts that the chain reaction would stop. They thought it was a possibility that it would just keep going and going and going. And they set it off anyway. Um, our current project is we're creating black holes mm. um, in our high-tech facilities. So there seems to be no limit um, to, the, to the madness. I, I liked the final image in this chapter of uh, just going into the courtyard and running around, um, like flapping your hands helplessly like a shy virgin and being evasive like a rabbit. I did do a little bit of looking around about the rabbit mythology, but all I really saw was um, the moon rabbit. Uh, and I was wondering if there were any other cultural resonances for the rabbit. Avon or uh, if you have an answer for that. Yeah, um, I just mentioned that it's first in the Chinese calendar, the zodiac calendar. It, it came in first, um, and it there's a whole legend. There's actually a few fables around that too, um, but beyond that, I I want to kind of wrap my hands around a lot of what we're talking about because it does seem very borderline apocalyptic when you get to this chapter and you start casting it on to the modern world it can feel very apocalyptic and so 
the contrarian in me wants to point out that we're just outside of 25 years away from a full century in human history with no two major countries going into direct conflict with one another, which is something that has not happened in human history. You won't find a hundred year span where the First Nations or the great empires of the world didn't get in direct conflict with one another in one way or another. This is the first time it's happened. It partly does have to do with the cost of war and us finally gaining some appreciation with what those costs are. It has to also do with war being televised after Vietnam, the first time we actually saw what a battlefield looked like and the stomach dropping out in the general population for tolerance of that as something done, you know, for any cause, whatever the the cause du jour was. But there are a couple of things that um, I believe it was Paul was asking about the universalizability of Sun Tzu in a modern age. Does what he say, is what he said then in any way still applicable to us in a modern age? And for this, you'll have to bear with me because there are lies, damn lies, and then there are stats. And so I've got a few statistics here that come off of uh, the battlefield of Gettysburg from the Civil War. At that battlefield, 27 574 muskets were actually recovered off the battlefield. When they were examined by archaeologists looking at them, they found 90% of them already loaded. Out of that 90%, 12,000 were double loaded, translating that the person didn't fire, but then reloaded a musket anyway. 6,000 had had that happen three times, triple loaded. And there was one musket they found with 23 loads jammed into it. What's significant about this is it speaks to human nature in a battlefield with stakes that are very high with a modern-ish form of warfare in the sense that, yes, they're still using Falnix or Falnix, but they are also employing firearms on the battlefield. And 90% of those soldiers probably didn't fire. That's been human nature, which means when Sun Tzu's talking about the ma manipulating troops into action, he's recognizing that it is human nature, 90% of the time, not to want to do this, not to want to engage, not to want to fight, wait for the other guy to do it. Because, you know, at best, maybe I can fire in the air, or I can just loose my arrow and it will go somewhere or I'll slash wildly and look like I'm engaged. This is what human nature was at his time and was a couple thousand years later at the Battle of Gettysburg. And so when Quan talked about these different stages of warfare, moving from the third phase into the fourth, into the fifth, one of the things, yes, nuclear weaponry was a uh, component of it, but there was another component of it, which was recognition by armies that this was human nature and learning to actually train armies to engage so that you got those fire rates down from 90 percent attrition to 60 percent to 40 percent to where now i think the modern army estimate is something like 15 percent because of specifics of training tactics like the type of target you actually attack as opposed to a sack of hay or a bullseye and that it pops up and moves and all other little quirks of manipulating human psychology to get better at the science of actually doing this. That is also an advent of modern warfare. A lot of what modernity has given us is a gruesomely more efficient machine for conducting this. And at the same time, the results of that post-World War I, post-Vietnam, post into the modern era, is that you have a lot less stomach for it by almost all of the population. And so it's part of why even a ground war in Europe is so anathema to most of Europe. The whole purpose of an EU, an economic exchange, was so these European powers never did this again. And so it's happening right on their fringe, on their doorstep, 
but it really strikes at the heart of what the whole enterprise of trying to avoid things like this was and is, and it actually, in some very terrible ways, has reinvigorated and recommitted a lot of these people to why this happened in the first place, whether NATO violated the agreements with Gorbachev or not, suddenly everybody wants in because suddenly everybody realizes, oh yeah, there was a real good reason for doing this at the end of World War II. So I do see some changes, but those fundamentals of human nature, they haven't changed a lot. We've learned to tweak them, but I think the wisdom of Sun Tzu still speaks to us into a modern age. I'm going to listen for five more minutes. I'm going to shut up and I will be running after that. But I appreciate everybody's time and I appreciate you being here. And I'm glad I'm back. Welcome back. And we're glad to have you. Um, and uh, that was a lot to put on the table as well. And very much appreciate it because I think that this is an interesting discussion to have. We've talked about it um, here a couple different times. Um, you know, this idea of are these still, you know, applicable to today's uh you know modern warfare and human nature being what it is it, it's still you know is it hasn't changed all that much um the tools may have but uh it's interesting to explore that part of it um because then you can kind of see the uh, how universal these 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 uh um ideas really are um so john from there yeah look i just uh yeah i just wanted to uh, uh in picking up on the uh, the first two uh, uh paragraphs in the last passage that we read it talked about uh in my translation uh, for the for the, uh, this reason one who does not know the plans of the feudal lords cannot forge preparatory alliances uh one who does not employ local guides will not secure advantages of terrain and it and in the second passage talks about um um, you know, how a hegemonic power acts and says, for this reason, a hegemonic power does not contend with alliances under heaven. And we, there was some discussion in our last talk about heaven being uh, what heaven was. And, and on a sort of literal interpretation, it's reflecting sort of seasons and other things. But uh, on, a, on a human psychological level, it also reflects um, uh, in, in the work I did, um, uh, the idea of good and evil. Um, and and the reason that's important is because it goes to the premise of the book, which is when you're analysing um, yourself versus your opponent in terms of warfare being the greatest affair of the state, you're anal you're analysing the way. Who has the better way? This is that issue of the whole paradigm. It's that this book is not just a book of systems and rules, but also a book of viewing paradigms. And the reason I raise that in the start of my comment here is to then come back to plans, alliances, armies, and cities. And, and I would posit that, uh, because Joe, you said that uh, economics, this also talks to economics, and it absolutely does, as I believe it talks to all domains uh, where there's conflict, which is pretty much every domain. And uh, um, uh, I, would, I would posit that the, uh, that the American, uh, that the, the United States of America has taken more terrain uh, with its franchise operations than it has with its military <laughs> uh, since uh, World War II. Uh, you know, McDonald's, Starbucks, you know, how does that work? Well, they look at the, they go to the feudal lords in various places and they say, hey, we've got a plan. We're going to build a franchise and we're going to form an alliance. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to share the profits with you. All right. We're going to target something you want, which is, is pro, uh, you know, progress for your family and for your, for your community. Uh, and then, and what are we going to do then? Well, we're going to build an army of people to make hamburgers and to, uh, and to build restaurants. And then of course, uh, uh, then we're going to move into the store and, and, and produce the hamburgers. And so you see that plans, alliances, armies and cities. And of course, in this case, I'm really using uh, uh, armies uh, products, the hamburgers, um, as opposed to the product of, of warfare being the army in battle. Uh, the product of the McDonald's franchise is the hamburgers in the store and also the real estate uh, model that they use to duplicate. And of course, the, the cities literally are the restaurants themselves that take the local terrain in every one of the 30,000 places they occupy, and that's just one franchise. But the difference there is, uh, because they're a hegemonic power under heaven, and what does that mean? Um, you know, again, I came back to, I won't go into detail, but that whole separations of power issue, America having 
the greatest level of separations of power because it's not just the three levels of government, but also all of the resource controlling individuals that have you know, corporational power. Um, but then also the idea that they're founded on certain principles, the only country founded on, on ideals. So when they then make these plans and alliances, people are more inclined to say, hey, we don't mind if you come and take a whole bunch of our terrain in our home country because you're sharing the profits with us, you're sharing uh, the rewards. And this comes back to the first, first part of the book altogether, which is what is the better way? Um, you know, and, and I think that's the, that's the paradigm to look at uh, the plans and alliances aspect, because when you think about plans and alliances being about human thought, before you even get to battle, you get to the idea of avoiding battle and how do you do that? Well, then it's a battle of economics. It's a battle of, of resources in other ways, which isn't, uh, you know, battles, uh, uh, you know, military uh, battles. And so I just think that uh, this passage here uh, that we just read really talks to that uh, in the sense of what a hegemonic power is, because it talks to the human psychology. So one of the reasons that perhaps China and Russia don't have that same ability uh, to form alliances is because the principles that they espouse aren't codified in a way that, uh, you know, now for all of the America's faults, and there's plenty of them, um, they still have a codification that allows them to go, you know, go and say, hey, we're going to set up arrangements with you, which you can rely upon to some degree more than our opponents um, because of how we've created prosperity ourselves and how we share that prosperity. So that so this book, I think, speaks to that, um, you know, that is battles aren't just on the battlefield. And when you get to plans and alliances and the idea of information and thought by, ne by necessity, you're talking about economics and then you talk about feudal lords, terrain and all the rest of it. And you see how that applies to McDonald's and Starbucks and every other franchise group going. So, Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, as we said, you know, it's less violent, but that, those were excellent examples. Um, you know that how you develop something how you develop mutual interests uh and it's not just mutual interest amongst the nations themselves but it's also in this particular instance not even nations but companies that have influence on the nations uh, which is actually kind of interesting in its own right um as far as a way of warfare because then these companies are become tools in warfare uh and so that's another interesting part of this right these are you're using every tool at your disposal um and so uh you know it doesn't necessarily have to be just state resources you use the resources of you know mutually assured destruction economically uh, you know i'm going to make the cost of you you know of us uh, going to battle very very high um and you know it doesn't even necessarily have to be done um through the states it has to be, it can be done through through uh corporate interests which is a bit um unnerving to be quite honest uh i, I find that to be more disturbing than anything else because there's a lack of accountability that exists within that structure so you kind of think about the importance of trade within that when when it comes to that um uh point is that um yeah then, then you, the influence that corporations will have on trade agreements yeah and then there are some universal principles here with information still being the most important thing uh and how information is gathered at that you know it's actually that that too uh, could be gathered by uh um private interests but anyway yeah but the same principles hold the same um go ahead Quan. uh here's a definition that everyone knows that um, warfare is only the continuation of politics expressed with other means, okay? And in the sense of kinetic war. And I think that what John say is perfectly right in the sense that what is happening now is much more a financial and economic war between the big blocks ruling the planet right now. Uh, I think that uh, I am sad for what is happening in Ukraine, of course, 
but I dare say that what is happening in Ukraine is not the main focus of the actual battle between the great powers. The main focus of the actual battle between the great powers is the attack on the dollar, on the USD, okay? With uh, the movement of Saudi Arabia uh, trying to be more interesting for the US by going to China, for example, or the rapprochement of Saudi Arabia with Iran. Those things uh, have much more impacts than what is happening in Ukraine now, even if I am sad for the Ukrainian people, of course, but it's not the main focus of the battle between great powers nowadays. And the other thing I want to say is that uh, maybe I'm a little bit flippant on that, or maybe it's my wishful thinking, but the wealthy and powerful people have much more to lose in case of a global disaster because of atomics than the middle class. So I would say that, that they would not push for a war using atomics precisely because they have much more to lose than the average person. I stop here. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I'll, um, I'll withhold my comments, but I did want to come back to what you were talking about, um, uh, James. Yeah, I, I agree with Kwan. Um, yeah, this, uh, this, uh, that's why we're sort of like so happy, you know, it's like I, I've got this weird kind of life, lifetime of happiness, right? Uh, you think I was in ancient Greece or something and, you know, uh, the buddy of Plato or something like that. And it's kind of like, uh, even though uh, I was I was born in 1947, 1949 was the year that uh, NATO was founded, North Atlantic Treaty Organization was founded in Washington, DC in order to, basically consolidate uh, American power against the Soviet Union, which was emerging. And then a few months later, uh, the first uh, Soviet nuclear weapon was, was exploded. So, you know, it was kind of like a big wake up call, but I guess they were both kind of like wake up calls. In other words, the Cold War was possibly a surprise for a lot of people on, on either side. Um, although, uh, yeah, possibly. Anyway, uh, you know, because the United States and Soviet Union had been allies during the war, um, which ended in 1945, I guess. So, uh, and on this business of, uh, I just want to mention on this business of trademarks and uh, US trademarks and China, I mean, in a sense, uh, that's, that's certainly, it's a little idealistic because even though United States trade is really gigantic, uh, 9.8%, of world, of world uh, exports are, uh, are uh, done by the United States. And if you count imports and exports, there's more trade with the United States than any other country. But as far as exports go, uh, China is the number one exporter. And uh, so in a way they can sort of like, in a way as a country, they're laughing, you know, even they're the only thing that they have as a disadvantage is that they're, uh, GDP per capita is lower. In other words, the average worker in China does not make as much money as an American worker. Uh, but on the other hand, if you go to visit China, you know, you see a tremendous, uh, tremendously growing country and economy, domestic economy. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, you know, the United States exports have a lot to do with that, with the, with the comfort of the Chinese people. So it's not, yeah, there's a bit of a race on, but the trademarks don't matter that much in there. I don't think they're just all because of the U.S. Constitution. I think that's a very idealistic view of uh, of uh, the uh, United States. Uh, people in the United States don't necessarily feel that way. Uh, people, I, I visited Washington, D.C. and met people from there, and some people do tend to idealize the constitution. A lot of conservatives do, but uh, even, even liberals, some liberals have, have idealized the constitution a bit, but it's kind of stagnant. In other words, there's no, there haven't been any amendments in many, many years, de decades, decades, no amendments to the constitution, even though they seem to be vital, that process would seem to be vital. 
but you can't get states in the United States to agree to anything. For many, many years, that's been the case. So uh, it's not it's not the, the it's not the ideal political system that you know. Uh, uh, it's it's a it's an example of a political system that works, uh, and uh, but the uh, but the fact that McDonald's is doing good around the world, well, so is so are a lot of Chinese corporations, except they're not as well known here. Uh, one of them, as a matter of fact, uh, was uh, uh, Hitachi, not Hitachi, uh, uh, Huawei, and Huawei, of course, is a very important Chinese company, but they were uh, basically cut off. From a lot of world trade by the United by United States um, action, uh, so uh, I don't. Uh, but that, nevertheless, that didn't that didn't affect the Chinese economy overall. We China China is still the dominant exporter in the world. Um, it's interesting. I mean, though, in terms of. Uh, trade and, and 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 some of the things that you talked about um james it's just one of the things that i think uh could set up a war is the idea that if you're if you feel like your currency is not necessarily going to be worth as much in the future so you look at the opportunity to strike now and that's something that i was reading uh you know exploit any t opportunities by the enemy uh, such as leaving the door open. And if you feel like the door is open now, uh, that could lead you that you're not, you're, you're losing your influence in the world. Um, that could actually, I was thinking in terms of that could cause somebody to react, uh, in well, a, uh, an offensive manner. That's a, I think that's an error. I think that was covered with a so vis a vis the Soviet Union in the United States. That was covered in the 1950s by the Rand Corporation. They did a series of studies of uh, what the possibilities of nuclear conflict were and sure. what the strategies should should be considered to be. And uh, they came to the conclusion that there could not be a preemptive first strike. In other words, that uh, uh, any first strike would be uh, limited in its effectiveness, and the second strike would be uh, a high percentage, you know, within a reasonable percentage of as as effective as a as a preemptive first strike. So that they they came to the conclusion that uh, that that kind of plan was not feasible, and uh, that's been you know, part of the basis of the U.S. policy since then. I'm sure it's part of Russia's policy as well, because they don't even have a, they don't even have a first strike policy in Russia. They're, they're, uh, so uh, the, it's, it is, I think it's only France and the United States that, not France, but it's the United States that has one. Yeah, I, I yeah, I mean, I was, I'm just thinking about the external factors that may go into that decision, not necessarily with even nuclear weapons, uh, so far as that, it's just something else. Yeah, but I mean, it's been uh, studied, it's been studied by mathematicians and such, and they, they came to the conclusion that it was not feasible. Okay. Uh, Madeline. Well, I was just having a few thoughts as the discussion's gone along. Uh, one is that uh, they, they did have what they regarded as a world-ending technology in Sun Tzu, and that was fire. Um, as we discussed in a previous chapter, I remember uh, Amon had said it was, it was considered just incredibly dishonorable to use fire in warfare, and yet there's an entire section devoted to it um, because this is about how to win. And when you look at it from their perspective, fire really was a world ender. You could burn down a warehouse, you could burn down a granary, you could burn down towns, you could burn crops, you could burn people, livestock, anything. Um, and in the West, we had uh, salting the earth, uh, which, would, which would make it, you, you, you can't grow crops in it after that. So they had world-ending technologies, you know, for, on their own scale. Um, what they didn't have were, oh, I hate this stupid computer. I don't know why it sends up these little messages. Um, 
wants me to set up a professional audio studio for some reason. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I think you you might have a talent uh, that that's uh, you know waiting to be tapped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the other thing is the fire. Oh yeah, um, was when John was talking about competing paradigms. I think that we have competing paradigms now, whereas in during the time Sun Tzu was written, the warring states didn't have competing paradigms in terms of basically how a state was to be run. Um, you know, it wasn't like capitalism versus communism versus communitarianism versus I don't even know what. Um, so we have, it, it, you know, it wasn't like um, as if you took a warring states group, like one feudal lord and and his and his and his troops, and put them down in Africa and had them battle it out for the best way to govern a group. Um, so it was it was somewhat more limited in scope in terms of what they were fighting for. You know, they were fighting for territory and domination, but they weren't fighting for an ideology, really. Uh, John. Yeah, actually, I think um, um, what Madeline just said uh, almost directly uh, addresses what James was saying. And that is, you're right, Madeline, um, uh, the, the better way going back into um, more historical times, obviously, was really the, uh, the better kingdom. Uh, if you like, not the not the better thought process or the, the, the governance system, uh, and yet as as human, the better way is an evolving thing. That's the paradigm point I'm making, which is as we evolve as humans, we continue to look at what the better way is, and um, and that leads us then to the point where the crossover from tribes uh, and kingdoms uh, became uh, 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 founded in ideals, which really uh, you know uh, happened when the Americans asserted their independence um, uh, and uh, and committed to a series of documents as opposed to a series of tribes. Certainly when the guy who won the war uh, gave up the power and went back to his farm rather than making himself an emperor. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, which ironically meant that the, he was the only one they could trust when they needed to set a, a prototype for the presidency in place because they knew he wouldn't, he wouldn't hang on to the power he did the first time. I mean, you know, uh, even King... Uh, even uh, King George said that how remarkable that was. You know, he's truly the greatest man uh, that, that lived if he's done such a thing, you know, as remarkable as that was. I think the, um, um, uh, just, James, I think I said it to you once in a comment uh, on the chat recently. Uh, I live in a country that still has in, in one quarter of our flag, the very Union Jack, which your national anthem speaks against. Right. In fact, I think there's a there's a passage you guys don't sing anymore in that national anthem about the British. <laughs> I've, we've still got the Union Jack in the corner of our flag. Our, our, our posture in World War Two was to give up the top half of uh, the top third of Australia to the Japanese invaders should they land. Uh, we still aren't able to defend ourselves in our own right as a country. So um, with respect, well, you shake your head, but I've, I've got to say, like uh, when we look at what's happening in the States, for example, with political destabilization, what happens if the US, in fact, does suffer some of the real issues politically that people are concerned about? You know, Australia is rather isolated. We, you know, we're geographically far away from invaders and all the rest. Um, but, that, you know, I mean, the whole point of this book is to say you can't hope things won't happen. You've got to prepare to make sure they don't. And Australia is not in a position to do that. So I can't, you know, so you can shake your head at that, James, but I can't, I can't fathom it sitting where I am uh, when, you know, because I don't think any American who was of a right mind in terms of their own position in the world would accept that as a starting point for their country, that you couldn't defend yourself. In fact, it's the complete opposite. You're the John, can, I, can I just ask you, John, was your point that America's founded on values and nobody else was? Was that the original point? No, the point is, is that the point is, is that the, um, uh, the, the better way evolved from being tribally derived to being derived on a set of principles. <laughs> However well, uh, however well they're executed, they're at least an attempt to do that. No one else has at least has attempted actually to do that 
in a, in a continuous fashion. Um, and then the other point I'd make is you've seen the power of that at different times, like when Abraham Lincoln uh, expressly changed the oath of allegiance away from the country to the actual founding documents, which was something that was quite pivotal in the minds of people in the military and uh, in, on January the 6th, by way of example, but mm. also at other times. I'm not saying these things are perfect at all. I'm not suggesting. I'm just saying it's a it's a paradigm shift towards progress. Um, but just to finish, um, uh, in the passages we read in the book, um, it talked about bestowing rewards not required by law, imposing exceptional uh, impose exceptional government orders, um, and then it talked about compel them with prospects for profit, but not inform them about the harm. So that goes back to that point I was making about economic uh, engagement as a form of warfare because compelling them with profit, uh, bestowing rewards, rewards beyond the law, which is more economic, uh, speaks to that. Uh, and then also uh, when it talked about, um, there was another point I wanted to make in the passage about have them penetrate fatal terrain and they will live. And that right. point I was talking about with fatal terrain before, um, it seems counterintuitive if you call it dead terrain or you call it, uh, uh, what was the other uh, title given it to uh, uh, that Amon uh, called it? Um, but if it's considered dead terrain, uh, then the idea that they would live in dead terrain is counterintuitive. So that's where that fatal terrain idea is actually the point of engagement. But look, I do, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that America's perfect or anything like that. I'm just simply trying to say there's a reason that they um, have full spectrum dominance across the globe in the way that they do. And there's a reason why Australia doesn't or other countries don't. And part of what I know in the culture here, having spent time in the States and spent time in Australia, lived in Australia is that we don't have an open-mindedness that allows us to innovate the idea of we're, we're very constrained over here by what other people think okay so the discourse in Australia is a lot a lot lot less free and open um you know um, I'm positively gregarious over here but over there I'm actually quite mild, mildly mannered when I get to the states um you know there's quite a cultural difference in in the way that these ideals have have infiltrated the way society operates and I, and just to finish i often say that the, the real freedom america's got is the it's an excuse that how i phrase this but they've really asserted the freedom to do anything they want including how to they're fully free to fuck things up and uh and so the errors that america makes um are a part of that freedom because the very stretching of the concept of it, it often leads to errors mistakes i mean there's there's a whole um, uh, there's a whole catalog of uh, of scandals, American scandals. There's a podcast on it. Hundreds of scandals where institutions have failed society in all sorts in America. So I'm not suggesting in any way they're perfect, but that freedom speaks to something that allows them to you know why did they invent the franchise system before other countries? Why did why do they prevail? And why is it that our allies will prefer to you know listen to them and Australia's done it? And so we're not going to have a Hawaii, a Hawaii the, you know, the, the tele telephony company uh, as part of our infrastructure because we don't want state secrets going back to the Chinese uh, Communist Party. I mean, that's happened all across the globe in the Western world to limit that technological spread. And part of that's because when faced with a choice, uh, great uh, states like Australia, the, mid the middle states, say, well, look, we, we at least can rely to some degree on America following the rules of the road, many of which she has set herself. I'll let James respond to that since it was. Yeah, it's just a lot of awful lot to respond to. I think uh, all the countries have a history. Australia and the United States both have uh, very long histories, especially compared to uh, China, and even longer than Japan, which you know was your former kind of like uh, considerable uh, considerable enemy in the South Pacific. I understand that kind of fear. How that. Uh, that that becomes you know like in in the case of Ger in the case of uh, Europe uh, with the Second World War Europe was uh, wasn't uh, had nothing to do with the United States or uh, Australia directly but it did have to do with uh, the British position in the war and the German position and so forth uh, and uh, probably even something to do with uh, Russian diplomacy, but uh, not, certainly not uh, started by the Russians. Uh, and they helped to finish it, as we know, um, or the Soviets, rather. Um, the, uh, the, the 
the, Ch the Chinese, rather than be victims, of course, created a nation and have been laid at it, um, at, 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 you know, at consolidating the nation under Chairman Mao. And we know how bloody and difficult uh, that, uh, that uh, transition was. Um, but on the other hand, they've been successful and they have probably as many connections in the, United, in the world as the United States does. Um, the, idea, the idea of full spectrum dominance of the United States, I think that's a fantasy. Um, I don't even think the United States says that. They, they rely on connections in order to, uh, in order to assert their power. They, they, uh, the, 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 the number of uh, memberships that they have in the various uh, treaty and defense organizations. Uh, and then China is playing the same game. They have treaties with just about every country in the world that they trade with, including, of course, the United States and Australia, I suppose. Uh, so so the, uh, the, I think these treaties are going to be upheld. I don't think there's any imminent danger to Australia uh, from China, and there's certainly no danger to the United States from China. There's, a, there's kind of this myth of um, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan, but that's just a myth. It's not a statement. And uh, it's not, you know, it's not an ultimatum. Um, and uh, it's just, yeah, it's so it's, uh, they, that's it, they, this, China simply won't separate from Taiwan. It's like the United States, Hawaii being a part of the United States now, much further from the United States than Taiwan. Uh, would you defend Hawaii? If you're in the United States, would you defend Hawaii? Yeah, you probably would. You'd want to defend Hawaii if it were ever attacked. It was the same thing with Taiwan. China would want to defend Taiwan as a Chinese entity if it were ever attacked. So, so it's not, uh, it is not uh, as, uh, as, as kind of uh, exactly what the propaganda says. And uh, as far as Australians go, I, I, you know, I understand how great a country Australia is. And like I said before, it has its own history, but the result of that is the right wing, I think in Australia has become a little bit, not the whole right wing probably, but there's this meme of uh, bully, bully existence. In other words, you only get somewhere by being a bully. And uh, you don't have this much, you don't have quite that same approach in the United States or Canada. I've lived in other countries. And I know that in those other countries, I have as much freedom there as I do here. Uh, Germany, France, Canada, you know, the, the freedom is, is, is always the same. You don't have more freedom in the United States. And I'm sure in Australia, I wouldn't feel suppressed if you do. I, I don't know if you do, but you seem to have this, all these idealistic beliefs in the United States. Well, this is a country full of cities in, de, in, de, in degeneration. Full of full of uh, infrastructure degenerating, full of crime. You know, so this is not the perfect country that you're talking about. And and uh, can things be done to improve? Yes, we might be able to improve. And they, you know, like we do have this possibility of good government uh, that that uh, is promised in the Constitution. We might be able to get there again, but we do have a we're in a kind of a period of economic and uh, and. Uh, uh, moral decline, I would say. And as far as Australia goes, yeah, they're just like any other country, except that you do have this tendency to over-idealize the bully. You want, you want the United States as a bully to be on your side. And the United States pretends to be that. And, and so I'm, I'm sure that's really why you've come to this kind of like ideology that the United States is the only hope for Australia and the United States uh, emerging out of its situation positively is the only hope for Australia. But maybe there's another hope. Maybe that's that you don't have to dominate other countries. Maybe it's that mm. other countries will just simply get along with you and you'll get along with them. Maybe there is a different kind of foreign policy that's possible for Australia and for the US. That's my opinion. Uh, you know, John, go ahead and respond. I, but I want to give everybody a chance to talk. But I also want I want to come back to the psychological aspect of some point because I I think that that's interesting in how it can be applied um, internally to a corporation of some sort. To be quite honest, uh, the role of the general 
um, I'd like to put that on the t table is that, you know, deceiving your own employees, not exactly the ideal thing, but this idea that the, the, the company is the most, the primacy is it's the most important thing. Therefore, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I think that there's something analogous to that as you look at a, almost somebody running like a CEO is almost like a general to say, and they would probably use some of the same techniques. Uh, and that's kind of a, in that particular instance, I find it completely unethical. Um, however, uh, you know, can't give everybody trade secrets and just let, you know, let them walk out the door either uh, and say, you know, here you go. Um, you know, there's a reason why there are uh, segregation of duties, so to speak, um, you know, to, to, and, and not just for the simple fact of audit purposes. Um, anyway, I would like to get people's thoughts on that because there is that psychological uh, component uh, that, you know, the fun, it's fundamental to human nature and how that's fundamental to human nature in general. Uh, the idea of deception in order to get people to do what you want them to do, uh, you know, and how that works at various levels, uh, not just within warfare or governments. Um, so, uh, John. Yeah, look, uh, just to respond to you there, James, uh, uh, in just a couple of quick points. Uh, one, it's not an ideal idealization at all, and uh, certainly it's not a simplistic view of uh, appreciating the bully. The point I was making is Australia can't defend itself. I'm not saying we should be attacking. Uh, we can't defend ourselves. So we don't meet the fundamental tenets of this of this book that we're reading, right? We're not prepared to head off, you know, if what's that to say, you know, uh, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war. I mean, so the, the old Churchillian call. I mean, like, the, 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 that's the problem there. In terms of the United States, the, the clue is in the name. The United States, not not not. It's not Australia. It's not a country name. It's it, it's the. It's not called America. It's called the United States of America. The, you guys have fifty jurisdictions and a, and a few territories where different governments can do, you know different ways of life can for sure. If you want to be a Mormon, uh, polygamous Mormon, you can go to Utah. You know, you want to be a venture capitalist, you go you you go you go to uh, California. I mean, there's a reason California's in the top 10 economies of the world, and it's only a state for crying out loud. We don't have uh, in Australia the separation of states' rights or the idea of an independent, you know, we have, we have a very crude state identity as compared to the United States. And that leads to a lack of uh, different terrain spaces for different people to pursue different interests. Um, and so, you know, we've got six states that are roughly the same landmass, and most of them are homogenous in very, and and almost all the ways we apply laws here uh, homogenizes the laws between the federals, the feds, and the states. Doesn't leave that gap. Now, Americans might be frustrated by those overlaps and that gridlock, but that's in fact the space of freedom that really is fundamental to American success. You can move to a different place and start again in America. You can't do that here. Um, and uh, um, uh, and I'd also just make the point that um, um, the treatise, this book, calls us to make comparative analysis of the different um, situations, of the different uh, players, your opponents. So when I look at America, I'm simply making comparative analysis. It's not, it's not an idealism that leads me to make these conclusions. It's their domination in so many different domains. Um, uh, the, the commentary about China and, and their various approaches being equivalent, well, they're not. I've already explained that plans, alliances, armies and cities, or plans, alliances, products and locations is the order of battle. Every time China makes an iPhone, they, they make about 290 bucks. Uh, the United States makes 1100 for not making it. <laughs> right? Every time you make an iPhone, uh, you know, America's four times better off as a result of not making it. So being an equal exporter or an equal manufacturer, that simply means that China's occupying their space. They are focused on the uh, armies and cities part of the engagement spectrum, not the plans and alliances part in quite the same way that the United States is. And so for me, it's comparative analysis. You can't ignore what's made America successful in the same way you can't ignore their failures. If you were going to compare health systems, you certainly wouldn't say America's was better. So I just think that uh, to sort of apply a label to say it's simple or it's this or it's a bully thing or any of that, it's just not getting to the nub of the detail as to why these freedoms have, uh, have been important. 
and, and it's not to say freedoms don't exist elsewhere, but clearly America leads the world in so many domains, but they're also failing in so many ways too. Joe, just to come back to your comment about corporations, um, that to say you, you've made the right point. Really, really quickly, I just want to come back to your one point, your gridlock, uh, gridlock as a source of strength. Um, that can also work against, like eventually lead to the, to the destruction uh, because of the lack of, I mean, and that's one of the great fears that I have is that it, the, that the two parties have not necessarily thought about passing legislation per se or doing anything. They're just trying to stop one another more times than not. Uh, and it hasn't really become a true negotiation. So that gridlock, it does, it, there, there's, a, there, it, there's both sides to it. I, I agree with you, right? That there, it does afford um, a certain level of uh, checks and balances to, you know, where uh, uh, there are, are voice given to certain you know, states or whatever, like in order to, to, to have their interests met. But at the same time, when, when you currently have what we, the current political parties, the groups in charge that we do, that can also become a, uh, uh, a very uh, dangerous um, uh, in, a, in that it can divide a country as well. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think it's just interesting. I mean, either way, I, I, I think you, you, the point is valid on both sides. No, I agree with that, Joe. And uh, all I was saying there was that um, um, uh, the separation of the states, I'm saying it does lead to gridlock. I was actually saying that I was agreeing with your point, if you like. I was saying as yeah, much sure. as I'm frustrates people because of the gridlock. Um, when I was in the United States, right, and we were driving across the Oakland City Bridge, everyone was doing like, I think it was, you know, like, I, I can't remember exactly, it was 80, 80 mile an hour, and the signs all said 60, and there's like five lanes all doing 20 mile an hour of the speed limit. Over here, it wouldn't happen. We have speed cameras. I said to my uh, American friend, what the hell's going on here? Why aren't the cops busting everyone? She said, well, we've got citizens initiated referendums. What we'll do is put it on the ballot. We'll change the speed limits. The cops know it. It's a it's basically a, a gentleman's agreement, a standoff, if you like. And so we we have some flexibility in that. We don't have citizens initiated referendums in Australia. We don't have a Bill of Rights, okay? Seriously, we don't even have freedom of speech uh, guaranteed to us, right? The very thing you guys put at the top of your list. Now, the, the point I'm simply making is, hey, what has that led to? So, you know, whether, whether you agree with marijuana reform or not, it's meant that a whole bunch of states could come along and say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna change marijuana even if the feds don't agree, we're going to, the feds can still say it's illegal. We're going to say it's legal, and we're just going to let that stand as a as a contradiction in in law, uh, simply because we're states. We have an independent freedom to make those laws, and that would never happen here in that way. Uh, we just don't have that sort of independence uh, of thought, you know, because it's the independence of thought that says, "Hey, citizens can uh, have a uh, citizens initiated referendum." I mean, that's a perfect example of the sort of freedom that over here, you know, over here. They say we can't have citizens initiate uh, initiated referendums because people can't be trusted. Our constitution won't allow it, which is nonsense. It legally could be passed, but but people here say no. We don't trust our people to have those those rights. <laughs> right. Interesting. Were you about to comment really quickly on? Oh maybe yeah, look, James. Just... James, do you want to reply? Maybe. And yeah, then thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no. I, the only thing I have to say is I, I, I agree with you, uh, Joseph. You kind of woke me up a little bit. Uh, the The Constitution is a disappointment. It, it the the part about the states doesn't work isn't working. It it uh, it was the parts of the Constitution are extremely logical and clever. Uh, the 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 bit with between like sharing power between the the people. And the states, uh, the states have rights and people have rights. Uh, that was very clever. And it, it could kind of like work in, a, in ideal, uh, some ideal situations. I don't know how well it worked in uh, 1796 uh, or somebody, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really know, uh, you know, when the Supreme Court was actually invested. I, I don't know uh, how, how the, uh, how, how the, uh, uh, in ideal times, the United States could have worked, uh, but uh, you know I don't know enough American history. But uh, uh, I know just a little bit. But uh, the the stuff uh, that uh, I'm aware of now 
is that the parts of the Constitution that are about states' rights, uh, that depend on states' rights, don't actually work. In other words, we don't have the possibility of the states changing uh, the Constitution, which we were supposed to have. And, uh, and this is because of this uh, politics, the politics, you know, the wrecked politics, the, uh, I forget what the word was the, uh, that you used, uh, but the, uh, the, 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 the gridlock, right. So anyway. Yeah, the politics of stopping the other party. Yeah, the right. gridlock. Yeah, so, so, so this, this, uh, this has been in effect for decades. So we don't really know uh, what the Constitution could actually work like. We don't have a vision in my, my lifetime. We don't have that much of a vision. I think maybe the last amendments were passed in my lifetime, but we don't have a recent uh, basically picture of that. And uh, the, uh, and we do know about the embarrassments, you know, the, the prohibition and the anti-prohibition and so forth, which is a good example of lack of freedom, right? But I mean, so no freedom is perfect. And uh, I, I'm surprised at your comments about not being able to start over in another part of Australia. Like you can't move from Sydney to Melbourne. Is that what you were saying, John? That's that, that was just a question I wanted to ask. Uh, that's right, because what, what happens here is we because we've got so few states, and because there's a real uh, not a concept that the federal government prevails, uh, the all the databases are completely connected in such a way that you're you know there's no chance of a reinvention. You know, let's say you've made mistakes or errors, and plenty of people do. Uh, one thing you can do is you know change your identity and start again in America quite easily. Um, now, now whether that's a virtuous thing or not, I'm, I'm, you know it's not for me to say. It's just to say what's possible, and it's not it, sure you can move states here. Sure, you can live in a different city, um, but your past tends to follow you in a way that, you know, let, let's say that you had a, a bad upbringing, you, you know, you, you broke the law, you were punished and so on. You, you can't really escape that over here. OK, that just follows you forever. Now, maybe it should. I mean, that maybe is the argument. But what I see in America so often is that if, if you say you can do the job and you do the job, they're not so concerned about the school you went to over here. The school that you went to, especially if it's a private school, no, no, there's an elitism in America too, don't get me wrong, but here it really counts. In America, you know, merit is still much more of a thing. And James, I'm not for a moment suggesting America's perfect, no, obviously not. And I'm not also suggesting that there isn't needs for reforms, you know, uh, but the fact that you, you, have, uh, you have a document that has allowed reforms and a bill of rights that allowed someone like Martin Luther King to come along and say, you know, these principles you've got written down don't apply mm -hmm. to us. Now, that, that benchmark of being able to make a comparative evaluation of, of first principles against the current situation, Australia can't do because we don't have a Bill of Rights. So what does that mean? It means the very government system you fought a war of independence against is what we have here now, <laughs> hundreds of years later. It's like, so it's, 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 it's really, um, and, con and conceptually, it's, uh, there's a lack of memory. I was only talking to some other people here who are innovators saying how, when they go to the states, they're met with, they're, you know, there's a, um, a booster, you know, that boostering mentality of lifting up people for success. Whereas in Australia, it's very much the tall poppy syndrome, which I know Canada, Canadians talk about as well. The idea that, you know, success is to be uh, not not uh, um, um, promoted because somehow you'll, you'll think you're better than other people, right? This is that whole, and it's a cultural issue as much as it's political. What I'm really saying, perhaps to finish all that, is not to say that the documents everyone carries around in their top pocket refers to it and somehow that guides all the principle. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that the cultural ideas that come from it, um, which are good and bad in American terms, the same idea of freedoms leads to the crazy right wing or crazy left wing outcomes that, you know, over in Australia, you're right, we did have a little right wing bully boy thing, but that was more of an exception, but it wasn't really a cultural issue. It was sort of a political rump in a party that had power for a moment. And they were just tossed out. You know, everyone's had enough of them. They, they don't hold power in any state in Australia now, the Conservatives, for that very reason. Um, lots of problems in America, but I'm just saying it's the cultural thing, you know. Um, and, and just to finish this example, when I, when, I was in the, when I was in San Francisco, I had a, you know, they've got panhandlers there. They're very industrious over there. In Australia, they just ask for money. They don't offer services. And, and, a, and this guy asked me for money and, and and I said to him, look, mate, you know, I've been here for you know, a couple of weeks and I've handed out several hundred dollars already because that's my inclination. 
you know, just as I met people, because it's part of being generous and I was just, you know, doing my thing. And I said, but I've come to realize I'm not going to solve this poverty problem by myself, sort of tongue in cheek. And you know what he said to me? He said, hey, man, this is America. You can be anyone you want, American man. Just say no. Don't give me this English guilt trip shit. Just say no. Right. And he thought I was English and, uh, or, you know, from mm. some other place. And, and what I realized in that one moment was culturally he was freer in his mind than I was, because for him, it was a simple transaction. Hey, uh, land of opportunity. I ask you for something. You say yes or no. We move on. We're all happy. Me, I'm worried about it. I'm worried about how he's feeling. I'm worried about whether I've done enough to give out money. I'm, you know, <laughs> this is the cultural difference that I'm trying to uh, explain beyond the documents and beyond the politics. It's just that freedom that, and it was it was remarkable. I ended up giving that guy twenty bucks. He gave me a lesson in philosophy that was that I, I remember to this day because it was such a, a valuable insight into the fact that I was worried about what other people thought. That's the problem in Australia. We worry about too much of what other people think. It leads us to be inhibited and not innovative enough to actually just grab the bull by the horns and do something new mm. in case someone else might criticize us. Understood. Uh, Under, I was just going to say uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the San Francisco makes a lot of people feel good. In other words, <laughs> being in San Francisco gives people a sense of other, from other parts of the United States, a, 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 very, power, a very, very powerful, pleasant feeling. And that's probably the feeling of freedom that you're talking about. So you're right. The freest spot might be San Francisco. Or maybe it used okay. to be, or it used, maybe it used to be. Maybe it's yeah. not right now, uh, you know, because of all the problems, but maybe it I'm used to be the, the best spot. 20 years. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what I thought. Yeah. 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 So, um, hey, thank you so much for your comments tonight, um, as always. Uh, they're always uh, profound. And uh, so your presence presence here is, uh, you know, just deeply appreciated. Thanks. So, so, so see you next week. Bye bye. See you, bye. my friend. Yeah. Bye, Squan. No. Well, anyway, I was going to ask about the psychology aspect of it. Uh, you know, anyway, but I thought that that was a, another interesting, just how that could be applied uh, into today's world. Um, I mean, I, I've appreciated everybody's comments, though. Uh, I mean, I, I thank you both for staying this long. I mean, this is a, it's a treat for me um, to listen uh, and to learn. Uh, so, I mean, I, and, and James, you know, like all the points you made, I felt were very valid. I think part of the difficulty is trying to convey the, the meaning of you know, the nuance of words versus your meaning. I think you perhaps better understood the cultural thing I was trying to reflect on. Uh, at the end, where I was able to share a few anecdotes, uh, because uh, um, uh, yeah, it's and it's something that I, I I feel Americans take for granted because you just live in it all the time, and so then, for, like most people, you see the problems around you more than you see the virtues, because the problems are so confronting as they are for all of us. But in mm -hmm. Australia, when you've got less tools to use to affect the problems, um, then you feel, and then especially someone like me who knows a lot of Americans, spent time in America study a lot of American history. And then I look at our fundamental, into, our fundamental inability to get our own flag for crying out loud. I mean, even Canada got their own flag, said, hey, we'll get rid of that Union Jack and we'll put something like the maple leaf on there because it's representative of us, you know? And like, we don't have that. I mean, it, and that's, we've got people over here who every year on our national day wave this flag like somehow they're being Australian, but they're not. <laughs> it's, it's like... <laughs> It's it's such a contradiction in terms, but just to touch on what you were saying, Joe, and then I'll uh, stop talking for a bit. Um, that psychological issue um, when you yeah. talked about when you talked about corporations, I think you were right when you got to that nub of trade secrets. So uh, is it deception to keep um, a special project development with the design team, for example, not share it amongst the bulk of the staff for fear of leaks of a, of a new product launch? Uh, not deception, just discretion might be the better word. Exactly. So yeah. I think that I think the uh, the uh, the is concept... that fair? I mean, all right. I mean, okay. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say I think the concept of deception is the concept of selective sharing of information. You know, it's it's referred to as deception in warfare because I guess we understand the intent of warfare is to defeat your opponent. It's very uh, literal. Um, but I'm but I think that you know. Um, 
uh, Alan uh, uh, picked up on that whole information aspect as being the pivotal point, especially when you talk about plans. But I think there's absolutely no doubt that this treatise, uh, The Art of War, uh, describes other domains, and, and it certainly applies uh, the two most direct ones outside of warfare is commerce and sport. Um, yeah. So in both those... But I, I, I think the other aspect, there's another aspect of this that's psychological in the sense that, you know, it, with the... It, uh, the idea of um, drinking the the corporate Kool Aid. I mean, and, and my you know my um, one roommate actually uh, one time he worked at Amazon, and he said, you know, my God, he goes these these individuals would it's like face us as their God, and uh, he he felt like in a way. So it, it's almost like you created this environment where you know people were following everything he did and or his, his 10 whatever 10 principles that he had um and they were treating him uh you know almost like uh well as if you're a general that has won the you know won the praise of your of your men um and it's just i, I don't know it, it it seems to me that a lot of these things function in a similar way uh it's with the psychology of parts of this and um and I and uh, so I mean and and it's just the idea of drinking the corporate Kool Aid sometimes. Well, I mean that's essentially what what. It's funny for you to call it that because I'm just wondering if it if this isn't just another governing principle, the principle of leadership. Uh, even though that sounds evil, right? Because that was the principle of Nazi Germany, right? You 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 pick a leader, and then that prince that leader becomes the whole reason for your existence. And uh, you're, right. you're obviously talking about the, the leader, the ex-leader of Amazon, right? Who had the, the principles, uh, who, who disclosed his, his, his governing principles to you know, the world and his staff. And, and I think that, that idea of, of like, you know, the basis of forming a sound corporation um, is, is equally important to things like the US constitution or, in other words, it's not the the fact that there that these ideas were some ideas were combined with uh, what do you call it eugenics and uh, uh, racism, flat out racism and uh, uh, hatred for the other, uh, right. intoler intolerance for uh, otherness, this the, the or xenophobia, right? So the the fact that this was all wrapped up in a kind of like a neat package by the Nazis doesn't obviate the fact that good leadership, sound leadership, is a, is a very important principle of sustainability and, uh, and, good go you know, and good governance. So I'm not saying that everyone should be a dictatorship or as dictated, you know, dictatability, right, have the dictatability of some of the right-wing countries or the, or, or, uh, the, uh, the uh, Republic of China, not Republic of China, what's it called? Uh, the the uh, people's uh, China China people's uh, Republic. China, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so so you know, I'm not saying that there's a single model for how good for I don't. What I'm saying basically is there's not a single model of good good governance. There's many models, and uh, for a nation, it's probably some kind of uh, flexible uh, uh, system that observes the will of the people. And, uh, you know, so that I think that's the critical thing. And you can call it democracy and let everybody vote every four years, but there's going to be a lot of voters who are frustrated as hell. I don't care how good everything is going. The voters that don't get their way, uh, you know, are, 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 are going to end up uh, frustrated. And if that becomes a habit, if they start losing the elections, you know, then they can get extremely frustrated. And we have that in the United States now. We have a frustrated right wing that that feels like uh, elections have even been stolen from them, right? So when they, up, when they set up the voter suppression in the first place, <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, they've set up a lot of the techniques. You're right. So oh, the oh. yeah. So I'm just saying to just 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 oh, gotcha. uh, finish. It is not. It is not. There's not a single principle that that uh, there's not a single set of principles. It's really uh, uh, something that is evolving. It's something that has evolved. And uh, I understand democracy is very old. It was probably started by partly by Spinoza or maybe and some others perhaps, but uh, you know, came out of the Renaissance. But but uh, on the other hand, uh, 
a lot the the there there are uh, an, an awful there's an awful lot to say for just playing your cards correctly. In other words, just getting the dominant just getting the dominant economy and uh, be welcoming to other people and other nations. Don't try to create barriers between yourself and others. Like in other words, we're. I'm not saying you're wrong, John. I'm just saying the idea that I'm thinking about is that Australians are sitting ducks. Well, maybe not. Oh, no. Can, can I, can I just respond? Can I yes, just respond? Um, look, I agree with you. I concur. Um, the point you're making about there being lots of uh, uh, levels of measurement, lots of principles to, to look at, that was the point I guess I was making about the Americans, was to say that um, uh, there are a number of elements that they have got right, and they must be considered um, under the what the book compels us to do. Um, I would simply uh, you referred to the Nazis, um, and 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 Joe, you referred to the leadership uh, principle, the idea of the leader of the general in a corporation. You know, is the general corporation, and how does that apply to? And it does. Um, I would simply say that the book talk, talks about uh, the predominance of the factors or the considerations being in your favour. So uh, what happens is you've got all the variables and then you've got to do an assessment of how many of those variables are in your favour. And they're not all, they're not, it can't possibly be the case they're all in your favour because the book also says um, you can't defend on all sides. You know, if you try to defend all sides, everything is weak. Um, so uh, that's, that's the failing of the concept of full spectrum dom dominance the Americans have, which is it's not really possible to achieve that. It's an objective they've got militarily um, uh, and politically, but it's not something they can achieve. In terms of the uh, the, the, the measurement of the variables, uh, those variables are also spread across um, various considerations. So it's not enough just to have, you know, 51% of the variables on your side, or if you've got 70%, that's better than 51%. You've also got to make sure those variables are proportioned in the right places. If there's any gaps, in one major facet of the strategy, uh, then it's what I call certain failure. I mean, I've got a list of strategic certain failure points, and if you, if any one of those points comes up, you're a dead duck. Um, and um, uh, and picking that up on the Nazi example, um, one of the pivot points in the strategic continuum of of the considerations is is this issue of heaven, uh, and the issue of heaven. Um, uh, which is, I believe, half of this book is psychological. It's about heaven, and heaven it does reflect on the, on uh, on energy, yin and yang. It reflects on seasons, but it also reflects on right and wrong. There's a reason why people. One of the reasons the American revolutionaries won the war was they felt they were on the on the uh, uh, the uh, side of right. Okay, one of the reasons the Allies won the war against the Nazis was the same reason. Now, when you're when you're murdering people, you know you can drink as much grog as you like as a soldier trying to avoid the reality of it, but you can't, and so that naturally demoralises you. You know Hitler was successful before the war because if you watch the Nuremberg rallies, it was almost like Obama in his acceptance speech in Colorado. That was that sort of popularity and reverence for this change agent who's come along and freed them from the poverty of the Treaty of Versailles. You know, and and their and their political lack of leadership uh, that subsequently occurred. I mean, he turned them from a, a basket case of poverty, uh, in, uh, a poverty stricken country into an economic superpower in 10 years. And he did that by essentially channeling those strategic considerations. I'm not saying mostly what happens is it's, it's coincidental. They don't have this, they don't have this structure, this algorithm and sit down and map it out. It's more that it just so happens that the things that occur coincides with this algorithm. And for as long as it does, they succeed. And then the moment they seem to trip on a certain failure point, it falls away pretty quickly. And so when Hitler was building autobahns and, and Volkswagens, the people, people's car, and, and, you know, when he was building them up economically, um, well, then he was, in, he, he was in a strategic space that was, in fact, a, a virtuous space. He was creating progress. He was lifting up his people. The moment he ventured into the... Into the into the area of the Jewish, you know, the the, the Jewish, um, uh, the Holocaust, and you know, the persecutions and all the rest, and then went to war. Um, uh, well, then that was the moment that he he almost in the middle of the strategic considerations, 
failed the test of leadership. It's not a better way when you're doing that and so on. Because, you know, as uh, as others talked about in this talk, if, if the thing is to avoid war with plans and alliances. Imagine if Hitler had built up Germany the way he did and then, like George Washington, decided to give up the power back to the German parliament and go back to a farm, having built rebuilt the economy and then given them the gift of, of a democracy at the same time. Well, the, I would say now you'd have the European Union that would be run almost exclusively by Germany, <laughs> almost as, as the United States runs, runs the, the, their empire. Um, but he didn't do that. And that's the that's the the pivot point. Same with corporations. For as long as the corporations doing something that's you know great, you know Elon Musk is landing reusable rockets, and people are like, hey, we can go to Mars, and isn't it great? We're only spending ten percent of the cost on rockets. Well, that's great. But then the moment he starts to be a right wing nut job on Twitter, they're not so good. <laughs> you know, suddenly suddenly the strategic things that he had in alignment when he's doing the SpaceX stuff come into a violent confrontation with the strategic aspects of of a social media platform and Twitter. You know, he hasn't done for Twitter what he's done for the rocket industry with SpaceX. Um, you know, uh, so I, I guess what I'm trying to do there, James, is, is say you're right. Uh, all these different facets you talk of, the different principles should be evaluated. And so when I look at China, and just to finish, when I look at China and America, really simply put, one of the things I look at is the separation of powers. Well, that's from Montesquieu. That's a French concept, right? <laughs> That's that's not that's not an American concept or a Chinese concept, and yet it's it's for me a fundamental measurement of of power because it's the issue of separation of power is it is it allows that freedom for a better way. It means that someone who who can they can use power within that country to do something that if they have a totalitarian structure they simply don't have the autonomy to do. With the United States having um, the separation of powers shared by the three branches of government and then probably a million other corporate leaders. Uh, maybe more, um, you know, it, it really has by, by total number, far and away, the greatest number of people in the category of separation of powers as compared to China. And that, what does that lead to? It leads to when people go over there, we're now seeing journalists being locked up, we're seeing corporate leaders being locked up, people are scared to do business in China right now. There's concerns about what this totalitarian structure is doing because there's a lack of separation of powers. So when I measure China against America, I'm not going, hey, the document of the Constitution's made all the difference. I'm going, on this one facet, like you say, James, there's all these facets. That one facet of separation of powers is, is a profoundly important facet in my mind. Quite, and it's not an American concept. It's not a Chinese concept. It's just a leadership concept, which is, in fact, what the art of war tells us to do. Look for leadership principles. What's the better way? Well, the better way is a separation of powers. It means no one can make bad decisions. No one person is the fond of all wisdom. And so, therefore, separation of powers recognises that structurally. Uh, but then there's many others, you know, bills of rights and stuff. Um, so. Well, I don't know if the, what you just said about these arrests are true. I haven't heard them myself, uh, but uh, I haven't read about them myself. But this uh, this this idea of separation of powers, uh, you know, coming from France, that's really great. Because uh, did you know that what else came from France? The idea of workers' socialism came from yeah. Soissons, right, in France. So, uh, or so, so on, or stuff like that. So, so he, this, so this, uh, so, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think, uh, any, uh, yeah, once again, uh, that that's right wing always talks about things that nobody here reads in the paper. It's weird. And we, then, uh, uh, James, just to let you know, we've got a number of Australian journalists currently detained in China and we can't get access to them. And there's also half a dozen uh, business leaders in, in Australia, Australia. A number of these people have Chinese national, you know, they, they're from Chinese, uh, either they were, they were born in China, came to Australia and became citizens or they're um, uh, uh, Chinese, you know, uh, children of Chinese parents, Australian Chinese parents. So we there's probably about a dozen examples right now of people that are in our press being followed and our government's lobbying to try to get uh, release and other things going. And you don't tend to hear about it because unless it's Americans, you guys won't hear about that. Uh, but that's definitely a thing happening over oh, definitely. here. Definitely, yeah, I'll definitely Google that. I'll find out. Uh, um, and that's that's a direct result uh, of our belligerent, stupid right wing idiots uh, being warmongers. But I also, China, I also I heard you say that. they're being followed. You know, I mean, if they're if they're just being followed, that's not being incarcerated. So I have to, I have to, I would distinguish, uh, I would distinguish that. Also, that could being followed could be. Uh, well, I, we have an FBI it does the same kind of thing. It's their job. So, uh, but uh, the uh, 
this, uh, uh, that, I mean, that's really, you made some really good points. So I, I, I just, I'll just leave the conversation there. Uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, I understand that there's a grudge, there is some grudge match between us, some Australians and China. I know that there's liberals that completely disagree with that. Uh, so it's, you know, I have to, uh, I have to I have to do uh, some of my research on detained journalists in China uh, because uh, uh, that's uh, that's that's kind of uh, Australian journalists. Uh, it's a because it's a different story, you know, than than we have. We don't have a big problem with detentions in China and the United States. No, that, the, I don't think the okay. I don't think the Chinese would be as bold as to do that to Americans as it currently stands. Uh, Australians tend to be in that middle category. Again, we we don't have that influence. But but look again, I I, I was critical of our stupid right wing government being warmongers with China. It was a stupid thing to do. Yeah, we're cutting off our own nose to spite our face. The new government that's just been elected, uh, worker socialists. You know the labor we call the Labor Party. Uh, they're quite right. They've restored relations. They've stopped you know being uh, outrageous. You know the reason those right wing nut jobs did it here in Australia was for the domestic purposes. They were warmongering to try to get votes, and uh, and just on that point of uh, socialist worker um, participation, I'm I'm not in any way suggesting that we're at the pinnacle of uh, of where we should be in terms of you know political leadership. But it's a constant evolution of a better way. I'm just saying the Americans got to a benchmark where it wasn't based on tribalism, rather ideals. But beyond that, we're participatory democracy, you know, uh, corporate democracy, you know, having much more. Uh, say in uh, people having much more say is obviously a uh, continuation of that separation of powers to another level. And uh, and I would suggest that um, we have one thing in Australia you don't have in America, which is compulsory voting. All right. Everyone here has to vote or you get fined. OK, I don't know if you know that. Um, but uh, uh, what that leads to is it leads to uh, a lot less extremism. Um, we don't have the right wing, left wing. And that's one of the reasons the right wing government who was warmongering with China just got booted out. It's one of the reasons they no longer hold a state. They're not, not empowering any state. Uh, the one state they, uh, uh, there's one state they're in power, which is Tasmania, the island off the bottom of Australia. And they're in minority government in, in partnership with some independents. They don't hold the majority. Every other state and the federal government is all a Labor Party uh, government at the moment because people are so annoyed at this whole right wing culture war. You know, they, the, the, the conservatives here tried to import the American culture war issues. But because we have compulsory voting, um, where the cultural war issues work in the United States on the basis of turnout, because they motivate turnout of extremists, and then they also stop people turning out to vote normally because they're just sick of the culture wars. In Australia, we all have to vote anyway. So everyone gets annoyed at the culture wars because they're like, why are you carrying on with this BS when we've got real problems to solve? We've got housing issues and there's economic. So in some ways, um, that, that interconnected system I talked about being um, a limitation to innovation has, like all systems, has some virtues. And the virtue here is the fact that we tend not to have the extremism um, that comes with American politics because everyone votes. And at the end of the day, you can't just appeal to people on the basis of turnout. You've actually got to deal with some of their serious concerns. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that um, uh, we also uh, don't have a change mechanism at the top of our system because we don't have a president. Uh, we've got a governor general, which is essentially the Queen's representative. So our our leader in terms of the prime, our prime minister, which is sort of equivalent to the president, sits in the Congress, right, in, in the lower house of parliament. And what that means is we don't have a CEO running our country. We have a politician literally who's in the parliament space. And that the problem with that is we don't get executive expertise. At least in the American system, you have someone who can hire the best people for the job to be the secretaries of departments, right? So they can actually go to the private sector, get now. Of course, all those appointees are political. You know, it's not like they're apolitical, but they also tend to have expertise separate from the body politic that they bring to the jobs. Everyone here who runs a ministry or a department is a, is a, a lifelong politician, been in power for 20 years, who don't have any new ideas. There's no possibility of in Australia, of a Ronald Reagan coming along and saying, we're the good guys, we can win the Cold War. I'm going to create a poker bluff with Star Wars. <laughs> and, right. and actually, right, like, and that, and that, I don't know if you, I won't go into too much depth there, 
Uh, but the Star you Wars. Know, you don't know that I have aces here, do you? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, right. you know, basically that Star Wars thing. I, I saw a three-part doco on it where they had the Russians and the and the, and the admin, uh, people in the Reagan administration all talking on this documentary over over uh, you know like a three-hour period, and it was all talking about that that um, uh, end game of the Cold War. And it turns out I never knew this. But it turned out that Reagan, when he got in, simple premise, you know, coming out of Hollywood, hey, why can't we win the Cold War? Everyone says, you know, mutually assured destruction, we can't do it. It's just a standoff. But hang on, we're the good guys. We should be able to win. I saw this film called Star Wars. Why can't we just knock their missiles out of the sky? Now, now, literally, in this doco, you've got members of the administration saying, sorry, Mr. President, the component technology is not going to be available for 30 years. What does he do next? He employs an advertising agency because he's from Hollywood. He puts together the graphics. He doesn't address to the nation, tells them it's going to be launched in 18 months and that that's going to be a shield for America against the Russian nuclear threat. And, of course, all this, all of his own secretaries and, and people in his administration said the first they heard about it was when it was put on television to a national address. They didn't even know what to tell journalists the next day because they knew it was all bullshit, right? It was a complete poker bluff. And yet there's that deception thing, Joe, you know, the president deceiving his own administration to create this leadership movement of a better way. Right. The flip, the flip side of the Russians, they are all like this guy with the evil empire. He was the worst president we ever saw. He's a warmonger. And Star Wars, we can't compete. We're spending 50% of our economy on warfare. We can't afford to do Star Wars. It got them to the table. It wasn't the only thing, right? There was other problems they had. But it was such a it was such a poker bluff, the world's biggest poker bluff. That's brought about by that that independence of having a president a president on top of your system, and that's come from the very fact that there was a self determination in in America that allowed for the hey we've got gridlock in these two houses of parliament. We need someone to break the gridlock. We need like a, a CEO. Let's get Washington back and work out what that is. We'll make it as we go. In Australia, we can't even agree to be independent let alone say, hey, we need someone at the top, you know, and uh, we, we had a referendum going back 20 years to get a, our own head of state, which was going to be a, just someone do, who, who performs ceremonial duties. Don't change the government at all. Just put this person to cut ribbons and fly flags and go to, go to parades at the top, going around like some sort of pretend queen and no power at all, no, no CEO function, no ability to hire and fire administration, no autonomy of action. And of course, it was voted down because the majority of people who wanted a republic looked to the Americans and said, we want to elect our own president. But the problem was all the people in parliament who had to agree to pass that law for a referendum to take place knew that the president would have a mandate as a single individual that no one of them has when they only represent a, an electoral area. So the president, your, your president in the United States has a mandate, even though it's an electoral college mandate, it's the entire country that votes for the president. But over here, our leader is selected from just the local area and his party chooses who he is. And that's, you know, in the last, in the last 16 years, each party has, like, they both were in power for roughly seven or eight years. In that time, they had three different prime ministers. Like, it's like in eight years, you had three different presidents, right? Because the party just puts another president in because they want to, not elected you know, all, all political games, no one's really doing any, you know, so trade-offs, all these different levels. But <laughs> I guess as an Australian suffering through this, I looked at you guys and go, you don't know what you've got in a lot of ways. And yet at the same time, when I was in San Francisco 20 years ago, even 20 years ago, I know it's a lot worse now, I just couldn't believe the amount of poverty that I saw in the financial district of San Francisco, door to door, every door, every night, filled with people. It was horrific. In Australia, it's just not like that. We have a much better social right. safety net. And, and I couldn't understand. You know, we have Medicare over here. I can go to a doctor for free. Um, and, I, you know, we, we all pay 1% uh, extra tax, which is barely noticeable. Um, we don't pay, you know, a few people have private health insurance. That's a choice for sort of an extra bonus. I don't get it why America doesn't do that. And I think it'll be, that's, that's the area of weakness that America could fail from. I mean, that's what's leading, leading to political instability right now, is that poverty in your society, not caring for the people who need it, which is essentially all the working class. Most of the, the majority of the population not getting cared for by their government is leading to this political instability. 
I mean, my mind. Um, uh, you know. no, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I think there are two things that have to be addressed, that can be addressed. I mean, it's, you know, um, it's just talking to somebody, but even how we handle our retirement system, how we handle our medical, and then also how we handle defense. I mean, it, it, we just, um, it's, you don't throw money at a problem and get any more out of it, get anything more out of it. And that's what we, we've been doing for 50 years. And I yeah. work in the defense department. So, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a real issue. I think um, you've definitely reached the limits of what uh, military power can uh, provide for you. You know, it, it's it passed diminishing returns a long time ago agree. and i, I think and so i think that that's um something to you know that that needs to at least be reevaluated. uh but there really does seem I, look there's something that there's been an inability by anyone to, to make those cuts um a, a lot of that is uh well i mean that's political and they actually have an anti-China committee, right, in Congress now. So or a China committee, right? And But what they do is they say, well, we're going to spend this much on the military. We're going to make sure we appropriate this much for China in the military budget. So that's really what it's for. And uh, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like these people, right? I don't want to say, I don't want to classify them as special. I just want to, they, they seem to, uh, want to use the military as a kind of like a political wedge. In other words, if people actually are voting because they're anti-China, then they would tend to vote for me uh, kind of thing. Um, and it's kind of like a strange bet because I don't think people are generally that anti-China. There was like a little wave, I think, of people kind of going crazy about anti chatty video videos in the United States, uh, probably in Canada, maybe all over the world, but but that kind of like has subsided. So I think uh, I, I think it's kind of a strange bet that they're making. And uh, the idea that all, the, all, all the, the more money you throw into the military is the solution to the world's problems, I think is kind of like a little outmoded. Uh, there, there's, there's a report that's been uh, that's I, I I don't think I've read it. I might have read it in a paper, but it was uh, it's about the war game. They did a war games of the United States versus China over an attack mm -hmm. on Taiwan, and uh, the United States lost two aircraft carriers and half of the navy. So and I forget how many planes. So it was like in other words, it's unacceptable losses. So it was kind of. Uh, they do that, you know, as far as the actuality of the situation with China versus the United States, nobody wants to do that. Like in the 19th century, they could invade China. That was really easy to do. Uh, maybe the beginning of the 20th century too, and Japan was able to invade China. So uh, at least some of the cities, some of the regions. So the, the idea that uh, you could do that uh, in the 21st century is a little bit far-fetched, right? But I think people might still have that kind of illusion that you could have a war and it would be profitable. And that's not, of course, that's not, as, as, as in the case of Sun Tzu, I think that is relevant because he says, right. don't do the war if it's not profitable or you're not going to be sure to win. And they actually, the facts are, is they, they, ran the, they, ran the, they ran the model and it turned out two aircraft carriers and half of the ships. So overall, so it's so like an acceptable losses. So uh, that maybe it's back to the drawing board for this anti-China committee, I don't know, but it's kind of like they're just throwing money away, like you say, Joseph. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I but I, I do think this, unfortunately, this anti-China uh, rhetoric gains traction in a couple different ways, gains traction with, people that have lost their jobs and really don't understand why, right? So that they're mm -hmm. kind of desperate and they look for somebody to scapegoat. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's a, uh, just a small anti-China contingent that, that actually has a loud voice. Uh, so that combined, you know, that this, you know, that that's what politicians capitalize on. 
um, and that's tragic uh, and ought to be, you know, scrutinized. Um, and so uh, that that you know that's what. And it, but it, at the same time, I think also these defense companies have an incredible amount of influence uh, over what we do. I think they decide what we do. Being quite honest, I mean, I. I yeah. the, I think the politicians want the politicians, you know, are supposed to be legislating and, uh, you know, they want the country. I think a lot of, you know, they want the country to be better. They're doing this job of passing laws and things, but they also seem to want work. In other words, there's this, uh, there is a kind of like, if you elect someone, they're going to vote for a war. So you, I mean, you can't, and you can't trust any of them if it's the Democrats or the Republicans. It's now it's the Democratic Party is the war, war party. So, well, yeah. The, the the problem seems from an outsider's point of view is that because you, because you don't have compulsory voting, then uh, the, the whole issue of who wins your elections is based on turnout, and so then it's proven that anything that motivates people's extreme emotions makes them more motivated. So, you know, anger is one of those things. So then it, the culture war approach, targeting the other, the war on drugs, the war on China, the, the war on anyone else, but the real problems, right, is really going to be the thing that gets the majority, you know, enough just to scrape through on those swing states that make the difference. Because we know most of the rest of the electorate's neutralised uh, in incumbency. It's not, it doesn't decide the elections. There's only a handful of places that do. So they're very, it's very targeted. And, and I think that the, other issue is, of course, the uh, earmarks. Um, because of American politics, and this is one of the trade-offs of freedom, because, of course, that reason you don't have compulsory voting is to force people to vote. Is not free. You're not free if you have to vote. Sure. <laughs> this right. is that makes sense. This is the contradiction in the American, in the ideals of freedom. You know, what's a positive freedom versus a, a negative freedom? You know, the, the, the measurement of freedoms. Well, you're not uh, going to pass a, you're not going to pass a law here that calls for restrictions. In other words, the freedom is real. People will vote against, if they have a chance, they'll vote against loss of freedom, personal freedom. As a matter right. of fact, we're, we're going to have almost, probably going to have universal marijuana very soon. It's almost universal now. Well, and, that, yeah. and that's the problem. And then what happens is because you've got that 50 state thing, which as I said, is a virtue for, for innovation. It's also uh, the divide and conquer for earmarks. So then what happens is every piece of legislation that goes through your parliamentary oh, process your then gets deals done on the side to get votes, which gets a job, you know, a factory here, uh, and that's almost sure. never, uh, military based because that's what the government spends the most money on. So that where do the military factories go? And it's the difference between jobs in someone's local electorate. And so the, all the earmarks that makes your politics the most transactional in the world by far. Yeah, right. I it's, think that leads to the jingoism partly. Yeah, that's true. We don't that have like, to, the, to it. Yeah, you guys literally have side deals written on your actual documents. Right, right? I know. Over yeah. here, that would be seen yeah. as corruption. Right, exactly. It's a form of corruption. Yeah. Right, because you're 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 selling out some prince the principle of the legislation for some side deal, whereas over there, that's considered freedom because you've got the freedom to do deals in, in the interests of your constituents, in addition to passing the legislation. So there's, it's like an accumulate, a concept of aggregate freedom. These things go together over here. It's seen as those things pull apart. Those side deals undermine the, free, the, the, the various rights or laws that are trying to be processed in some legislation. So it's- It's, it's, inter it's interesting you're saying this because I had friends on the Hill that actually know that they're, they would even use lingo. Uh, that would, their own almost language when they were stuffing a bill, uh, like they call it like filling the tree or something like that, or you know things like that. They it was it was it was really obnoxious actually. Stuff, stuffing uh, the stocking. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, it's 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 like I, I heard that and it and it was just uh, I, I, and if you get close enough to DC, you, you really do see the revolving door um, between all the government agencies and uh, and the staffers. I mean that that's where um, and but that, and that opens it up for a demagogue to come in um, because then people get sick of like they're they're getting screwed um, and they don't know why then all of a sudden you know somebody can uh, even scapegoat the politicians themselves uh, as well as well as China 
Um, so, uh, no, I mean, it, the, one of the things actually that was very interesting that you brought up, James, is that, you know, this, the, it's kind of this, we have this gridlock, this freedom, but once it becomes dysfunctional, um, it swings to more of a even rigid, like kind of totalitarian kind of approach because the gridlock exists. You look to somebody who can get something done. And as so, I think it's like it's interesting that, that when we were talking about it earlier, um, how this good luck actually, you know, is healthy in certain cases, but it also can lead to your own demise. Well, I think actually, I, I personally, I I think I'm very optimistic nationally. I think I think the freedom is working. I mean, the worst thing going on is probably the the homeless population is addicted to fentanyl, right. but but. On the other hand, this the people do feel the freedom here. Uh, I'm not saying that everywhere is going to be just like say I happen to live in Las Vegas, which is a little bit like San Francisco. It's always right. as much fun as you want it to be, as mm -hmm. long as you're willing to spend a little money. And it is just a little money. It's very cheap to live here, even especially compared to San Francisco. So so that the the there 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 are places in the United States where you can you can have a lot of fun and and experience just a small very small amount of crime and so forth. Uh, it's kind of like ideal existences. And uh, I, I'm from San Diego, which is one of the best cities in California. It doesn't have as many uh, problems as San Francisco does, for example, uh, and and certainly not as difficult to manage. Um, as as Los Angeles, where I was I was from before that, so that's you know so we moved to San Diego to be in a kind of like a better place, a more picturesque city, and so forth, and uh, and it it's true it was like that it was like being in a picture and, and I'm sure there's a lot of places like that in Australia just you know that you could go there just to be in a picturesque spot and enjoy nature uh, while you're living in the city, so so to speak. So so this is. Uh, the, but the so that the 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 idea of freedom of movement and uh, freedom to do have your own lifestyle be be you know uh, be choose choose aspects of your lifestyle yourself and so forth. This is so important to Americans, and I don't think we're going to go through a regression there. We're going to stay on that track. It's just that the people who believe that they don't have enough freedom yet. In other words, uh, that their gun gun ownership might be threatened and things like that. Those people are a little bit on edge. They think they think that uh, the current political situation is going to hurt their status as freedom lovers. Uh, you know, but, but but of course they're wrong. You know, they'll still be right. able to fly their flag and have their gun on the wall and all that crap. Because I grew up like that. My my I had four guns. I had a gun rack with four guns on the wall in my bedroom. All the time I was growing up, practically that's where they that's where they put it. So it's like it's like uh, it's it's like a crazy kind of like American value is that somebody can say let's go hunting and you can go hunting because you got a gun. Yeah, I mean, it, is, you right. a gun. it is yeah. it is weird actually. It, yeah. it is and it and it's it is actually part of our DNA at this point. Like the way people treat the. It's like a religion. Almost. And if you're young, it makes complete sense. You know, like, in other words, there's animals out there and those animals are, are doing anything except running through the woods. So let's go hunting. Yeah. Have you guys, uh, just as a quick aside on that whole commentary on the Second Amendment, the guns, yeah. have you ever seen uh, the Australian comedian Jim Jeffries uh, do his uh, bit on gun control? Uh, who's that? Jim Jeffries. He's an Jim Australian Jeffries. comedian. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm gonna, Have you ever seen him do the gun, gun control bit? No, no, no. I'll, I'll share I'll share a link. It's Excellent. Two parts. I'll share a link on the chat, um, only because I think you'll appreciate it. It's hilarious. And he does it in front of an American audience. He's actually in America when he does this thing. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, oops, oops, one second, everyone. It's such a funny take on it. That's the first one. And I'll give you the second one just to follow. And uh, um, after, after this one, I think if you both will, when you get a chance, have a watch of this, because uh, I, I haven't seen anyone better deconstruct the Second Amendment arguments the way that Jim Jeffries does in a quintessentially sort of Australian way, which is always a very sort of down-to-earth, honest, 
and sort of essentially pretty casual, pretty casual way. Like, what are you all getting worked up about? You know, like, and uh, it's it's uh, it's it's bloody hilarious. But I just thought uh, it's so topical in America, and it's such a hot button for Americans to have someone just humorously deconstruct it the way they do uh, is brilliant. And there was also one on gun control. I don't know if you ever saw John Oliver, the Daily Show when John Stewart was doing the Daily Show. John Oliver did a three-part series on Australian gun control and the comparison between, between the American political system and how because we had a massacre over here in Port Arthur where 30 people were killed in a, a, gun, con, in a, gun, a gun massacre, a mass shooting, uh, and our prime minister at the time basically banned all the guns and did it in three months. And everyone agreed, right? And so John Oliver compared what happens in America to what happened in Australia, interviewing the politicians over here and politicians over in America and putting the two ways they look at the world in contrast. And it's so funny. I'll, I'll share that with you as well, because I just think Thank you. These two, this is this is what Australia can offer the world, is this sort of uh, reductionist approach to, to just getting things solved. But the thing is, we're not very imaginative. We can sort of, we're, we're quite practical. So when problems present, we can solve them. But to imagine new things and to try to create, that's we don't do that very well. If something, if the car breaks down, we can fix it, you know, in the scrub with, you know, a, bit, a piece of wire, you know. But we, we're not very good at building new cars. We can't imagine new cars and things like that. So it's a strange uh, culture we've got here. But um, um, I'll just share this one too with you as well because uh, we always need more levity in our life. Well, thanks, <laughs> so, John. It's been fascinating talking to you tonight. No, you, you, you too, mate. I, I, um, I, I think that, and, and you know, when you talked about the different levels of leadership, I think that was the thing that I was also going to say. And, and the way I do it is, I go, what are all these principles? Because Joe, Joe, you were talking about that too when you talked about corporations, and also look weighing up how far is the military going, what's effective, and all the rest of it. And separation of powers is one of them. I'll tell you what another one is that I look at is term limits. One of the biggest gifts George Washington gave the world was the idea that you stay for two terms. You know, if if China had term limits on their leadership, which he just got rid of, right, uh, which Xi just got rid of, then I wouldn't have nearly the concerns I have about China. And when I have concerns, it's not the right-wing nutjob warmongering concerns. It's the concerns for democracy. It's the things we see uh, in Hong Kong, right? That's my concern. Uh, it's my concern that the Chinese problem is situated in the in the fact that they are a democracy. <laughs> and so because Taiwan is so close to them, it's an existential threat uh, to the regime in China in the same way Tiananmen Square was. Um, our prime minister went to China and broke down in tears, crying uh, months after the Tiananmen Square massacre. I don't know if you know that. Uh, he literally yeah. broke down in tears in front of the Chinese administration to express how sad he was that this chance of freedom was just militarily squashed. Um, it was it was quite a famous quite a famous uh, thing. Every, all Australians are very surprised, you know, your leader breaking down in tears on a podium in a foreign country because of their own massacre. But it was also, it became something that was very iconic because Australians have this sort of, we, we are general, we are, we are, we're friendly people. We're not we're not particularly bright, but we're quite friendly. <laughs> and so we're probably, we're not as aggressive as Americans or as uh, as uh, gung-ho, as action-orientated as Americans. And Americans are action-orientated. We're, like, we're laid back. We're like, hey, this, it's it's hot over here all the time. You know, we like to relax. <laughs> it's part of the reason yeah. we're not really here. But um, um, I was going to, I was going to mention that China has, does have a multi-level leadership. They have a uh, premier which uh, mm -hmm. who, who manages their uh, their ministries and so forth. So they do have like uh, uh, they have, they have, there's, there's things that Xi, Xi Jinping, for example, doesn't do. He's he's uh, he's only in charge of the army and uh, I guess a uh, few other things, but not not the not the day to day management of the the the, uh, the, the regions and the cities. Look, I know that's true, and I'm not suggesting for a moment he's got this absolute control, but neither neither did Hitler. I mean, um, one of the things, I've actually got a book, um, the CIA, the State Department um, book, uh, the US State Department, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big compendium of the entire Nazi regime, starting with all the principles, all the uniforms, all the weapons, 
all the formations, like absolutely everything that the Americans, the American government knew about the Nazi regime in one big compendium. Um, I'll see if I can find a link for that book and put yeah. it on the. Right. Yeah, we, we know we we know now that you're a bit of a nut, John. <laughs> no, I'm a bit of a nut. Um, <laughs> what 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 the what the Americans what the Americans documented in this uh, State Department book about the Nazi regime was what they called um, uh, Führer Prinzip or the leadership principle, and that was directly modelled off of the presidential principle that the Americans have, the idea that you would have someone at the top of the system which has the autonomy uh, to, to make things happen uh, in much the same way as American companies have presidents and your government system does too. The only difference between the uh, presidential principle in America and the Fuhrer, the leadership principle in the Nazi regime was the use of force. H Hitler extended to those leaders, uh, to the, to the under Fuhrers, right, um, the, the, the the use of force they could be shot if they didn't do it they that's what they have so that was one of the reasons they were able to transform so quickly because the absolute momentum that came with that sort of localized totalitarian control was real and hitler talked about it in a speech which was in this book where he said our opponents don't understand us we have not one fuhrer we have ten thousand. okay so mm. the, the 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 point is that it's not so much that g makes all the decisions that there isn't others it's more the culture of how decisions are made and i think I think the thing, the, the problem I simply has have is Tiananmen Square, lack of democracy. And it, look, if they had a separation of powers, which means they had independent um, uh, uh, parts of government, so the rule of law is really confused when you get over there. It's very obtuse, almost always a conviction. There's very, very rarely acquittals in terms of percentages. Now, having said that, the Americans aren't far away from that. The amount of people that roll over and, and never get to trial because they strike a plea deal almost puts them in the same category as, as China, quite honestly. So if I have to make that, I'll just say that quickly, just so you don't think I'm barking up the tree with China alone. It's not a, it's not an ideological issue. It's for me, it's a systematic issue. I'm like, and Americans have that same problem with their judiciary at the moment. The, the too many plea deals, not enough justice. So I think that the, the lack of a separation of powers, the lack of a, of independent elections, um, and uh, the lack of term limits on on the on the um, on the top leader, you know, on the president. Uh, they're the three things that if China had those if they had those things fixed i wouldn't have any concerns at all about china they're the only three things that really drive all my concerns about china not the concerns that they're going to be a warmongering power um because clearly they're, they're yeah, the americans have got them surrounded and that's the strategy but rather that they they're doing in hong kong what they agreed not to two systems like you know and you know of course powers go back on their word you know it's not no one you know the amount of times the americans did that with uh, um you know um with uh, um, Native Native Americans, you know, and all the rest of it, the amount of times you wrote treaties and broke them, uh, did it in, with NATO and Russia, and you know, so I mean, it's it's just the, the path of the course. But but I guess um, those those few principles are principles that are important. And I perhaps would finish by saying America's got a real problem right now with the lack of representation that goes to the Supreme Court. They've got a problem in the, in the judiciary and and all these rigged political appointments you know it's way too uh, well, that's my that's that's a much, much we don't have that in australia we don't have political appointments you don't vote for any attorney generals here there's no uh, you, uh, that's a serious uh, problem you guys actually vote for your first law officers in all your uh, uh, states and counties and things like i mean we don't vote for people like that they just get given the job when they're in government like it's a bureaucratic decision it's not a decision for the people so at least the judiciary actually really independent um of political influence because it's because no one gets to decide politically who sits on those in those places so definitely problems in but america you, but your but your but your but your legislature at some time must have agreed with that principle in other words did it come just from england did it come from uh the monarchical system <clears throat> that principle of uh appointments or did we, it we, uh did it or 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 was it uh chosen by the by your own legislature we we have what's what's colloquially known here as the washminster system so it's a combination of washington and westminster so we, we because our federation was in 1900 we drew quite a lot on the american model without any of the real powers that came from the american model and but also obviously our history came from from uh, the british and so the way it works here is you're right the legislature the constitution gives powers to the judiciary 
the legislation uh, enacts the processes for that, the judiciary themselves choose who gets elected through their ranks. So they're almost like an independent, you know, uh, legislature of judges that decide in their own ranks. Almost, yeah. almost like France and Russia, for example. Right. Interesting. Uh, yeah. the, the, odd, the odd times we have had, that happened in my state here in Queensland, we had a premier had decided to put one of his cronies, who was at that point only a magistrate, the lowest, not even a judge, a magistrate, uh, basically in a, sort of a small claims court, um, uh, pseudo judge, you know, they're administrative in their, in their level. And they put him on the Supreme Court. Right, of Queensland, which is um, not the, it's not the national Supreme Court, but it's the highest court in Queensland. And there was an out, outcry, like all the, 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 the law officers, all the judges, there was like it, and he laughed, it, it, he, he stayed in the job for about six weeks, then went on sick leave and 12 months later resigned and then got given a crony job on some board somewhere because it, the outrage was so palpable and just constant that this crony was put into a judicial position and I just laugh because your entire judiciary is cronies. <laughs> we had one bloke and he just got blow, blowing open, you know, in, in the space of two months. It was we were unacceptable, completely unacceptable here. Just no, go away, you know. How dare you? You know, over there, that's stock and trade for you guys. It's all transactional, which is your strength. You know, it's the American strength of commerce. We, we do deals. You do deals, you know, like kills me. But I don't know if uh, I, 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 I appreciate the, the, the idea that uh, surrounding China as a defensive strategy. Uh, so, it, you know, that's kind of like an uh, interesting concept. Uh, but if it's not, I don't know if it's, um, I don't know if it's articulated. Now, it seems to be like they're, they're, they're refining the American, uh, what do you call it? The Supreme, the, uh, the State Department is actually refining its uh, rhetoric. So, uh, so I think, uh, and, and of course the action is the same, is that the idea is that uh, your idea about surrounding China, that is a kind of um, interesting, it's interesting to see it as a principle, interesting to see it as uh, like the way you said, it's a defensive strategy, um, that it uh, almost sounds hmm. fairly reasonable, you know, because of course you do have the ring of fire in the, in the South Pacific, which represents kind of a barrier against China, so to speak. So if it's, uh, and and I think uh, Taiwan is actually part of that ring of fire, which is interesting uh, since it's so close to China and uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, of course, China wouldn't let it go, uh, you know, by their proclamations and- uh, the, the, the nuclear power subs- The nuclear, huh? power, the nuclear power subs that Australia just bought from the United States, which, Everyone wonders here whether we'll get them or not because it's just the difficulty of actually creating those boats in the first place. And, and the fact, the Americans always put their own stockpile first and doesn't seem to be any gaps in the production line. But that aside, the strategic yeah. decision for us to spend a, a quarter of a trillion dollars on doing that, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, $265 billion, yep. Um, How much was the final? That's sorry, but yeah. 265 billion. Um, so we um, those boats um, can only be strategically effective off the coast of China. They don't. I mean, Australia's huge. There's no possibility that eight boats provides us any sort of security <laughs> in terms of defending our own border. I mean, they, there's just too many holes. And um, those boats can only be effective um, at the point of origin for the Chinese vessels off the coast of mainland China, uh, the Straits of um, um, uh, the Chinese sea, uh, South China Sea. Um, so it's, um, so that's, so it's definitely, um, it's definitely a, um, a concept of surrounding China uh, as a, as a strategy, you know, to basically stop them, them uh, making movement. But, but, you know, look, I, in terms of the, the one thing I'd just say on all this is that um, at the moment, I think all the great powers are particularly compromised. I think America's the least compromised, but not by, but not by much. <laughs> I don't think that America's miles ahead. I think they used to be. I think go, going back to the end no, of no, the- They're definitely not miles ahead. I mean, but I, you know, I, I, the one thing I've realized is that um, there does seem to be just, this does come back to the art of war, uh, <laughs> um, the information. Uh, that is actually that 
we have access to is just not, it's not clear, um, what, you know, where the United States is uh, and what they're, what they're actually doing, um, you know, as far as um, how aggressive that they're going to be, but it does seem to, does seem to be a failure in negotiations. Uh, that's the one thing that seems kind of obvious to me uh, in order to to both with China and both to broker something in the Ukraine, uh, whether that's using China or not. Uh, so I, I think that there's, I don't know. I mean, but again, I don't have perfect information. That just is an appearance to me. And I, I think those things and but, you know, that that's. I just don't have perfect information. I don't have the the details. That's America, why it's so hard. It's so hard to make those. Yeah. America's power, for my mind, is uh, predominantly cultural, which has stemmed from the political. So, I mean, a really right. great, a really great example is rap music. I mean, you go back thirty years; it wasn't even well. It was an emerging art form that only you know fringe amounts of people in Australia have heard of. Now, it's one of our predominant art forms that, uh, you know, a third of the musicians here are rap musicians with Australian accents, you know, doing our version of it. And where did it come from? The United States, like jazz and, you know, all the rest of it. So I, I think that the cultural, the, the freedom that I talk about politically is extended into this culture. And where America really leads is this idea that whenever anything new comes along, they tend to embrace it and find some way to commercialise it, even if it's not their idea. Um, you know, I mean, uh, arguably, the film industry was created in Australia. If you go back to the history of, of film, you'll find that some of the first feature films were, in fact, Australian. The technology uh, first or, uh, you know, originated uh, uh, in a commercial sense here. It was first used commercially here, but you know, quickly grabbed by the Americans and, and turned into an industry. Like, so I just, um, um, you know, I think that's the strength of what America brings to the table. The military stuff for me is almost like the full stop. It's the it's the bottom line. That's the bit that says, hey, let our other stuff run, you know, and if you get in the way of us too much, we've, we've, got, the, we've got the hard edge to, to back it up. And, but, I, but I think it's becoming somewhat redundant because, um, you know, and I think uh, Amon pointed it out in the talk when he was talking about the fact we've almost had 100 years of peace between major powers, 25 years off that. So at that point, it all becomes more of a defensive posture and any time we've seen uh, offensive engagements, they've almost invariably been um, a negative outcome for the for the Americans. It's not every time America's gone into a war since World War II, it hasn't generally been a positive outcome for them. It's been a loss of treasure and and you know a loss of uh, lives and and you know and and a political misstep almost invariably. I mean you know and. Uh, and so I just think that it, the military has been neutralized, but the real power of the military in, in the United States is the, is the technology that then flows into the economy as a result of unlimited, almost unlimited spending. I mean, I know someone who was, uh, who used to be in the American intelligence, in an American intelligence agency, now retired, he lives here. And though he's obviously discreet about what he talks about, one thing he says was, there was no limit to any of the money he needed to access to achieve any of his operational objectives. He could simply ask for the money. He would get what he needed, right? He talked of a situation where he was doing, there was a coordination of some joint exercises here in Australia. And uh, or it might've been a story he was speaking to one of his colleagues about, or anyway, I'm relaying it secondhand, but but the story goes, you know, that uh, um, uh, there was going to be a joint operation. And, and, and so, um, uh, when the Americans heard about it and said, well, how, you know, how many do we need? He, he was like, oh, we've got, we need 40. And they thought, they, the Americans thought 40 helicopters. So they organized that when in fact there was only 40 men and we needed four helicopters for the, to mm. run the route. So th this whole scale of, of resource was just chalk and cheese. Australians have handfuls of people. Americans have got like squadrons and, you know, just battalions and, you know, there's no limit to the resources in the military industrial complex to spend money and then you end up with things like the internet and lasers and you know every like so much technology just comes out of that falls out sideways into the economy for then yeah for, for private exploitation it's is it is it a um you know is it desirable to do it that way i don't know um you know it might be better well, to spend money up front and research it is a way 
it is one way to get but it doesn't have to be through defense and that's where we've become addicted to it uh in some ways is we see we seem to look at defense for a lot of our innovation um and the spillovers that come from those innovations uh, whether it be the internet darpa and all those things mm. um you know so um now how much that gets to the market now these days i don't know but uh there are other initiatives that you could spend the money on uh, that would probably yield similar types of results with spillover effects that are probably a little bit more productive i think uh, it's, it's in my very, opinion it's a very can, difficult... I, can i can i jump in oh, I, yeah i just 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 uh on, on your on your subject uh joseph i just wanted to this the the, the uh the problem with the most american negotiators is probably the the state department you know, the State Department is kind of like the CIA and the FBI yeah. are kind of like very close together. And uh, so the State Department is kind of like considered uh, uh, they're, they're in the, the in the embassies and everything and they run the embassy, but they're basically just the front end, like the front end for the for the intelligence uh, effort. And they sure. they they're the, the, the fact that they negotiate American negotiators negotiate so badly is probably because of this uh, kind of like coupling of uh, uh, intelligence with trade. They can't they can't do straight ahead trade negotiation. They have to couple it with their training as uh, intelligence negotiators in the State Department with the State Department. Uh, and they're used to the domination of the United States. And when China starts to enter the world as an equal of the United States, now they, they, they really have a serious problem because they've got to do the documents for China in Chinese. They have to verify them back that they, 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 they translate okay into English and, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, difficulty for the Americans in negotiating with China that they didn't have before when they felt that they were dominating the other countries. Um, the, mm. in the case of, um, in the case of, uh, and, 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 you know, and this is the good bit about Xi Jinping, you know, Xi Jinping is a dominant ruler. He can create these kinds of, uh, uh, national institutions that correspond to the American institutions for the benefit of China. Uh, but the, but the other things, uh, the, what you mentioned, uh, John, about the, um, uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is so important to me. Um, and uh, the spillover, no, uh, uh, spillover, no, I don't think so. I think it had to do with uh, uh, it had I'm kind of at a loss. Uh, I should have written it down, but it was uh, the I'm getting tired, I'm gonna have to. I haven't. I don't hmm. think I've even. I did have dinner. Yeah, but anyway, uh, I'm. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm thinking it had to do with uh, the. Uh, oh yeah, but you're interested in the Nazi Party, because uh, the uh, right now I happen to be doing a study of um, ger of German authors on um, on uh, the the right of uh, violence. Uh, and that, that I'm reading right now, I'm reading Walter Benjamin uh, from, the, I guess, uh, from the 20s, uh, the 10s or 20, 20s, he was writing, uh, he was, he wrote a document called um, uh, Critique of Violence. And uh, so I'm reading that now in uh, an essay, and I'm reading, I'm going to read the one by Carl Schmidt after that, uh, who was the Nazi jurist who wrote uh, on uh, uh, the the right of the right to state violence. So, and of course, we confront that in a very special way in the United States. We have more violence in the United States than uh, in a lot of countries, a lot of democracies. We have a lot of, uh, like I said, high crime and uh, state violence, and uh, which we're which we're trying to resolve. You know, in other words, the situation. There's a trial that came up a, a year or two ago, uh, where uh, about a that had to do with a cruel execute, you know, street execution of a black man in um, in in uh, the Midwest, and um, it kind of like spelled out the whole problem with po uh, police and the law in the United States. 
so you know the fact that we don't we don't have a uh, a good resolution of uh, state violence we don't have a uh, correct we don't have a correct approach to state violence and that that the, 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 the were repairs that have been needed for a long time. I think the problem really started at the beginning of the 20th century with a wave of waves of immigration in, in the East. So, and then it extended beyond that. Uh, but it also might have something to do with slavery as well. So, so, so this, this problem is still in the process of being resolved here. And that's why I'm interested in this subject of state violence. And it was handled by some German authors very well. This guy, Carl Schmidt, he's being quoted by a lot of philosophers now, ethic, ethical philosophers and so forth. So I, I'm really looking forward to getting through with this project, to finishing this project on uh, law and uh, state violence. What's the uh, time frame for that? Well, I don't know the length of Carl Schmidt's book. I think it's about 200 pages. It might be around 200 pages. It might be smaller. So it depends on how long that book is and whether I read it in English or German. Uh, it'll be faster if I read it in English. But uh, the the uh, hmm. right now, just advancing in my German, you know, so I'm starting to read books in German. But wow. uh, but the but the uh, yeah, so so it, it could be that I'll be done in. Um, I, I would say could be done in six to eight months. Uh, I, I'm not going to be over optimistic about it. The, the 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 first thing is only an essay, but I think the thing by Carl Schmidt is more like a ninety page book, probably. That would be interesting, actually. To see hear what you have to say. Are you just taking German now? Like yeah, I'm just, just taking learning? German now. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, it's called Duolingo. You you get, yeah, you get yeah, to a yeah. first year level in about a year and a half. It took me quite a while to get where I'm at. Uh, but I'm I'm in this I'm in the B level now, so the second the second uh, level of four, and uh, the Duolingo only covers up to about where I'm at. I'm just about to graduate out of Duolingo. I'll have to contact a German school probably to continue academically. Huh. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to find that. Um, I'm getting the ISBN number for that uh, U.S. War Department book on Nazi Germany. Right. Uh, uh, that I can put up there. Oh, here it is. I found a, I found the book on Google. I can send wow. it to. You. Uh, this I'm is. I'm glad to uh, see that. That's uh, nice. Yeah. Hang on. So I'll just uh, um, bring it up. Yeah. There's a picture. There's an interesting picture on uh, on the internet on Wikipedia. There's a great picture of Carl Schmidt. He's a Nazi. He looks he looks American. He looks very much like an American guy, not like a German. Not as much. Not too German. It's an interesting picture. So if you Google Carl Schmidt right now, you have C A R L uh, with two T's, Schmidt, S C H M I T T. Uh, I'll put it in the map. I'm sorry, I'll put it here. Um, he came right up. I'll, I'll spell his name out first and uh, then I'll put the link in. Uh, this is the site, uh, Chicago citation. I'll use that one. Hang on. Uh, I'll ask one number maybe. Yeah. Hard to, uh, let me just go. Uh, got this book. There we go. Hang on. Hang but the nice thing about Google is Google makes the picture real big, right? So you could get get a picture. I, 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 uh, on Google, you get a really nice um, uh, personality photo. And uh, he looks American. He doesn't look German. It's interesting. Yeah. And the, the book really is does. called, right. And the book is called The Concept of the Political. Yeah. Oh, here we are. That's the, and here, here's the, here's the um, Amazon link for the book I was talking about. So, Hmm. Oh, it's cheap. All right. Well, it's, we're not fighting Germany, so I guess I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. There's about 600, 670 pages in that uh, US War Department handbook on German military forces. 
and absolutely everything in their tanks where well, you can see from the from just the cover and uh like all the uniforms all the insignias all the medals all the everything absolutely like just as a, a historical document it's absolutely fascinating to see the yeah, extent it's, it's, it's amazing i just it, it, there's part of me that's just angry and then part of me that's just terrified when i look at it oh the it's, cover. yeah yeah it's the whole thing i guess for me as a just as a publication um to have all this material in one book the the literal a to z of the entire regime and the entire political and military system in just right. a single i, I they, didn't even i didn't even think it existed they invented the, they invented so many things the rocket yeah. the the rocket the uh they, they, they were american rockets but the thing is, is they developed the rocket as a weapon they developed right. the jet they had jet planes they had all these things you know we had, you know a decade before we had them Yep, exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, we took we took Warner Warner von Braun. I mean, I, so we'll I mean, we're like, well, he's, uh, our, yeah, he's I, our team. It's yeah. just like we have baseball, right? We would you when you're a kid, you it's like you, you trade them. Yeah, you have to stand there and get chosen for the baseball for your baseball team. That's right. Every Who's day. coming over? Who gets to come over and who doesn't? Um, that was a that was a joke. I said a question, James. You you um, and again, I don't want to be. Uh, like a try, try to label or be descriptive, but you seem to be very um, perhaps in the same way you thought I was uh, taking that bully bully stance of the stupid Australian government against China. full spectrum full spectrum dominance stuff like that. Oh, that well, full spectrum dominance is a is an American doctrine um, that I can, I'll reference it for you. Yeah. Um, so that's that's not I didn't invent that. Um, uh, that's just what I read. Um, but the um, uh, you seem to be um, um, pro China is the wrong word, but maybe if you could read between the lines there. Yeah, you I'm looking forward to visiting China. You know, I, I, it's, 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 I've only heard good things about it, and it's, you know, fascinating country, great, you know, and, and a really different different language and culture. Something to 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 kind of be interested to study and That's what we're doing here. As a matter of fact, we're not just uh, in this group. Uh, all in this group because of our love of war books we're kind of interested in Chinese literature this is a recent term full spectrum dominance yeah we don't yeah. talk about it that much here uh I, I've heard it before probably uh it's it's uh it's not bandied about that much here in the United States yeah so that seemed a little strange to me but that's yeah. all that's all that that's all if I seem to be overreacting it's kind of like well the United States is so great uh they don't have any problems their constitution is the best well I understand from talking to you tonight John how much you know like where, where how substantial your respect for the United States is and and you know and 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 I've been oh, just talking oh, about that a lot of the limitations <laughs> that we feel here on the ground if you go to a lot of American cities you see you know, or states, you travel through a lot of American states, you see a lot of degeneration time, you see the effects of time uh, on on American life, they that, that people don't actually live that way. It's true, they have great cell phones, but you know, so do Japanese, Chinese, Laotians, uh, Vietnamese, and so forth, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't uh, have any, uh, we don't have any uh, exclusive hold on the good life here. No, and, uh, and, as I said, when I saw the poverty in San Francisco going back to 20 years ago when I was there, uh, which was actually just before 9-11, so a bit over 20 years. Um, and certainly things changed a lot since 9-11. Um, so, you know, I was there at a time when uh, perhaps those uh, that that um, th those threats weren't apparent, you know, so things were a lot, perhaps uh, a, lot, a lot more, uh, a lot less military focused, maybe. I don't know if it's the way. I think you know what I mean. You guys have we're old enough to to experience that time before 9 11. so i think the world was a slightly simpler place before that happened um mm. but yeah uh, but yeah look I, I i saw a lot of things i i mean i, I <laughs> when i was in san francisco i was there on business i was sent there to a conference uh, by one of my clients and we ended up in this dinner um which was you know a corporate thing and i was standing in a group of I don't know, maybe 10 Americans and there was me and and 
and being the impertinent Australian that I often am, um, I uh, and seeing how free the Americans were in discussing things, I couldn't help but interrupt them with the thing that had been crossing my mind, which is, I was, and, and I said to them, like, you know, so my turn came up and I said, I said, you know, guys, it's really great. This is a really good event and everything. But, you know, like, I'm a bit, I'm a bit taken aback. I'm a bit struck by the amount of poverty in the financial district. Like, there's people sleeping in every doorway. And, like, is that not something that you guys worry about? Or is it not something that crosses, you know, like, and literally not, everyone sort of looked at each other, looked at me as like I dropped a faux pas. And, didn't, and then just moved on with the conversation. No one was prepared to talk about it in this corporate setting. Interesting. I was really yeah. a bit surprised. It was, it was like I'd said something that was wrong, you know, wasn't, wasn't the right thing to say at that time. And for me, I was just, now maybe I should have just stuck with the whole booster corporate thing that we're in at the moment, Joe, because maybe it was one of those things going on, you know, uh, everyone back slapping and all the rest of it. But I... <laughs> I guess I was just after after a moment of uh, meaningful reality to try to see if there was any introspection at all amongst the people who walked past all this to get into the event. <laughs> yeah. If you're thinking, and, uh, if you're a thoughtful person, you've been concerned about the homeless for a long time, yeah. and and now uh, it's not just it, it's just been increasing and increasing and increasing, and now they're all addicted to fentanyl. It's like it's like two problems combined in one. Uh, the, the, the old the old kind of like drug thing, but the war on drugs failed, and it's so it's just a lie. Everybody knows it, and now the homeless are all addicted, and they're even taking drugs that just aren't destructive. They have a they they now have a uh, animal animal tranquilizer uh, that they take, and uh, it causes uh, skin skin erup skin uh, the uh, patches, skin, skin um, lesions, and uh, they're so the hospitals, you know, so they're they're, they're having multiple health problems along with uh, the uh, along with their uh, their uh, just being out of out of it, you know, taking the drugs. So, uh, and uh, it's becoming uh, it potentially a big health problem that could erupt. But it's a it's a very um um i mean it's a, these are very these are wicked problems you know the definition right. of wicked problems. they're complex right. and and the inputs and outputs aren't clear and there's lots of circular uh there's you know causality and uh and correlation is also not clear and so you've got to, and that's part of way where um if you like the forces of profit uh they they exploit that uh, the, the wicked problem space to make sure that no one even gets close to a solution um but um um um, and I'll just uh, on that point, uh, I posted just on the chat a full spectrum dominant reference going back to uh, 2000. Um, yeah, that's, but, I have it 1990 in my. Yeah, I was going to say, well, I first heard about it in probably 94. Well, that's, that's, that's when I heard about it. I don't, I don't yeah. think it's bandied about a lot recently. That's I, just, that's why it's, yeah, a, a chapter in a book. What's uh, interesting? Who is that author? Uh, Scott Rovignac. Yeah, I don't know those guys. But uh, okay. yeah, th there's so much I don't know about uh, defense doctrine, uh, you know. And I, I read from time to time. I read I read essays on defense doctrine, and oh, okay, that guy uh, it, it, did that, it, you know, said that, you know. And, uh, it, it's and definitely, you know, it's kind of like interesting how these ideas take hold, uh, and uh, just because scholars, you know, come up with them, and that's really a surprising thing. Uh, they they, that's kind of like announced by somebody someday and then it becomes uh law kind of do you strange. read the old do you read the old ram reports or the new ones like me you, yeah you mentioned reading the rand no no i oh no 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 that's from the 1950s the rand reports that, so uh, uh with the, where what with, uh, um, mad, Einstein, mad mutually yeah. assured destruction i did it when i was young yeah i read i read those when i was young i think and uh they the basically or reports of them, you know. So they, they, the idea was that uh, if you if you actually if you actually uh, run the attack, uh, then the attack actually doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't actually eliminate the counterattack. So it's not it's not feasible nuclear war with Soviet Union, you know, with large number of warheads and good rockets. 
it's not it's not achievable right uh, yeah i always thought that it's just like um, the art of war it's the same idea except you know except that they used they hired the best mathematicians available to to to, to run the numbers yeah i mean that's when it was um yeah. uh what is it von neumann was over there and uh it was von neumann i nash was over there as well and as was einstein all that group but I mean, Rand's dropped considerably, but I was referring when, a little bit earlier when we were talking is that I was just thinking that America's currency, is dro you know, if they see foresee uh, a big problem in the future, um, would they, you know, provoke something? Uh, who, not who? Di directly, the United States. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Not, I mean, not I don't, nuclear, I don't not, so. nuclear. Yeah. not nuclear, not nuclear. Matt, well, yeah. that's what that's what John's been talking about. You know, I mean, yeah. when I when I hear John talk about it, I think, well, OK, if you got countries like Australia that have a kind of, oh, we're indefensible, we need the United States to help us fend fend off China, because first thing's going to happen is China's going to attack us, just like we believe Japan was going to attack us in the, what was that, the Second World War? So, yeah. it'll, you know, and that Japan didn't happen, attack. but uh, you, it's OK. Huh? Japan attacked mainland Australia in the Second World War, and they were one island off of uh, land, of a beachhead. Right, so, they had they were an island away. Yeah, okay, I got. It. Yeah, so, and it was an Australian island or an Australian controlled island. Uh, Papua New Guinea, and so the north there, just to the north of our country, literally, you know, hundred kilometres. It was it was they couldn't quite get there. They were at the edge of their resource uh, 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 supply lines, hmm. um, but but they did uh, bomb Darwin, our northernmost city multiple times uh, with their air force oh. so so the, the threat was and they also had submarines going to sydney harbour and and uh, um, uh, launched some torpedoes at ships in sydney harbour so uh, um, that happened enough to enough for us to feel the existential threat of a potential invasion and and because sure. of that time we only had eight million people you know like when we and the place is so large there's no possibility okay. and so uh, I get, that's a historical context well, I, I don't think anyone seriously in Australia, who isn't a right-wing nut job exploiting it for political uh, expediency for local nut job votes, believes China is going to invade Australia. They've got to get through Indonesia first. There's, a, there's almost no chance. And we had our, uh, an ex-Prime Minister, a very um, intelligent ex-Prime Minister, say how absurd the notion of these submarines are and that they can only possibly be uh, used to encircle China at, at the Chinese, um, uh, off the Chinese uh, continental shelf then they're of no use to us uh, to defend our own mainland because there's only eight boats, of which only a third are in operation at any given time, maybe a half if you're lucky. And uh, what are you going to do? Have one every 1, 1,500 kilometres? You know, it's just not realistic. So, um, yeah, it's definitely... Yeah, but I, watched, I, I watched that speech. It was pretty good. It was a good uh, speech. I, I yeah. said to Joe just on that, um, we didn't buy submarines. What we bought was an alliance. Um, it was the, the the transaction was the the yeah. currency was the submarines. Uh, the purchase was the uh, American Alliance. Uh, that was what we bought. So that's that, you, know, you know that's that's and the art of war speaks to that. <laughs> you know, it's we didn't buy the boats for the armies and cities. But I think them. I think he was right though. You didn't have to spend that much money to get an American oh, Alliance. No. That was Paul, Paul, Ke Paul, Keating, Paul Keating was right, and uh, and uh, and we could have done it much smarter ways. I mean, he's. He's, a, he's probably the smartest prime minister we've had, and he's uh, an original thinker. He made he turned Australia into a modern economy. We were just a, a backward agrarian sort of inward looking place. And uh, so yeah, look, he, everything he said strategically, I believe, was correct. I'm not I don't I'm not defending the submarines at all. I don't think the I don't think the idea of an my whole point is Australia should be independent of America, not relying on America. We yeah. shouldn't be doing those deals. We should be able to defend ourselves now. In the in, in, with asymmetric warfare and drones and other sorts of technologies, I think that if we focused on what we might be able to do to to cover a very broad geography with with very small pieces of equipment, you can have lots of swarms on them because you make lots of them. Then we're probably that's probably a much smarter way to actually have a physical defence. As to whether we need to rely on that defence or not, it's another thing. I mean, I I would personally be a proponent for Australian nuclear weapons. I mean, no one here could tolerate that concept. I mean, I, I, I seriously, can't. <laughs> I cannot have that discussion with anyone here, and and then look at them like you. Because I get confused sometimes. Oh, you're a right wing nut job. Well, no, I'm not. 
I'm just <laughs> someone who understands the principles of strategic warfare. Right. So I, I go. Understand. Yeah. So all all I all I know is if we had you know half a dozen nuclear weapons uh, used not aimed at our opponents but rather used to knock out uh, flotillas of boats that might approach our shores uh, mm -hmm. halfway in their in their you know uh, egress towards us. Um, then no one's going to do it by definition. No one would do it. So then we're completely safe with only eight missiles, which is pretty cheap, really, in the scheme of things, compared to eight nuclear sub nuclear powered submarines. They're not actually nuclear capable. They don't wow. they don't hold nuclear weapons. So for me, it's like logical. Hey, get a few nuclear weapons, build a shitload of drones, defend yourself. Don't rely on America. Stand independent. Uh, work with China. Don't confront them. At the same time, press them on the human rights issues. Um, you know, which is what, you know, and, and before that, get our own house in order because we don't even have a Bill of Rights. So before we talk to them about it, let's get our own shit together because we don't have mm. our own human rights. Okay. Our Indigenous, our Indigenous, the treatment of our Indigenous people is dreadful. You know, okay. like, we, so, so we, there's plenty here we need to fix before we there's start. A lot of, there, were, there were some pro conflicting principles in the speech you just gave, John, but I, <laughs> I completely understand, you know. Well, they're all the, strategic the, weaknesses. Uh, if, you were, if you were an American, uh, person like yourself, <laughs> we would have just as many uh, kind of like question marks coming up for us, you know, right. it's like uh, we have these people here, you know, they kind of like, well, imagine the United States having this kind of dominance over other countries and doing anything it wanted to and stuff like that. Well, Australia, yeah, I, I, I understand like Australia has special set of conditions and limitations and uh, it's a really fascinating subject and fascinating to talk to you about it. Uh, you know, and and uh, I, I I'm actually not a non-proliferation guy, a non-proliferation kind of guy. Uh, if you if you want to have nukes, that's fine. Uh, the, uh, the, the they I think uh, Cuba, I think Cuba was getting nukes, and they kind of like uh, it caused a big problem Jeez. in the United States. But of course, it it ended up extremely well because we had an extremely sane president, which don't we don't usually have, which is Jeez. you know, which is which is surprising, you know, how that how that went. Uh, but it took it took a few weeks. So for a few weeks we were hiding underground. People were building uh buildings underground and, and their backyards and all kinds of crazy things were happening in the US. So uh, for about three, just a few weeks, yeah. So uh that was uh, kind of uh, uh, it was kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting how history happens and uh, how it affects people, uh, and uh, I think that's 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 kind of like we're all products of our times. It's it's it's, it's going to happen to us. We're going to be become affected by mm -hmm. all the good and all the bad, and uh, it's uh, it for it gets upsetting sometimes. But uh, the cool thing is if we can recognize the good. You you live in Washington D.C., Joseph? I don't. No, I used to. I lived in Washington D.C. for ten years. You're so, in Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia. I'm in Philadelphia now. Yeah. Philadelphia now. Yeah. So I was, uh, but I was there for a while, and you know I've consulted for a lot of those intelligence agencies and things like that. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, so. Uh, and you're still uh, in defense. You're still you're working for the defense department. Department, now. department of the Navy. Yeah. Department of Navy. So, okay. Yeah. I, so. I actually worked for them at one point as a contractor. I just, you know, I was. A, oh, I've been a, I've been a software contractor for a long time, and and I did did a stint in the DoD. Oh, okay. In San um, Diego. In, uh, oh, in, in San Diego. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, what do you call it? Coronado? Coronado. Yeah. 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 That, uh, that's a big base. I mean, that's that's yeah. one of our biggest bases. Actually. Yeah, that was fascinating because you go you go past the uh, A ten Warthog Air Base. And 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 that and I think they're phased out now, but they were such a great plane, you know. And I I've had seen a guy, pictures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, uh, I met a U.S. Marine that harassed me. A lady, U.S. Marine, harassed me. <laughs> it was like crazy, you know. But uh, I survived it, you know. Went on, worked worked there, and went on to the next job after that. Yeah, but the people were some people were really nice. The guys in security were really nice. They were they, 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 same they, thing they, here. They wanted to talk same to thing. me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we, yeah. we tend to. I mean, it, I, it's that. I mean, there's a lot a lot of military <laughs> personnel out there. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of military personnel out here. Um, I mean, there's some ex-military people, but that's it. So it's not necessarily like um, there's a lot of civilian 
yeah. uh, workers. Be so being around the military is always a lot of fun. I I, I, I drove uh, I drove uh, uh, what do you call it uh, Lyft uh, Uber for oh, uh, yeah. for about uh, a year right in in, in San Diego and uh, the I I was often called to the um, what do you call it uh, uh, the, the the Marine base there. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a Marine base and, uh, they, they would want to go downtown to a bar or they would want to go to just go to Oceanside close by to a bar or something like that. And, uh, or the, or they would just simply want to go from one place on the base to another place, place on the base, which is really kind of crazy or just, yeah. So, uh, but, uh, so I, I sometimes meet these people and, uh, of course they're very young. But they're very right. fascinating people. They're really nice, and the and the uh, the one guy that was completely uh, gung ho weapons guy, right? He was working in a uh, the the really he was really fascinating because he was working in a uh, helicopter repair facility. He was repairing the the helicopters that broke, so the helicopters would come back from to his base from wherever there were people who were serving that broke the helicopters, and he would have to repair the drive shafts and the engines and so forth. And uh, uh, and he said he didn't hate his job, I think, but he really wanted to be out there on the front lines. In other words, he considered himself to be a fighter, not a not a uh, mechanic. You know, but because yeah. of his testing and IQ or some some reason, they probably they was put him in there. He was assigned to be uh, working in a in a repair shop. That tends to happen, like where they put people, uh, yeah, in certain areas like the nuclear but i picked up on his area. sincerity he really wanted to be the guy with the gun you know uh you know somebody i met somebody that was that had a similar situation and that wanted to be well they wanted to be a seal and the, the, anyway it, it, yeah they wanted to be in the front lines but it's you know the thing that's amazed me and more than anything about our military is that how uh, incredibly gifted uh some of these guys are and right. they just end up exactly. in the military because exactly that's the only option they have and so it's i you know i in a way i, I always thought i always look at these guys and i'm thinking to myself what could they have done if they went to some other agency or something like that or you know some other feeder program per se not 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 to knock the military i'm not saying that but if there had been another way of uh um uh, of uh, uh, kind of taking advantage of these these individual skills they are really really smart guys for me and 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 they just uh they don't have the opportunities that 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 everybody you know that some people have and so um they ended up you know they're you know they're working you know they they have a career in the navy but they're really sharp guys if, if they could have been yeah. uh it, it it's it is a pleasure to just to, to run into individuals like that um yeah but it, it definitely all, definitely of some of the services teach personal focus you know and that's really an important quality in humans you know is learning the discipline aspect is important yeah. i mean it it does instill discipline you can't take that away um but it just seems like uh their lives are geared around the military and that's I don't know. That's a little just. Yeah, you know, I wish it were geared around something more teaching. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> but but uh, but it takes. It's like uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I'm crazy, but it seems to me it's a little bit like different strokes for different folks. In other words, is, there's going to be like a wide spectrum of uh, aspirations. I know there was a time when I was a kid, and I only cared about growing up. Uh, I think it was ten, right? And I thought, oh. I could be a pilot in the Air Force. And, yeah. and it's just for like a little while, there was just like this little window where that opened up for me where I thought, oh my gosh, I could be wearing a uniform. I could be flying a plane. I could be uh, uh, doing all those cool Air Force things I see on TV. And uh, so, so, uh, so just for like a, a little moment, I was kind of right there that was going to be a possibility for me you know there are a lot of other possibilities fortunate thing about my childhood lots of, i was really middle class lots of possibilities along the way yeah so uh 
you know, and that's such an advantage, you know, it's like uh, if you have that uh, kind of like, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could do that. Oh, look, I'm going to be a photographer and I'm going to do no. photography, you know. Oh, wow. They just handed me a musical instrument and the teacher says I'm really good. You know, mm. it's like, you know, well, all these kind of advantages and possibilities and um, they just sort of like fold, unfold one after the other. It's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, it's <laughs> fascinating to hear you both talk about the military, the US. Uh, it's it's a it's a cultural um, uh, institution that we just don't have here in that same because we just don't have the scale and the and the sophistication, and it's not uh, preeminent in everything that we do in the same way it is. Uh, you know, we don't have guns. So the very you don't have that, guns. Oh, you poor guys. Well, well, I mean, I, I don't, it's, it's actually, I mean, yeah, we don't worry about going to school or any of that stuff. It's that's a really true. good thing to have guns, right? That's, you feel so, more secure. Uh, well, you, you, you have a gun in school. You had a, cried. Yeah. a program, right, where they actually, people turned in their guns. Yeah, that, I, that's on, on the chat. In the, I, I put the links for that uh, comedian. And uh, just below that, the third link, I put that link to that gun control piece by John Oliver, where he actually talked about how Australia got rid of their guns. And went to came to Australia and interviewed some of our politicians and contrasted it to the interviews he did with the American politicians. And uh, you know, like <laughs> so one funny part was like he asked the American uh, NRA guy, you know, uh, what's what's the objective of, you know, uh, what's what's what 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 objective should an American politician have? And he's like, to get re-elected. And then he asked the guy over here. Uh, what his objective was getting rid of gun control, you know, what, what objectives should politicians have? And he's like, well, to, make, to leave society better than you found it. <laughs> Not get elected, because in fact, the, the Premier in Queensland here who came out, because this is the biggest gun state up until that time, he was a Conservative guy, he, came, he lost the next election because of the gun issue. But he's like, no, I was happy to lose the election because we got rid of the guns, you know. <laughs> Whereas the well, Americans... That's what Americans don't understand about Australians and Canadians, for example. You know, it's like you guys actually are kind of humanist. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and uh, the American American uh, culture humanism is very low ranking. Yeah. It's it's yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's why much when better I to be much more important to be a good Christian or uh, have uh, good looking kids or whatever. You know, it's just I don't get so the many Christian ideals thing. here. It's like the whole the whole the whole gospel. You know the the, the gospels was is all about um, love thy neighbor. You know, washing the feet of the of the of, of the lepers. You know, and like it's. I mean, when you read it properly, it's the red letter stuff in the Bible. You know, the stuff Jesus is, is attributed to Jesus is all about love, loving, forgiving. You know, your enemy, loving your neighbor, and and uh, I suppose the most humanist philosophy. Uh, that we've probably seen in many ways this the philosophy of Jesus Christ. And it, yet, gets, it gets tangled up in power. American, American Christians seem to see it like a, you know, we, we had it here too, that Hillsong Church, which I'm sure you've heard about over there uh, because it, it, it went global. But, um, you know, the prosperity preaching, the Pentecostal prosperity where oh. uh, your, your monetary success is an indication of your... Uh, uh, being touched by God, you know, the more successful uh -huh. you are, the more like you are. As if, and I'm like that. That that for me sounds like the Pharisees. That for me is the the Romans in the Bible. That's not the Christians. Uh, it's it, it, I just never can understand the the. Maybe it's because I'm getting stereotypes from being so far away, and I'm not seeing the nuance of it. But um, you know, so there's that. Uh, and just just on that, yeah. Look, my political outlook of, is progressive. I'm a progressive. You know, my view is that we need to make progress uh, as a human race because we're competing with entropy. You know, everything mm -hmm. decays. If we don't progress, we decay. And so we must move forward. We can't stay in the same place. We've got to progress. And yet, um, one of the things that I think Abraham Lincoln's probably, you know, alongside Washington, um, for mine, the greatest uh, uh, political leader, uh, leaders that have come, um, uh, and one of his famous quotes was, you don't make a, a poor man rich by making a rich man poor. And I think that that's the very profound statement because part of the problem, because I'm actually a designer by profession, uh, graphic design, product design, a little bit of industrial design, so I'm a problem solver. And that's one of the reasons I spent time building the strategy map because 
I was in board situations all the time dealing with wicked problems and going and seeing patterns in politics as I did and all the rest and then saw patterns in the book and thought, right, I'm going to deconstruct this. And when I started, I realised what I'd done, I've bitten off quite a lot to chew. And it's a, it's a massive undertaking when you try to stitch the whole thing together with some internal consistency. It's easy enough to come up with maxims and, you know, interpretations. It's another thing altogether to try to get some internal self-consistency with the various principles. I think I put it in the first comment today, um, matching up the, uh, the variables to the, uh, the, the functions, um, the factors and the relationships. You know, you've got these different levels of interconnectedness and how to try to get patterns out of that, which is why for me, the whole thing is can be summarized by patterns of movement, you know, psychological and physical. And so, um, uh, but what it means is that when I come to a domain discussion about health or military or politics or anything else, I'm, I'm a bit of an odd creature because I'm really looking at strategic leverage points. Where are the weaknesses? Where are the opportunities? Where's the terrain right. we don't want to see? Where, how does this book we've actually been discussing inform the problem solving approach to a problem? And so that means sometimes I'm saying something that sounds really right wing, like, hey, why don't we just have some nukes? <laughs> it's really cheap and that'll stop anyone invading. And they're all like, gee, that, not even the right wing nut job say that in Australia. What, where the hell are you on the spectrum? And the other times I'm like, well, hang on, why aren't you fixing up the poor problem? The, you know, why aren't you helping your poor people off the streets in America? Like, I don't get it. And so, you end up on almost both sides of a political spectrum, which only for me shows how completely useless the old uh, French idea of the left wing, right wing, which side of the king do you sit on, uh, mm. so pathetically useless in describing problem solving uh, spaces. You know, like somehow I'm, I'm on one label or another label, it's like, well, can't we pick the nuances out of all of this and stitch together a proper pathway, you know, as opposed to, uh, well, I, I, I must think all these things because I'm in that camp or all these other things because I'm in this camp. And, and, of course, when you're in discussion forums like this where there's limited opportunity to get into detail, which I'm glad we've had the chance to do after the talk, um, uh, especially in your case, James, I've done that a bit more with Joseph and some of our discussions, you start to go, oh, hang on, this guy isn't just this way or that way. It's not just this. It's a more nuanced approach, you know. And coming back to what Abraham Lincoln said about not making a, a, a poor man rich by making a rich man poor. One of the wicked problems, difficult, one of the difficulties of the wicked problem space when it comes to things like healthcare is the issue of where, of what profit does to motivate individuals. You know, Sun Tzu says it himself, to move people, you, you, you entice them with profit. To, to stop them, you show them the harm. Yeah. One, yeah. Of the, one of the features of the American uh, polity and uh, you know, political economy it's the use of uh, monetary incentives, profit incentives to move people to action. And I mean, it's probably the overriding feature of the entire system if you have to come to the nub of it. And, the, and mm. it leads to this conundrum. We have Medicare here in Australia, right? We pay 1% of our tax, we get free healthcare, free hospital care. Um, you know, the only thing we don't get is our own room in a hospital. If you want that, you pay extra with private health insurance, then you'll get like a hotel room in hospital as opposed to being in a ward, right? But uh, outside of that, most of the, now, and you also get some more advanced medical care that you can pay for that you don't get in the public system. And it's true the public system sometimes has some waiting lists uh, based on a triage system of how important your issue is to be solved straight away or can you wait six months. But, but you know, given it's free, uh, you know, you most if, if you're in an emergency situation, you'll go straight into surgery. Um, now, the problem with that is, and I, is that, our system is subsidised by the American system because so much of the new technology and the new medications and everything else that comes to Australia, we're like the franchisees that simply get the products in. We haven't developed it at the franchise head office. And, and that investment that was required in America to build those solutions uh, has that whole profit mechanism behind it. And yet, because of that, it doesn't account for, for, for all the poor people who need medical healthcare properly in any sort of universal system because it's only profit driven. And yet without that profit, profit driven engine room, Medicare in Australia couldn't function because the technologies we rely on wouldn't be coming along at the sort of rate that would enable us to keep affording it um, as, med, as medical care gets more and more complex, if you understand what I'm saying. So the profit system in America for health is in fact subsidizing the, the socially democratic um, nationalist systems in other countries like the NHS in Britain and 
Medicare in Australia and so on. And yet, um, you, you go back to polio, and of course, the guy who invented that vaccine did it for free. He gave the, it was open source. He gave, you know, I, we don't want to make money out of this. We want everyone to be cured of polio. So it's not a profit driven approach. So there's this well, there teaching. Was, there, there was eventually a lot of money because he owns a kind of like a, the, he, he started a kind of large, very large public facing uh, scientific community in San Diego. It all everything is sock, right? Everything is started by oh, yeah. the uh, yeah. uh, the culture, a lot of the a lot of the, the, the scientific stuff, a lot of UST, UCSD related stuff, uh, the aquarium, the uh, ship that goes out to sea and uh, dips itself into the water to to investigate uh, the sea life at lower at uh, lower depths. So it's well, uh, it's a, it's, like, that... it's like a kind of uh, uh, oh and. I forget what else. Oh, yeah, the, the, they, they started the they started the climate. They were, they were one of the early pioneers in climate change. Uh, they were the first ones to to measure carbon dioxide and say, you know, to so that and then that was one of the facts that were pointed to by the climate change people that the carbon dioxide is rising <clears throat> every year. So so it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it, uh, the, the, he wasn't a poor man. He was never a poor man because of the vaccine. He he got rich, rich, rich. Well, maybe maybe that just makes my point without that um, contradiction in terms, because obviously, again, not knowing uh, the detail of his subsequent activities, but just knowing the fact that he didn't try to put a patent on the polio vaccine. Um, uh, the um, um, the point I'm making is you've got this capitalist engine room producing the the production and innovation that others are relying on for a more socialist approach to helping their poor people with the healthcare system. And there's this tension between having a profit-driven investment system, which is, of course, where the military comes in as well, they're doing that in so many other ways, versus the idea of caring for everyone at the same time. And it's almost like the Americans are like, well, no, because we, we can't maintain our ascendancy in producing medical technologies if we get rid of the profit system in some way, socialise it. And yet, it seems to me, looking at Obamacare from a great distance without much detail, that hasn't particularly undermined <laughs> the uh, ability of the American uh, it, it, street. It's Canada. much more, I mean, actually, James and I were in a, in a discussion on Friday about culture um, in, in general. And I think it's a much more deep uh, problem that you're hitting on in the sense that um, why America doesn't necessarily take care of its poor. Uh, you know, Is there's it? a, I, 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 I mean, I, I think there are, various forms of individualism that exist. And I think America has a very, uh, a very peculiar form of individualism when it's analyzed a little bit more closely. Um, and I, and I, it's amazing because I was reading about these different categories that, that, this, that this individual is doing to measure cultures in general. Um, but, uh, they, you know, did further studies based on his meta analysis and uh, not his meta analysis. I mean, his, um, high level analysis. And, um, they found like one of the things I'd brought up the other night is that they tend, Americans tend to assign great deal of, um, value to the individual actor's success meaning that they think the individual is essentially responsible for their success so that there's a um idea that everybody should be able to make it on their own kind of thing and they're out for themselves um and that does seem to be it's less communal and there's a lot of reasons to deep reasons as to, to doing that. Even if you take it, we're a country of immigrants, people forget that, but we are. And so you're breaking away from a community. There's been analysis done from that. And that's a form of individualism. Uh, there's an interesting paper that I, I probably can put in the chat that, that I think I shared it with you, James um that talks about this um 
I hadn't finished reading it myself, but it was, talks about the how uh, how certain countries are more communal just based on uh, immigration uh, to the United States based on a certain period of time. What is it? I, I yeah, I think the general out. general feeling in the United States is the immigration has really helped. In other words, it formed what the country is, the kind of country it right. is. Um, and then they, uh, ouch, I just, um, I'm sorry, I'm rebooting. Good night, everybody. Good oh, night. I'm back. No, I'm back. Oh. Just, I, thought, I thought it rebooted, but it just lost contact uh, cool. with the video. So uh, yeah, so, so that, that we're, we're the, it is the, the general feeling is that the immigration really helped of course we're all products of that i'm probably third generation right not that, that far along myself so um uh so second second third third just, i'm actually third yeah my my mother was born and my mother and father were both were both born in the united states um and i'm not sure about my grandparents on my father's side but i know definitely the the um the grandparents and um of, the parents of my mother were born in Canada. Um, and I even I even have some contacts with remote relatives that I didn't never never met in Canada I, uh, because of uh, because of uh, mostly because of one, two, three and me. <laughs> so but uh, it's the the but the but the 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 the, the, the immigrant aspect is really cool because even though it was associated with a lot of social um, uh, problems it uh, and, and a lot of uh, social concern and so forth. It actually ended up, I think, being a positive because uh, uh, we're, kind of, we're a diverse, because of it, we're a diverse people. And I think that's, 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 that's really uh, a good thing. Uh, the only thing, uh, the main thing is that we all speak English, Australians and Americans and Canadians and Britons and a couple other countries. So, uh, and now, of course, the whole world as a hobby. Uh, so that's kind of like uh, uh, a very, very positive thing for us. What do you guys think? I think so. I mean, it, I I think we're sometimes we we go from a first generation where you're actually dependent on the community that you come over with to future generations where you break away from that community. And I think that that's where people become more individualistic uh, along the lines. That's my thought. I mean, it, that's just, yeah. Yeah. and so, you know, that there's, um, I mean, if you think about it, that's the beginning of our country. It's uh, the way, uh, you know, there were sections of of people based on where they immigrated from. Um, mm -hmm. They stayed together as communities. And once those communities, you know, as they become generally part of the American culture, they lose their other culture and they become much more, if you're breaking away from that, you're becoming a little bit more individualistic in, in your nature. And I think that's where a lot of individualism is actually comes from in the United States. Uh, you know, you're, you're, yeah, if, I mean, if, you know, you're not tied to your, your community anymore, then you're integrating into a multicultural, uh, it, it, it also, and, but it also, there's this element that you're breaking away, right? That, that you know, you're doing it on your, your own and you got a different identity. So that's where I think American culture develops this idea of individualism. And I think that it um, can lead to uh, overlooking um, those most in need. Yeah, um, you know, in a wildly growing economy, you know, the, 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 yeah, that's the other too. aspect of it, you know, but you're right, it is that. It is the breaking away of uh, some generation that creates this uh, helps create the spirit of uh, uh, the spirit of integration is a uh, is actually uh, very positive and very progressive. I, I wonder, from an outsider's point of view, 
how much uh, the concept of um, role play uh, affects American individualism. Um, it almost seems like that's the predominant influence on American individualism from a cultural perspective. And what I mean by that is um, um, it's almost like Americans have invented the idea of role playing. You know, you've got the uniform for this, you've got the ways of being, you've you know, all the credos that come with, hey, if I'm, a, if I'm a cowboy in Texas, I've got the kit, I've got the look, I've got the swagger, I've got the attitude. And, and it's like an opt-in system. It's like you, you seem to opt into roles. You can be anyone you want in America, go somewhere and you know, like Mad Men, that TV, TV show. Uh, being in the uh, graphic design business, I found that a fascinating uh, cultural contribution. I don't know if anyone watched that show at all, Mad Men, going back in the day. No, I, I, saw, I saw a couple of them. Yeah, a the thing. Thing. So I was just going to finish by saying the, the role-playing, uh, just to comment on Mad Men, brilliantly written uh, series that... Yeah. I've never seen I've never seen a final episode of a TV series resolve in such a amazingly uh, profound way. It was, but that's I don't want to spoilers if you haven't seen it. I won't go there. But but what I'm really suggesting is it strikes me that anyone who's successful in America it seems to do that by opting into a group and adopting the cosplay. Right, the role play for me is almost the cosplay. That is, there's a yeah. costume. There's a, a way, yeah. you know, so if you're in the military, if you're in emergency services, everything's got this, you know, police officer, right. you've got these costumes that almost are uh, quintessentially American. And then and then if you don't opt in because you're disenfranchised, you're poor, you're actually, the problem is that uh, you, you're not helping yourself, you're not pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, which almost is like you're actually not putting yourself into a group and choosing to conform with that group to then make progress so therefore you shouldn't be helped because you're not fitting into the wow. group yeah that's that's group. really unfortunate yeah uh, i was just going i was going to mention in, in middle ages in europe uh, they had this thing with hats where, where people according to their trade would wear different hats right. uh, that way they could be recognized on the street if you were a guy that worked with wood uh, you know, you'd have a certain kind of hat and people would uh, contact you to, you know, come and repair something made out of wood and so forth. So, uh, so the, uh, it, it's kind of, uh, it didn't just start with uh, America. It, 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 I think it, uh, it goes back a long way. The, uh, and of course, the younger generation likes cosplay, like you said. I, I don't know anybody that's uh, into it extremely. Uh, but I did mention, I did meet some Wiccans when I was in um, Kansas City, uh, Missouri. I met some Wiccans there and they um, they were kind of like uh, really original people. They were kind of like, uh, uh, and they were of that type, you know, they would go in for cosplay and things like that. Um, and that That's... was part of being a Wiccan, you know, as you had special furniture and stuff like that to go along with your uh, image, uh, your, your self yourself uh in a religious you know religious I like it. it's a Amer you, you i'm not suggesting that I obviously you, you've picked on a historical reference going uh, pre-american but i but the expression of it in american terms is very unique when you think about things like hasbro and mattel with the gi joes and the barbies and you know there were dolls before that but they weren't action figures you know like the star wars characters the Marvel universe of superheroes, you know, the all these different. Um, so when I say cosplay, perhaps I'm using that term a bit flippantly um, to try to um, give an inflection to a cultural phenomenon. I'm, wor I'm wondering how much. Um, so I understand um, different types of, of personal identity it actually comes out of a military doctrine, but common by identity is the lowest level. You know, that is uh, you, you're born in the same country, you're part of the same tribe right? You're part of the same region, you know, you're, you're from this city or this state. So common by identity is the lowest level of agreement. Common by activity is the next level. Hey, we'll choose to play in the same football team, we'll work at the same place. We're common by our activity. And then beyond that, you have common by agreement. That is beyond uh, just where we uh, where we come from or where we hang out. And beyond what we do, uh, we can also then agree on conceptual things. And I wonder to what degree uh, people who don't opt into um, common, a common by agreement level with some group that 
go takes them towards some form of American individual success. Hey, I'm going to be an advertising agent. I, you know, I'm going to work in advertising. So now I've got the uh, slick suit. I'm going to work in the software industry in California. So I'm going to look like a uh, a hipster. You know, there's there's almost like all these. Am I am I missing the mark there? Is there anything in that? Like, is is it the fact that people who are left behind? don't opt into a group and in fact the group they opt into by then default is almost the non-group of people if you know what i'm saying the the no the no you know the the you call call them i guess hobos or the homeless people that is they're not uh they, they don't have a, a costume they don't have, you know they're they're a costume <laughs> they're without costume they're without they're without conventions they're without credos they're without any of those agreements you make as an american if you happen to go and join a particular pursuit you know so a pursuit of happiness well you i think you... Uh, in the united states it matters to a certain extent it matters less i, I remember when i was younger uh, i was working in canada and i always had to i, I lived in toronto canada and I, I had to uh wear a suit most of the time and that included uh, i think after i immigrated to the united I let them immigrate, but I was american originally i i i, I left for the united states and I um, I think I was still still wearing a suit to work uh, for a while, and mm. then most of the places I worked didn't. After that, I kind of like worked without wearing a suit because uh, that was the style of the technical realm in the United States. Engineers didn't wear suits, so uh, and I I kind of like uh, got used to that and and stopped having suits. <laughs> so so the, the uniforms in the United States are kind of a variable thing and it's more a matter of culture. It's not right. it's not that you're it's not that you're trying to reach a certain level of agreement. It's just that people who work where you work wear ties and suits and mm -hmm. or they don't or they have to wear they start have to buy polo, sh polo shirts, you know. <laughs> Sorry. In, just to explain in Australia, right? Our entire political class wears one brand of boot, mm. right? And it's really bizarre because the company is called RM Williams. They make boots for for people who work on farms, for rural, you know, farmers and 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 stockmen, right? Mm. So they're cowboy boots essentially, and the Australian version of them, not particularly stylish. And yet, our entire political class, in some sort of virtue signaling exercise wears these stupid boots with their suits and it's almost like it's I'm, like in the boardrooms as well it's almost like if you're not wearing the r and williams boots you're not uh, you're not one of us hmm. it's like a it's like a membership card it's quite bizarre but it's but it's it's a it's a universal one it's not sort of driven by um it's driven by a class of people rather than a a pursuit of occupation. Um, I just noticed with all the, I suppose it's a popular, the popular culture reference to uniforms and so on. I just wonder, maybe you say it's a cultural issue. I guess the flip side of the idea of the land of opportunity is that, uh, well, if you know, as you say, if you're not making it, then you're not, you're not doing the work necessary to get there. So it rests on you. Now, the irony of that is the elephant in the room, which is um, uh, the environment. You know, when the environment's dreadful. Um, you know, I mean, how much how much of me recycling is going to fix climate change, as as an example of that? So when you've got environmental factors that simply make it impossible for you to solve a problem, um, then the idea that you have to take personal responsibility for a systematic problem seems absurd, and that seems it's to be almost impossible. Yeah, well, that's the contradiction in the American uh, 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 individualistic idea, I guess, is that it fails to um, account for the systematic errors of the systematic problems outside of the corporation. I mean, I guess the corporation, hey, if we've got a systematic problem, we'll throw some corporations at it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, the, the wicked problem is difficult because the corporation's obviously been the engine room for uh, reducing poverty globally. Um, uh, and yet it's creating poverty now as we speak in other ways. Uh, it's a, I don't know if you've, I haven't done a lot of uh, looking at it, but you know, the, in Europe they seem to have quite a lot of uh, participatory democracy aspects. You know, workers on boards and corporations in Germany and 
you know, all sorts of stuff like, you know, the education system um, um, uh, in uh, um, uh, Finland, uh, got to have a master's degree to be a teacher. Yep, no, you know, a completely, completely public system, no private schools, so all kids get the same resources. Don't do homework. Hmm. They do one hour of homework a night and it's limited and they do less contact hours for all their students, allowing for more play. Highest performing students in the world by some margin. Then you've got the Koreans beating the hell out of their kids with 14 hour a day study sessions and just go to school, then go to your tutor after school for the same amount of time you're at school. You know, end up sleeping at your desk half the time. It's yeah, sort of crazy stuff, isn't it? I, it's uh, there's so many wicked problems, and it's so hard to visualise. One of the things I've enjoyed about this group, just talking about the art of war, and I'm, um, it's a, it's a, it's unfortunate I was only able to join the last few sessions because it's been a really productive and interesting uh, discussion. It's just for me, it was a, a tool for trying to look through wicked problems and go and try to get some uh, way of um, uh, measuring uh, what was good and mm. bad. Because, because wicked problems, by their definition, are so confused, um, the actual art of war itself is written in that circular fashion. And then when you start to connect it up as a, as a structure, um, it becomes more apparent what the, like I said, when I arrived at that list of certain failures, um, mm -hmm. almost invariably go through any system and go, oh yeah, that system's ticked that red box. <laughs> and there's a failure point, that's why it's failing. And it's sort of like, you know, so it's, it's quite instructional. And yet the problem still remains. Okay, you've got this tool, but then trying to convey that tool to other people or do they choose to use that tool, you know, and then you've got, you've actively got self-interested actors running around saying, well, if you've got a tool, they're going to fix things. That's the last thing we want to do is fix, fix things. Things are working quite well for me as they currently stand. We don't want to fix anything, you know. Uh, despite the fact there's a lot of people it's not working for, it's working for me particularly well, so I'm not going to fix anything at all. In fact, I'm going to try stop you trying to fix it. And so then the paradox of the art of war is that in a systematic form, you have to try to use the art of war to bring about its usefulness as a tool by virtue of the fact that there might be opponents that say we don't want that tool to really come into play. Okay. It's, there's a, yeah, well, there's I, think, a, I think, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's variable. Uh, it depends on the it depends on the situation and the culture, of course. Uh, not everyone, not every uh, world has a Hitler in it. You know, for example, mm. uh, you know, it's what what it, what is the what is the task at hand? I think people that's the problem. Part of the problem, people exaggerate the task at hand. We live in a world with other countries, and sometimes the tool which of eliminating another country is kind of like too loosely thought of you know it's like holy smokes why don't we just like let that country be you know because it's growing and it's exciting you know why why would you want to stop that country in, in one way or another um uh, so the, the, that's, the, that's 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 what that's kind of my personal insight is that you know we we, we, we tend to take the hammer to because we we're seeing nails that that need to be driven everywhere, but uh, it's like maybe it's another tool that uh, really needs to be used, uh, uh, and uh, that that that's 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 kind of my take. I think when I was young, that I was in, eligible for the draft, and they, they they asked me at the draft board. They asked me a question. They said, "What would you do in the second world if you were if this was the second world war?" and uh, you know, and we had all these problems in Europe and everything, and uh, with Hitler and so forth. And uh, I'd read the book, you know, I I I I knew all about it, and uh, uh, I'm kind of like uh, I I I I I don't I don't know what I would do, but I do know what I did know is that I'm not in the Second World War. I'm in um, I'm I'm living in a country that is going to war with Vietnam. Yeah. And why the fuck are you doing this? You know, mm -hmm. it's it's like uh, so so it's I'm just used to people choosing the wrong tool all my life, and, and and you know, and you have that same kind of thing today. You know, it's like you get a country that you think you know. Some people think because they've seen these videos that they have human rights issues, or they read you know, they read that. The, 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 the article in the New York Times that had no documentation at all. Um, Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square. 
not not just Tiananmen Square. I'm talking about uh, Xinjiang. But anyway, so so the so so but uh, yeah, Tiananmen Square. Getting excited about that, I think is is relevant. And uh, a lot of Chinese are excited about that. You know, they have they have monuments and everything in Beijing. So so it's uh, and they have a special library for it. You know, where you can go read all the documents. Um, so, but it's uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, it's like it's like why why is it uh, why is it you know that because peak countries just because countries have different histories, different forms of government, one country needs to try to eliminate another. You know, and and maybe that's an impossible task, but that still it seems like war is so great that you'll try to do that. And that's what the part of what the art of war is about is making that decision at the beginning. I'm going to try to eliminate this country of North Vietnam because they seem to support the Soviet Union, or I'm yeah. going to try to you know eliminate uh, 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 the Taliban in Afghanistan mm -hmm. because they have a really radical ideology, and we don't even have. Uh, we, we don't have a clue how they got to that ideology. You know, it uh, seems to, it, uh, they were, and we're ignoring the fact that it came out of Saudi Arabia. You know, we're just going to, we're just going to sort of go with the uh, facts on the ground in Afghanistan and uh, what our tasks at hand are. And you get into this kind of like situation where you can't possibly win in a, uh, in a, in a in a kind of like a face face saving way, so and and you and you and you go and you create a war one after another, and you become a country of wars, a country of just uh, I'm always going to be able I'm always going to be successful because I'm always going to start the war, and the only problem at the end is I'm going to have to stop the war, and no. the stop stop the stopping the war is going to have to be returning all the forces to the United States and see what happens. In the history of that country afterwards, uh, so uh, I've got to jump yeah. in there, James, and say that um, I guess that's the gap between reading a trans, you know, reading the art of war in the literal sense, the translation that we've been reading, and then taking the systematic approach that I subsequently took to try to connect up the patterns that I saw, and and what I mean by that is to say that the the strategic framework that I've arrived at describes precisely why America lost those. Uh, ill-founded wars. It describes precisely why the method you're talking about is doomed to failure. Um, this is these are misadventures um, uh, of um, American arrogance that, um, uh, born out of often self-interest, uh, of, you know, uh, uh, political players for domestic audiences and other political purposes. You know, the culmination of uh, uh, corruption, greed, and idiocy. <laughs> Uh, in a complex mixture of of, uh, of elements, and so um, the 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 structure that I've drawn out of this book tells me why those wars are wrong, uh, why they fail, and it also tells me why um, what you're suggesting should also prevail. That is, it strikes me that every system of government as it currently stands uh, has plenty of strategic failure points in each one of them. And what I'm attempting to do in the discourse I have is to identify the strategic strengths that they might have in individual facts. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, this is a book drawn, drawn out of Chinese culture. You know, a lot of the things talked about here are Chinese philosophical principles referred to. So yeah. that, can't, that can't be ignored uh, in the understanding of the, of the framework itself. You know, the, the, the contradiction of the idea that China could have invaded the world when they had the world's biggest navy in what was it, the 12th century or the 8th century, I forget now, I think it's 12th. And, but, uh, but just decided to return to their own shores. And that, so their approach wasn't an expansionist view of using these uh, philosophies, but rather one of a defensive posture uh, and mm. not one that succeeded uh, altogether anyway. But so I guess what I'm saying is that um, you're right. Um, but I don't read the book as a doctrine for war. And the reason for that is because it's a doctrine for conflict. And the difference between war and conflict is war is a type of conflict. But conflict is everywhere 
you know, competition between uh, just your environment. You're a baby. You come out of your mother's womb in conflict with the with the world that you come into. I mean, there's conflict in every activity. You know, uh, the uh, chem chemical elements are in conflict to maintain their bonds uh, against uh, an external force that might disrupt those bonds. I mean, so for me, the the the, the fulcrum of of the notion of conflict is one that then provides for a series of patterns. And so then it becomes much more of a useful tool when you take these principles in a systematic way and start to deconstruct wicked problems to say, what's what's the good, what's the bad? Can we arrive at common agreements on things that would otherwise make progress? Because I think- yeah, we're, the, all, we're all reading the same book, uh, John. It's, 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 you know, it's, I, you know I, I, I understand you being extra analytical and stuff and that's great. Uh, and we're, you know, we, we try to be all try to be analytical when we read, and uh, uh, and uh, some people are a little more military minded than others, and uh, some can get that can understand that part of it, and other people will pick up these uh, applications to more wider problems. I just want to mention, you know, like I, that the whole thing about being an animal mm -hmm. means that we adapt to the world. That's the uh, it's it's not it's not even uh, we it's true you know we're all sort of like thrown out of our mother's room wombs and because we happen to be animals we adapt to the world mm -hmm. so that's not there's nothing that special about that it's just sort of like understanding that it exists and uh, it exists for us and it's part of the uh, the basic structure it's built into the basic structure of humanity uh, so to speak I guess I could be more specific and simply say this. There's, we, we understand um, the application of a systematic approach when we look at the power of electricity or the power of chemistry or the power of physics. I mean, you know, if you, if you scan a product at a supermarket checkout, that's quantum physics right there in action, right? So we understand the structures of power when we codify them to be able to use them in a replicatable way to solve problems when it comes to technology. What we don't have is a map of power when it relates to the use of political and human cultural influences with power. We have a, a very gray area of lots of philosophical discussion, but we don't have the equivalent of an electrical or chemical system that tells us what circuits we could build if we referred to those patterns of force. So for me, uh, you're right, we're all reading the same book, but the, the, I'm obviously referring to a subsequent system I built from the influence of that book. Now, I'm not suggesting that I've got the answer. I'm suggesting I've got version one of a potential answer. Well, it that's good. Be, I mean, it's fascinating, you know, and congratulations on the work that you've done. It might, it might be a component, but what I'm suggesting is that we don't, as a human race, have the circuitry to be able to describe um, the use of power in a political dimension. And the best we've got is left wing. Well, right. I, that's where I would disagree with you. We 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 have this. I think that we have we have we we have this uh, capacity to reason with these problems. We don't have to choose to go to war when it's not going to be sustainable or profitable, or it's only going to be primarily destructive mm -hmm. and cause misery and uh, uh, you know famine. Is is that we, we have those choices and we are choice making machines. So this is our gift. We we have the gift of being able, being able to make good choices, even though it seems that people don't make good choices sometimes. We still are choice making machines. Yes, and that's my point. You seem to think that, it, or that this book always comes back to war. And I'm saying that it, it talks about avoiding war. And I'm saying that the well, that's at the beginning. It talks about that. It says that that's, that's the first principle, is what you have to decide whether you have a possibility of winning the war. More, um, more than that, more than that, the first principle is what's the better way. You've got to look at the way, and so and so the first the first principles of any philosophy are the most important parts of it. That's, that's, that's why I said. That's what I so said. You're, you're, well, you're not you're, characterizing my point of view correctly. My no, point of view about the book is that the book considers war in all of its aspects, primarily war. But at the beginning of the book, it says that no one should ever go to war who doesn't have the possibility of gaining from the war, uh, clearly. 
you know, huh. and uh, this happened in history. There were a lot of wars where things happened, people suffered, and some result occurred. And I can't criti critique all of those wars, but I can definitely critique since the the American attitude of towards war after starting starting with the starting with the Cold War, the American attitude to war starting with the Cold War seems to be one where you're supposed to always be able to win a war regardless of circumstances, and that uh, and I'm not saying that it was complete failure, but it was uh, it uh, it was such that. Uh, every war seemed to result in a sense of failure. And uh, the, the, well, with maybe one or two exceptions, I remember there was a Granada war that lasted two days. But uh, so, the, so, this, uh, so this idea of um, a nation of warriors that could always vanquish opponents was kind of exploited for the purposes of entering into wars. And uh, that contrary to the art of war. Sure. Uh, and I, I, I agree with it. That's my point. I, I'm simply saying that, that we don't have a structure uh, for approaching political problems or wicked problems in the way we would build an electrical circuit, right? Where we could clearly path, because you know, think about the complexities of an integrated circuit of our computers, massively mm. circular problems. I mean, the, the wicked problem of a computer is massive. And yet it's resolved because we understand all of the all of the forces involved, and then we can build mechanisms to channel those things in a way that provides for an application that uh, gives us a tool. And so the um, uh, discourse, uh, the discourse that we have around politics, which you rightly point out that we have, that we're doing now, that's what we have available, is not dissimilar to the discourse around the use of electricity before they understood the principles of how to build circuits. It's a, it's a, it's a, a pre-industrial understanding. Well, I think what of, you're saying, I think what you're saying is we're not approaching these problems logically. In other words, if uh, we approached all these problems in a, in a logical way, then uh, if like, you know, people people were actually approaching problems of foreign issues, right? The foreign policy magazine, that type of thing. Uh, the, well, the, uh, they were if they were approaching all these issues logically, then we wouldn't really have uh, all of these uh, mistakes mistakes based based on um, uh, uh, aggression and uh, uh, false uh, kind of uh, uh, the 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 idea of being the dominant power full spectrum dominance. Once you have full spectrum dominance, then you can have full spe spectrum oppression that follows dominance, right? I actually, I read Hegel, right? Hegel's my favorite philosopher now. Uh, but uh, reading Hegel, I see that uh, there's a chapter on master and slave, right? The words are, uh, I forget now, but uh, the, but there's a, there's, there's a, uh, a guy that uh, kind of like assumes dominance and there's a person who has to fit into the person who is dominant. He has to fit into the, the other guy's world, so to speak. Uh, he has to take a, subserv a servant position in response to the, the master's uh, uh, kind of like uh, exertion, pushing forward of his dominance, right? So when somebody like an American philosopher or American foreign policy analyst comes out with a word like full spectrum dominance, to me, that just spells one thing. They want someone else to be a slave or a cob or a colony in response to American dominance. And that seems to be the entire philosophy that's being forwarded by these people. And it's not logical. It doesn't actually leave any room for the emergence of the slave to freedom. It's, so it's uh, not it's not smart. It's not this logical. Is my, this is my point, uh, I, and perhaps uh, I, I perhaps I need to just investigate that concept of logic. But um, my point is, I wouldn't go to Hegel to come to that conclusion. I'd go to the art of war and the part that the the the, the clear um, function that says 
if you detroit if you spread your forces on every you know to the front to the back to the left and the right then you can't adequately adequately defend anything that simple function almost like a transistor you know uh, uh it's like a gateway it says hey you've just gone through that gateway which you cannot pass through if you try to cover every angle it's simply impossible to do it so for me it doesn't require a philosophical consideration at all that's that's actually my argument in terms of uh, what you're terming logic and i understand words aren't very useful when we're trying to in a linear to, you know I mean, i'm not laying my framework out for you and saying hey look at this part over here this is what you're talking about i'm just simply saying for me that's a switch Right. Well, that, that is, I'd, I'd like to know if you publish something. That, uh, that, well, that, well, that would be. It, it, it's a, it's a, it, yeah, it's a Well, I've, I've got, yeah, it's a, that's a conundrum only because of the nature of the tool. Um, you know, like when I've definitely been using it and very effectively, but the, but it's just how it's shared that becomes a, more of a concern for me. For, for the same reason you talk about, I don't want to be misappropriated in a way that's used to justify things that actually aren't in it you know and so for me it has there's profound philosophical consequences that come from arriving at a tool like this and one of the re one of the things that uh, prevents that happening right now is the interpretation of the complexity of it um and i i mentioned to joseph in a recent discussion that um i i've, uh, I've discovered within this structure what i call uh, a function called structural protection and structural protection is described just in that example you gave with the slaves, uh, full spectrum dominance. I agree, it's an absurd concept. I'm just simply saying it exists. It's a, it's an absurdly present concept in the American military doctrine. Um, and it's absurd because it basically is a certain failure point in strategy because you can't defend every space when you spread yourself thin. It's that simple. So and it's they, a switch. The, 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 weird, the weird Boston. thing is, yeah, the weird thing is that it's coming from this kind of specialist perspective that uh, is entirely military. And yeah. uh, how would you get a ruler to say, oh, we want to be dominant? How do you how do you get that in the mouth of a politician? Um, you did. I think George Bush kind of bought it. He, he was presented to George Bush and he said, yeah, that sounds good to me. Uh, full spectrum dominance. That was 2000, right? That's when he was president. So so it's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, you, 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 it, it can work for a while, but it's going to Philosophically, it's going to fall in some deaf ears eventually, and then, uh, and I don't know. I'm saying what one. Of, I just want to mention to you one of the tools of philosophy is called ontology, mm -hmm. where where you where you basically do what you're doing. You take everything and you reduce it to concepts, and how the concepts interrelate. And uh, so 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 I just wanted to say what you're doing is very productive. It's very progressive. Uh, and I, that's why I wish you good luck with it. And if you do Appreciate publish that. something, let be you know be sure to inform us. Yeah. I, I want to share it in a in a way that uh, brings about its per purposeful use um, in, 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 for good, in a, in a way that is actually for good, because it is about a better way. And so for me, that's also avoiding the very strategic errors that the map tells me to avoid. Which is to just to just to publish in the in the space of academia as if somehow that will be an antidote. It's not. Um, you know, we're very much faced with the Death Star and, and looking for an, an air conditioning duct <laughs> in a lot of ways. And uh, and just on that issue of logic, uh, I just want to address that too because and and yes, I'm aware of ontologies and taxonomies. In fact, I've taken the uh, this uh, art of war strategic framework and applied it to um, a map of philosophy. So I've, in fact, strategically mapped uh, the dominant schools of continental and analytical philosophy to try to find their relationships, their crossovers, where they, where as a yeah. toolkit, they all help us because, of course, the problem is there's so an emerging, we could say the conversation is just beginning to mer emerge a little bit late. It is, uh, it yeah. is emerging, uh, though. I'll, yeah. just, I'll just finish on this point. Um, the um, That issue of logic you raised, um, uh, I think is uh, a particularly interesting one because uh, it's easy to look at logic in terms of you know the perhaps the, the simpler example of electricity I gave, but in but in fact when we look at the conundrum faced in physics between classical physics and uh, 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 quantum mechanics, right? They're both types of logic. They both have uh, logical approaches, and yet they both speak to completely different ways of interpreting the universe. 
and 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 are yet to, it's yet to be resolved uh, the contradictions between those two forms of logic. And similarly, um, if we were to say logic in the term terms of human of the use of human power, because this is what uh, for me this framework's about, is having a tool that in fact uh, um, uh, enables you to see the force, what I call the power force, in much the same way as you see power and electricity. So I add the word power force together to give it a dimension of psychology. And, uh, and one of the problems we have when we look at philosophy um, uh, is the reductionism to, to, uh, to physicality, to the idea mm. that uh, we're just, you know, we're all just uh, ro human robots in some sort of mechanism uh, and that our consciousness, consciousness doesn't count. And so, uh, you know, when you get to dualism and, you know, uh, uh, Nagel, you know, um, uh, am I a bat or get, can I, can I see the world as a bat? You know, like we have this, we have this conflict between psychology and physicality, which hasn't been resolved in philosophy, is not resolved in physics, and yet it's still a logical way of approaching these problems. And so this particular book is a rather unusual book in that it deals almost equally once you map it with both of those concepts, the, the level of quantum mechanical uh, consciousness, the idea that possibility states pop in and out of existence in the way that our mind creates them, and the physicality of classical physics, which denotes particles and objects, you know. Uh, so uh, in, in the same way that the phys physicalism does in, in, the, in, in that um, branch of philosophy. So, so when I say logic, you're right, logic's the word I would you perhaps draw to, but I, I wonder if it's a bit narrow in the way I interpreted you saying it, maybe I misunderstood, but be, yeah. and that's simply because of that, of that um, two consideration. Well, I, I just use the, the sense that some good philosophers have thought that logic was um, a foundation of thinking and that uh, I think Hegel in particular felt like logic was a uh, was a uh, was a kind of uh, description actually of our thinking, not the logic that you learn in a logic course, but uh, a kind of a freed logic that he developed where the negative becomes uh, a necessary step in every uh, syllogism. So we say that something is something, and then we say that something could not be something or is turning into something because of some force where movement is actually causing uh, the feet of the army. Here's the army invading. Here's the army being uh, defeated or deflected into another. Here's the warlords deflecting the army. And then the army has to adjust and become a different strategy army, a kind of an army that merely uh, uh, takes this much territory and not all of the territory or something like that, or is actually rebuffed or canceled out as a result of the intervention of the warlords say. So this is the Hegel concept of logic and uh, which is called the called determinate negation. So I'm just saying mm -hmm. that logic can be thought of not just uh, the Western way, but also in the continental way uh, following Hegel. And uh, the, it's not universally popular, Hegel's conception, but it's used a lot. It's, uh, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a powerful concept, uh, concept in philosophy and, uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it builds upon the other logic, which is uh, all excluded middle, which of course Hegel uses a lot as well. So, oh. so the, so the, uh, so, so yeah, logic in that sense is very powerful. Uh, it could be taken that way as a kind of like a powerful methodology, uh, just like whatever kind of analysis that you're using. I don't doubt that your analysis is also powerful. Uh, you know, and you've just said that it's based a little bit on Nagel, which is fine. You know, so it's, I wish you good luck with that. Oh, well, I think, uh, I think just to uh, make a comment to that, I think you're right. Uh, in terms of the mechanical aspects of uh, the algorithm, I believe that the, uh, the, the you know there's a range of logic tools um, that correspond to be able to interpret um, how those mechanisms work and and uh, uh, you know are deductible. Uh, you can you can deduce things. So 
Uh, and then you, you know, when I refer to switches and gateways and so on, that's pretty much talking about that. But there's also, um, uh, then there's also, and this is where the Nagel aspect comes in, of course, it, it was really Des uh, Descartes that spoke to this um, beyond physicalism, you know, uh, that our consciousness is a separate state. But, but, but I think Nagel, I think in a lot of ways, uh, with, with his uh, essay um, regarding <laughs> can you receive... What's it like to be a bat? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's it's such an insight, isn't it? Because it's such a simple thought experiment and yet so profound. Uh, and the fact that he's a, a 20th century philosopher and, and you know, uh, com often completely underrated in terms of its importance. Um, but yet, it, for me, it's almost a pivot point because what it does is give uh, a perceptible understanding to the concepts Descartes was, was raising. You know, it's not it's no longer than a theoretical discussion. It's one you can completely understand and in fact, you can't almost put these two worlds together once you go through that Pandora's box that Nagel described with the bat. You just can't put them together properly. And that's the same issue with quantum mechanics and, and classical uh, physics, you know. The, and, and to that degree, where we get into the area of human emotion, which in the, in the art of war for me is about half the book, um, then uh, proportionally speaking, um, then, um, uh, but but of course they're all coupled. The the emotional and the mechanical are coupled together. There's no separating. And then when I say half, they're not separate. Uh, it's it, they're completely integrated. But but that that question of consciousness uh, then becomes uh, a, a, a far less um, logically approached uh, or classic. Perhaps I'll use the term classical logic. It's far less of a classical logical consideration because it simply can't be uh, quantified or bounded in that way. When you try to bound it in that way, you're, you're immediately reducing it to a physicalism that escapes the whole point of the consciousness argument. So it's a, it's a tautology, you know, you're not, uh, uh, um, you're, not you're not able to resolve it with, a, with that tool alone, but yet uh, the classical uh, uh, tools of logic do work to describe the mechanical aspects of what the book talks about. I agree with that. And so I, I think the, the um, uh, yeah, and 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 of course, once you start getting into the uh, the quantum mechanical aspects or the the consciousness, and the, you, you're into a space that is far more uh, interpretive and fluid, uh, albeit still governed by forms of logic. Um, you know, but uh, but I, I would perhaps finish on this point, generally speaking, and that is to say, uh, the map is not the territory. Mm. Right, it's these are all abstractions. It's you know, and 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 to whatever degree the tool is that you use, it's an abstraction. It's not the territory. You know, you look at your map, you look at your GPS. Well, it's not the terrain you're in. You know, it's it's an abstraction of that for you to understand how to make decisions to go through the terrain. And so, to the degree by which any abstraction can reflect the reality is is limited by the degrees of abstraction and the low, level of abstraction. And so um, in accepting that as a premise for any abstraction whatsoever, then you accept limitations to whatever tools you use. Um, and so then, the, then it becomes a question of version control. Do I have the best tool that I can currently access? Can I improve the tool? Can I get a better tool if I work on yeah. the tool? Yeah, good you luck know. with that. Yeah, no, I, I, that makes some sense. I, I, I just, uh, uh, the, the only thing I, Oh crap, my screen again. I can't believe it. Usually if I just touch it, it comes back to life. I do appreciate me. this discussion, I, James. I yeah. really do appreciate well, it. Well, you know, I was gonna I was gonna mention um Heidegger's take, uh, you know, is that is that everything is kind of uh based on uh is really based on the way we are, you know, coming into life and uh being a um particular um uh, kind of being, being the kind of animal we are, the person that can imagine that there's a dualism or the person that can imagine that there's a consciousness, uh, mm -hmm. a person who wants to analyze reality and then realize that there's certain limitations and so forth. This, 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 is, a, this is something that confronts all of us because of how we're built uh, and the, the kind of uh, the kind of existence we live as animals, so to speak, uh, you know, and uh, I, I think uh, the the thing is that you're doing, you know, is to confront it, uh, be able to confront it, and to find methodologies that uh, 
lead you towards answers and uh, uh, great aphorisms. You know, the, the map is not the territory, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, these, these are, these are uh, kind of essential. They're just basically, uh, they're roadmaps on, on, on sort of on the way to uh, understanding complex systems. And uh, so I, 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 I applaud you for that. Gonna... It's not my project. My project no, no, is no, no. understanding some of the elemental rules, you know, why it is that Aristotle took off as a philosopher uh, in, in the early Christian belief and, uh, uh, in, you know, in the early monastery, mon monastic uh, study, how it is that um, uh, the, um, you know, how, how these, how these uh, uh, Western, since the Renaissance, how Western thinking changed after the Renaissance and uh, uh, including Descartes. Descartes to me is just an interesting experiment in thinking. It's not good thinking. It's it's just a type of thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've read all of it. You know, I haven't read the, I haven't read the book on philosophy, but I read the uh, the the meditations. And uh, you have to understand the meditations are six different stories, right? About six different stories. Meditation one through six. And the uh, and the uh, and the you know it is scientific philosophy. I think everything, you know, uh, everything is a step along the way. Everything is important, uh, but don't get locked. Like, you know, the only thing, the advice I have is don't be locked into one particular problem. Um, I think I've been through enough to say that I understand the emphasis is in philosophy. I understand where people like Nagel coming from, people like, uh, uh, I understand uh, Hegel's influence. I understand what Hegel said. That's really important. It's not to be in a, an illusion about what Hegel uh, said. Uh, and uh, the uh, yeah, and and to understand this critique of Christianity too is really important to understand how that came about. Uh, maybe starting with uh, Erasmus and. Uh, Spinoza and uh, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, Nietzsche, right? So, mm. you know, sort of like understanding how that came about, the progress, human progress, they're all part, they're all roadways, right? Highways of human progress. So understanding these highways of human progress is, uh, it's, it's, uh, these things are really important. And of course, the history of war no one can deny it. That's why I like this meetup. I like this subject. And I like talking to you, John. And, and, you know, uh, really, uh, uh, I love listening. I loved listening. I mean, you know, it, it was a, it, it is a fabulous conversation. I mean, and it, and I'm looking forward actually to seeing you get something out there, John. I, I think this is, um, it would be a valuable exercise. I mean, you know, they're they're. I've been a lot of military, this is still used by military strategists. I mean, this is still taught, um, you know, as long as they are at war. And it's, uh, you know, it's still, uh, they talk, uh, I know the, um, the general, the two couple of the guys that worked with John Boyd and the Yoda Loop, they did use uh, concepts from it. Uh, especially reorientation, if you think about that, definitely the book gets into that. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think that there's there's a lot of value um, that can be extracted uh, from this book. I think looking at it visually and seeing what the relationships are uh, between, you know, uh, some of the... Uh, I want to call them particulars. What, what would I call them uh, instead of particulars? I, I, I some of the attributes underneath the principles um, would be interesting. Uh, it would be actually interesting in a model as well um, to see what they would they would you know some of the what are the very various connections that could be made. Um, that's just you know that's just my thought. That's my interest. Like. And I yeah. do think that there's a lot there. Um, I and I think visually depicting this work 
Um, it's interesting. I just threw some stuff of it into an AI to see what it would come back with. Uh, it was really not what I wanted, but, uh, <laughs> but AI, like, just tell me, tell me though, John Joseph, did, did the AI destroy the world? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> did it eliminate, you know, eliminate human life? Like they well, say I didn't put will? the whole book. I, I didn't put the whole book in there. If I put if I put chapter eleven in there, I think we would have been it might have been over. Yeah, we um, could I, be in serious I, trouble. Like they it said, was just, it was just it was just a <laughs> just a, I was just like wanted to say, let me see what this looks like, and it came back with paintings, right? Literally paintings of yeah. like soldiers and things like that. Oh. Um, <laughs> But it was, it was, I was expecting like a map, like, you know, and, and I, and it was just, it was not anything I could have even imagined, but uh, it should be the limitations of, of, of where Dolly is, or at least, you know, some of these AIs, but it, it is, um, you know, there are a lot of, there, there are a lot of mail and I have it in storage and analytical framework that i had from um when that that some high level math guys used it in, in, at the in the intelligence communities to make decisions and uh, this book could be if i had that book i would to be part of it could be actually you know integrated with this like some certain scenarios now they actually had some real scenarios in those books um and so uh, I bet you matching up those case studies and this would be a really, really interesting exercise. Um, you know, they, they so uh, in fact, actually, we used it one time. My roommate was uh, going to law school um, and he was in a decision making class that was uh, uh you know basically it was based on negotiation and prob probability and we used that book just to figure out some models to run um and he you know uh you know he wrote a, i gotta say he wrote a paper in a night um uh, for his final but it, it is i mean and all it is is these are typical analytical frameworks you know, typical decision trees, not, you know, not anything too elaborate. Um, that being said, they're simple, but they work. And it would be interesting to see how this, if how these tactics um, could map into this. Um, yeah, it's cool. It is cool. It I really my... it would work. I started my uh, spreadsheet on chapter 11, uh, but I'm not sure if I'm going to, uh, how much sure. time I'm going to have to, well, I'm not sure how much time I'm going to have to finish it. Uh, I got about five, I think uh, Jason's had four or five columns and I've got one more column. I've got, I've got a rule of thumb column and a, um, and an extra, I guess the, uh, oh, method, right? The the uh, which what uh, what media what uh, kind of action to take what method to take so uh, so uh, and uh, there's a lot more in the chapter so I expect to keep building off it there's a lot of extraneous stuff in the chapter I think but uh, the the st you know stuff stuff that maybe complements the uh, list of grounds so uh, I'll get it. I'll I'll see, I'll see I'll see how far I get, uh, but uh, you know I'll pro probably devote a little bit of time to it. My days are getting really interesting. I started my journal in the German language today, so oh, nice. it's getting exciting. Yeah, I'm doing some really nice things. I think that's I think awesome. Just, yeah, that is awesome. It's uh, James. You seem seem like uh, uh, so eclectic in all the pursuits you've got there. It's uh, terrific. That's an understatement. You should see him in the. Uh... Aristotle man, that's, that's right. Cool. Well, and uh, Aristotle's got significant contribution. Uh, Aristotle he, physics, it, yeah, it was like that, but it's all. It's really tough. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It's really it's tough. It's a pre. It's a precursor yeah. to Heidegger, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Hegel and Heidegger were both big on Aristotle. Hegel doesn't talk about Aristotle, but 
it's just exactly the same kind of reading. It, it just, just it tries to match Aristotle in his depth and density. And uh, yeah, that's why Hegel is such a difficult author. He's really imitating, in a way, he's imitating Heidegger. I mean, Aristotle. He's building his logic on Aristotle's logic. Uh, and he's adding on all these other philosophers that came uh, since Kant. Kant. He's, he's adding on uh, people like Leibniz, Kant, um, and uh, 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 there's one other one guy. Fichte was the inspiration for Hegel, you know, like the daddy of idealism, right? And then, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and the, the first philosopher that took idealism really seriously, Kant introduced it, but Fichte was a follower of Kant. And then um, uh, this guy that nobody knows anything about, Jacobi. Jacobi was a Christian that said that ideas come into our mind um, originally, right? In other words, we have original ideas about things like God, right? And so these, these ideas like uh, the ones that cause uh, faith or uh, sincere emotions, things like that, they're coming into our mind kind of uh, uh, immediately was the word, right? The word in German, it's really hard to translate German to English, but the, the word translates immediately. And then Hegel based his philosophy partly on that, that, that we're going to get some things immediately, but even if they're immediate, they also become mediated. They also become, the mind adds stuff. The mind is always adding stuff, according to Hegel. So the, it, it's the mediation that really matters. Uh, we, don't, we don't get anything that is pure, that stays pure. The mind is always adding stuff. We start, we might start with God. We might have an immediate idea of God, but then we add stuff to it to, 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 to turn it into uh, what our actually idea, actual ideas about God is. We can't just leave it in a pure form. Is that a it sounds like, I mean, and I could be way off because I don't understand it, but it's, uh, that this could be related to Chomsky's ideas on lang language or how uh, language emerges. Chomsky was a, Chomsky is a, my, my, my take on Chomsky is that he's a Neoplatonist. He, okay. he, he has given his, he has made speeches on philosophy where he mentions a British Neoplatonist as his inspiration. So you okay. could go into that uh, guy. You could go. You could go study that British philosopher uh, that Chomsky likes, and maybe pick out some ideas of his. Now, whether that British guy was influenced by Hegel, I can't say for sure because I've never I've never read him. Uh, if you want, I'll uh, follow up by yeah. Uh, I'll check to see if I can find the name of that guy for you. That would be wonderful, actually, if you could. Just one we're final, studying language in another group. Yeah, just, just my final thought on a couple of those things that were said there at the end. Uh, um, um, well, actually, I'll just pick up on the Chomsky thing. Uh, in general terms, the philosophy of language and, and linguistics is uh, is an important component of all these things, yeah. one of many. Um, the uh, other thing I'd simply say is that uh, Aristotle, uh, one of the significant contributions I believe he made uh, to the consideration of this strategic map um, is poetics. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that might be perhaps uh, off the beaten track, but I'll just hang that one out there for some, re some reflective thought over time. And uh, um, I would say that um, um, what this tool, I guess what the tool for me is, is not, it's not a philosophy in and of itself. It's not. Uh, it, what it is, is it's a, a vessel. It's a it's a vessel with a series of um, uh, actions that the vessel performs uh, that helps to understand other things. So, um, so it's a, a series of containers. I, I would pose that question. You know, it'd be interesting if you could pose that question to Quan. I think he would differ with you on that. Whether that it is a philosophy. Oh. Uh, uh, I, I, Perhaps I should clarify is to say the framework I derive from the philosophy, okay. uh, because uh, I'm not suggesting it's not a philosophy in its original form. I'm saying the tool I've derived from that is not a is not a is not a philosophy in its own right. But okay, 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 okay. That makes a lot more sense. A vessel with a series of containers 
uh, for the consideration of wicked problems. And then um, I, I would perhaps go to, uh, I think it's importance uh, is uh, described probably the best in uh, Kant's, uh, Emmanuel Kant's um, categorical imperative. So the idea that, you know, uh, you have to have certain principles that are met when you're coming up with uh, approaches. Um, and when we talk about a lack of a, you know, a systematic framework for the consideration of power, human, the use of power amongst humans uh, in politics and culture, um, you know, a, a series of switches and, and circuitries that would enable us to see uh, the dark arts of, of politics in a transparent way um, is uh, relies on whatever that tool being, even in its first version of, you know, meeting the, the, the categorical imperative. Uh, and one of my one of the difficulties I have with philosophical thought in general terms is that the um, the lack of and of course understandably given that that the categorical the categorical imperative wasn't the starting point for philosophical thought but came came along quite late in the piece all things considered um, the um, 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 a lot of philosophical thought um, either doesn't doesn't really meet the burdens of the categorical imperative, or um, is uh, internally uh, is not uh, internally consistent, right? So, uh, and perhaps I'll finish on this only because, and this might be, a, uh, I might be poking the bear to say this, but I noticed uh, only because I joined the meetup very recently. But you guys are chatting about Buckminster Fuller, and mm, I was uh, thinking about that. Go ahead. And, and that's a classical example for me of uh, of now. Plenty of stuff in, in all of his material that it makes you know substantial contributions, no doubt about that. And yet, at a first principles level, don't believe that he he meets the burdens of the categorical imperative. And so, um, you know, the the fundamental starting point of the integrity of individuals and the way that that's measured is so internally inconsistent <laughs> that there's no way that the deriv that the derivations of that philosophy I can put any stock in beyond it's cultural contributions to thinking. You know, yeah, it doesn't make you think about stuff, sure. Is it interesting? Sure. Is, is his systematic approach to looking at these problems of any use? No, completely hopeless. It creates a whole bunch of uh, jargon and, 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 and diagram, a whole bunch of systematic ways of looking at things which don't accord to the reality at all and really just seek to distract you from finding out what that is. And that, um, but man, I'm being a bit unfair to him, uh, sure, but at the same time, if you're trying to find a circuitry for looking at, you know, a, a vessel, a series of containers that can try to peer into the dark arts of politics and, and, and the use of power amongst human beings, and you're going to take a systematic approach by definition, then it's got to meet the, it's got to it's got to meet the burdens of the categorical imperative, uh, and 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 be internally self consistent, uh, and for that reason, the art of war. Uh, is unusually the case that it is that if you look at it in a pattern form. And that's the fascinating part for me about what it offers is that um, um, uh, where Buck, where Buck, Buck Mr. Minster Fuller's approach to systems thinking is not internally consistent in, in my read of it, not even close, uh, maybe internally consistent with his continued descriptions of using rather distracting terminology and things that don't match up particularly well to the real world that we encounter anyway. Yeah, it's consistent in its confusion, but not consistent in any sort of application. Uh, and, uh, uh, and to that degree, I look at this tool in the art of war and go, there is actually a consistency in this that does stack up because it does meet the, the burden of the categorical imperative. And I think that um, that is probably the pivot point for me. And, uh, and so it's much more of a tool so when you talk, Joe, about taking those other um, uh, frameworks or the other, uh, you know, situational um, scenarios, case studies, plugging them in, yeah, that's precisely what I was, you know, I'm hoping to achieve by using the tool. Uh, and of course, then the final part of that conclusion is that if you take the notion of the better way, that is to make progress, to to apply that same categorical imperative to the application of the framework that is okay i've got this tool now version one as crude as it is how do i apply it well if i apply it using the old ways of application discourse amongst 
people talking about philosophy. Well, that's not going to be a better way because that's the current way. That's no. not a better way. So, so part of the difficulty, I, I really enjoy these conversations because they're probing, okay? And they're, so they do, uh, the, the, you know, and, and they're also communal, all right? They're, they're a great bunch of people sharing this stuff, which is a, is a, a lovely thing to participate in. Um, uh, one of the difficulties is that um, the language by definition is a pretty crude way to try to work through things. And so you talk about plugging it into AI, looking for a, for a diagram or a map, and that's why we have maps. And, you know, just on that point, you know, I've got dozens of philosophical books that have the word ontology, um, taxonomy, and roadmaps on them, and not a diagram in them. I hate that. I hate that. Right. Right. Yeah, I was going to I was going to agree with you on uh, Buckminster Fuller. I uh, I read one of his books when I was in uh, high school, I guess, and uh, it uh, I, I didn't uh, I just wanted him to explain why it was that uh, um, I was just waiting for him to explain why it was that things made out of polygons were so great, but he never. <laughs> he got that. Yeah, so well, it's just kind of, kind of left me cold. <laughs> I'll disagree with you guys on that, but and he has built things so in the real world. So I mean, he has. But I mean, any. He's I mean, Donald Trump. <laughs> for for me, for, you, you go, James. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was just I was just interrupting and I'm trying to be funny, sir. So. Uh -oh. uh, that no, no, good. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm kind of tired. Did you have something anything else you want to add, John? I'm, I think I'm ready to. I was just going to say, for me, it's the Fuller is an American Michelangelo. You know, he's a, uh, he's a, a, a multifaceted creator of things and, and, you know, often interesting and some of them silly. And, and you know, so you can't deny his intellectual uh, curiosities and forces and I'm not suggesting for a moment there aren't significant contributions he's made in elements of his text. I'm just saying at first principles, it doesn't stack up. And uh, for that reason, it's a commentary on things, but it's not a, a tool to resolve things with, uh, in my mind. And, and if you try to then take your systematic approach to a range of issues, it's uh, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, you can do it, but then what are you left with? Some sort of shoehorned new creation <laughs> that's the sum of two parts that doesn't describe either the abstraction or the territory. So for me, the only use of a of a map is 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 that it is it has some practical direct reflection in abstraction of the real terrain. There's no point having a map that doesn't in any way account for the terrain. It's not a map. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah, a map. No, I, think... I, I would like to talk about this further if you get to some point with you both of you guys. I you know because this is something that's interesting. I think the fact that he relies on principles alone is is a is a it shows you now whether those principles work or not, but I, I do think they do in specific certain uh, circumstances. Um, they may be worded, not necessarily like it's clear, that's for sure. But but I do think that there are principles that it that um, he holds that do work within systems that can be applied generally. Uh, what what I said there to be specific was that there were elements that that uh, were consistent, had had some consistency, but I said he didn't meet the burdens of the categorical imperative, and that's quite a specific statement. What I mean by that is you can't apply it universally. You might you might be able to use it in a range of scenarios, but it can't be applied universally. You know, I can use Ohm's law universally in in my consideration of the force of electricity, right? That's a universal application. It's repeatable. Okay, so part of the problem I have with the totality of his works, um, rather than the selective aspects where you say, hey, there's some value in that. I think part of part of doing any discernment of any school of thought is to be able to uh, recognize the virtues and the and the values of whatever is off, you know, put, takes us forward in progress of thinking. So, you know, I'm not writing it off as good or bad. I mean, it's so simplistic. I, I wouldn't dare do that, but I, but it doesn't meet the burdens of the categorical imperative. And, uh, and for me, uh, that's a really important thing if you want to try to find a universal system for the um, consideration of how humans use power between themselves in politics and culture, uh, because mm. uh, to influence the state of affairs, because it's known as the dark art, dark art of politics. Why is it a dark art? Because, because it's uh, intangible. 
So to make, you know, make what is intangible tangible it needs to be universal. Otherwise, it's merely uh, um, uh, uh, maybe passing fat is unfair. But, you know, how, how often do we have different ways of describing the same thing that comes along with fashions? It happens in the world of marketing all the time. And so I just think that that's not a use. They're, they're not useful philosophical tools if they're not able to be applied universally. That's all. Uh, and also, um, 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 you know, the, the other two aspects of the categorical imperative, I won't speak to them right now, but I guess the universal aspect is the fundamental starting point. If you can't get past that, you don't even get to the next two. And so, and one of the reasons for me uh, that the art of war um, in, a, in a structural sense, or perhaps the derivative works from the art of war to be fair, um, that, that I, I've worked on offered me that potential when I saw it, the pattern was simply that it has that structure that says very simply that, uh, you know, warfare is the greatest affair of the state and it must be uh, thoroughly considered because it leads to uh, essentially prosperity or extinction, and, you know, uh, victory or defeat. But now, when you apply that to the concept of conflict of any type, conflict on a sports field, conflict in business, conflict in your personal life as an individual, because we're in conflict with our environment all the time with everything around us. We're essentially in conflict. Now, the better way tells us that if we can somehow um, not go to war with those conflicts, <laughs> which is what the book is about, and in fact can peacefully coexist by avoiding conflict, Maybe. well, that, that's fundamental. That's a universal principle that says to me, this book about war, in fact, talks about how to avoid war by virtue of discussing the, the methods of war. You use the methods described on how to win a war to win the war of not fighting the war, if I could put it that way. <laughs> well, maybe we need to play more of our projects or con our games, games, games or projects even, as uh, life and death matters. In other words, uh, I've kind of in a way I've learned to do that. I do, do my projects hmm. very seriously and I try to drive them towards completion. Although I probably am still a little too oriented towards doing multiple projects at one time. I'm not a kind of like, here it is out the door. You already asked me, how soon will I read, uh, finish reading uh, the, uh, the, uh, the concept of politics? And I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say on the outside, probably six months because uh, I'm really interested in reading it uh, now. But on the other hand, um, the, 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 if we just take things, like I, I, I play poker, and you know that show. Uh, so I play poker uh, as a hobby and uh, pretty good at it. And I realized one of the, my biggest, uh, one of my biggest flaws is not, uh, not avoiding death, not avoiding sudden death situations, not avoiding, because uh, I play tournaments, so probably better at tournaments mm -hmm. than I am live uh, cash. But uh, so I don't, don't uh, that's my biggest weakness is not avoiding the uh, death, death, death situation in the tournament or um, situation uh, where you're being bluffed in a, uh, or could be bluffed, let's put it that way, in a cash game. And um, the, uh, the, the thing, and these are, this is one of the problems in poker, and uh, the books describe it as a probability calculation, which is kind of like weird because I always take the calculation at the, I seem to take the calculation at the wrong time, or I don't take it seriously enough, but maybe in life, everything we do needs to be taken that way a little more. In other words, what if you had to do something at work and uh, it would be your existence or your life or something like that if you didn't do it? Or what if uh, uh, in raising your kids, you know, uh, each of your kids, you didn't handle each situation carefully enough, as carefully as you should have, uh, you know, and that was kind of like a life or death kind of situation. I think in one of my, in the case of one of my children, that was true. So I have three kids. Uh, so, so I think uh, you got to look at it. You, maybe you got to look at everything a little bit this way. Uh, is that uh, things can absolutely go absolutely bad uh, because of a uh, miscalculation, and you need to take it that seriously that. Uh, I got to do this project exactly right. I can't fail it. And it, sometimes it's like too easy to get things right. I mean, part of my life is like coasting along. In other words, 
uh, playing an instrument, always playing the instrument better than I did a week ago or mm -hmm. two weeks ago. You know, always always playing better than I was, and I, I and and taking that. I was I was taught in a book I read. Always always measure your progress two weeks apart. Always find that figure out how what you can do two weeks later better than you did two weeks before. And it turned out eventually I kind of realized, well, this is actually one week. I can always play better one week after, later than the week before. So it's, you know, I thought, well, the book is wrong, you know. Um, but but mm. the but the and it's the same thing in uh, engineering. You 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 have a problem, you work towards solving the problem, you solve it in a few hours or a day, uh, worst case, two days. Worst case in programming, you wake up, you go, get, you go to bed with a problem, you wake up in the morning knowing the solution. It's really weird. Right. <laughs> so, so it's like, uh, uh, it's like kind of like uh, uh, the, 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 the solutions become fairly easy. The, the, the particular task that has to be solved can be solved in a can be done in a finite amount of time and you can usually uh, work it out and do it um, and uh, uh, some people actually in software live like heroes so they, they they kind of like think oh yeah I'm going to work today and I'm going to do all this stuff you know I'm going to accomplish it and I'm going to be a hero at the end and they develop these big ego egos because of it right? That's that 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 kind of like uh, possibility of solving problems and uh, that other right. people can't figure out. You know? So it's it's uh, it's like uh, it's really, uh, but 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 I think all of life is like that. You either have to be able to coast through it and get it done exactly on time and understand the rhythm of it. In other words, I can do it right now in these two hours or these four hours, or I can go to bed tonight and tomorrow morning I'll, I'll know what I'm going to do tomorrow that will solve that problem. So uh, you could either get to that kind of like level. This is for true for, I think, writers too. Authors also, I think, use that kind of concept. You get, you, you have a particular character conflict or something like that. You go to sleep, you wake up, you keep writing, and you've solved the problem. So. So I think that's kind of like what it is. That's part of the creative process. We have to be able to figure out a finite rhythm for thinking through things. And uh, that's how we get from one problem to the solution. And if it's not a solution, if it's something like a chess game where you have a 50% chance of losing or a poker game, you know, then then it becomes kind of like, well, the problem is that we don't understand this 50% nature well enough. We have to always be conscientious about the 50% aspect of, of poker or chess or whatever we're doing um, that involves pure chance. So uh, we we understand that problem, we, we understand that chance probability, then we can actually uh, if that's different from the pure creative process, the, right. the, yeah. So the it's pure, yeah, it's not really interesting though. I, I just uh, made me think of that. There, there's that sort of separation in reality between the pure creative process and the um, and the uh, in which problems are almost always solvable. And I would say logically, but you could say that's the wrong word. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but. Sure. Uh, but 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 you, but you also have this uh, chance situation that occurs in games of, of chance like chess and chess. Chess uh, checkers. Uh, uh, what what's the other one? Uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, poker, etc. Yeah. I think what you just said there, James, was uh, um, quite profound, actually, because. Uh, um, oh, war! I forgot. War. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it comes war. Oh, I think what you I think what you said was really I was actually quite, just assuming that. Yeah, I, uh, it was very, I missed it. <laughs> uh, very profound, uh, especially the, the 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 notion of the poker game. Uh, only because as you were describing it, for some reason I was imagining a a, a poker table in a casino in Las Vegas. There, uh, knowing that's yeah. where you've come from, and and you know, and 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 I'm going to say two things on that and come back to. Perhaps uh, why I mentioned Aristotle's poetics, um, because 
because too often we, and this is that issue of, of the, of the um, uh, psychological versus the mechanics again, um, too often we seem to place ourselves into uh, viewing the pro the, our experiences, the difficulties we're facing, the conflicts, in that probability space, which can be mechanically measured, uh, as you said, 51% is better than, is, is means you've got a chance of success, 49 means you don't, 70 is better than 51. Um, you, yes, you have that probability space. And yet, and yet, that's the, that's, the, that's the winning of the poker game. But you know what? That's not the story of the poker game. <laughs> That's not that's not the experience of the poker game. Well, it's like it's what the experience is kind of. I don't know if you play poker, but uh, the for me the experience is a little bit like uh, uh, it's uh, it's basically uh, getting getting the strategy strategic getting all the strategic moves correct and uh, and uh, understanding. Of course, uh, you have to always understand odds and uh, work out correct strategies, uh, winning strategies. Yeah, so there's a lot of, there's an awful lot of calculation involved. It's just like what uh, Sun Tzu talks about. I, I, get the, I get the ludic appeal of, of, of that approach. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Of course I do. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, what, that's what the experience is like. In other words, not, you're, that, you're, you're doing the all these calculations and uh, acting. That's not the experience, James. In a kind of an ethically correct way, you know, like, uh, but, 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 but then at the end, you know, uh, you can do a donkey move, what they call a donkey. Uh, you, you call it. You, I, I, I was actually playing. I was actually playing a night ago, and uh, I had the uh, I had the, uh, the donkey the donkey straight right, the the low end of the straight, and uh, I, I sure enough I called a bet and. Uh, so it's in other words, you can be all plugged in to all of these correct strategies and moves and stuff, and then in, a, in an instant you can kind of like not maybe lose your focus. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, I've got to, I've got to um, distinguish what I was saying there because I because I because I can see you got caught into the enjoyment of the. I, I, yeah, that's right. It's very enjoyable. That's right. Yeah, the, the, Especially when you're the, really hot. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see from the way you go about thinking about things, you know, the, the, as I said, the ludic appeal, the game playing appeal of playing literally the game of poker in a competitive way. And yet it's not the story. It's not the story because the story is the is this person called James, who I haven't met for a couple of meetups, walking into some location that I don't know about. But you've told me a bit about it, enough for me to get a little bit of a visual, not, not accurate at all. But in my mind's eye, yeah. I can see poker table and opponents. I can see a sense of thrill when you get the when you get the considerations right and the probabilities fall your way and the excitement that comes from it or the, the sense of satisfaction. But the but the story is your journey to the poker game, your 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 playing of the poker game, the the drama we see in sport. It's not the movement of the ball and the goals that's scored and the and the plays that's run. As much as all that stuff's fascinating, especially when you look at NFL or. You know all the, you know, the the hundreds of different moves they've got and all plays and everything, but yet it's the drama, isn't it? The drama of an individual who succeeds beyond uh, all, uh, you know, beyond an injury he was never going to come back from, or or a champion quarterback who's had such a streak of victories that is superhuman. Can it possibly continue? A Michael Jordan who who changes the game single handedly by by using these mechanics that you speak of in the ludic fashion, but yes, it does something superhuman with them that speaks so much more to the human experience and the psychology. The okay, I'll, let you, I'll let you know if I get to Michael Jordan's level. <laughs> <laughs> but, but where, I'm going, where I'm going with that is to try to say, look, um, yes, it's true that you can say in a, in a poker game sense that there's a, 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 a you know, possibility space that has probabilities of victory and you could use this very tool that I've talked about as Sun Tzu's algorithm to try to better measure um, those possibilities in a strategic way. That's true. And yet it also speaks to the psychology of what that is. And, and perhaps if I could paint a couple of hypotheticals to make my point, imagine if, um, imagine if the contest was one you could enjoy all the time. Imagine we lived 200 years in advance. There was no requirement for work. 
robots did all the functional mechanic, all the functional production that we required to live as human beings. Our life was entirely entirely social, and the story was in fact not really winning the poker game, but sharing the experiences with as many different poker players in in your life as you can. You know, a community of poker players worldwide that you spend your life journeying to meet because you happen to like the ludic interactions of that game, and yet and then the consequences of that game. Uh, in fact, have far less import in that environment. It doesn't matter if you win money or not. Your income's guaranteed because we no longer have um, uh, the requirement to work. We all get income from the robots, you know, that's given to us to, to have all of our needs met. Um, there's the, We don't have relative scarcity any, anymore. We've solved those problems. And, in, and, in, and imagining in a world like that, that might only be 50 to 100 years up the track if we're able to uh, get through the, the existential crises we face as a race at the moment, you can imagine that it's the story that counts, not the mechanics of the probability of victory. No. And, and to that degree, um, the, the movement from warfare producing conflict of winners and losers to an environment where the stories of people are the most important and preeminent thing that we do. Because we have no need for physical conflict. The conflict becomes the conflict of stories. The highest oh, yeah, form... Yeah. No, poker, poker play, even though poker is a little bit boring, uh, poker players are generally happy. You know, in other words, they wouldn't be playing if it wasn't kind of like a happy time, uh, you know, in one way or another. Uh, you ever work, walk out sad because you lose money? That's right. In other words, when you, that's the, that's the problem. It's, 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 it's like I like reading philosophy um, much more than I like playing poker. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, the, the uh, so poker is kind of like just a side item, you know, and and but since it is a side item, I want it to be profitable. So uh, and I, I I know that it can be profitable, has been profitable. Uh, the uh, the the problem with the um, the problem with the uh, the tournaments is only ten percent of people are winners, ninety percent are losers. So. So I have to survive for a number of hours, four or five hours, right? So you're there four or five hours. And if you, if you, go, you go four or five hours, you get into the winning circle. You get uh, in the top, uh, if it's uh, 150 people uh, in, the, in the entries, then you're, you, 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 you're probably the top 20 or 25 are going to get paid. So, um, the, so this, uh, uh, yeah, so this, uh, that's this necessity to sort of get paychecks. Last Friday, I got a paycheck. I got, I got paid. Uh, so, so you, you that that's really that's part of the satisfaction. You don't want to sort of like go on a losing streak where you're just losing money. And why are you doing it if you're just losing money? So, uh, yeah. So that's that's all. I don't. I, I you, you don't want to be a habitual loser. You want to make sure that the strategies you're using are correct. Uh, satisfaction comes through winning, not through losing consistently. Uh, I see that same thing in chess vet videos. I see some chess players that are extremely happy, make very happy, but they're also extremely competent, you know, like really competent grandmasters. Mm. And uh, because they're very competent, either because they're teaching, they're very happy because they're teachers, or because they're very happy because they're challenging people to play games and winning the games. Um, the people who play tournaments um, in chess, I don't think they're, they don't look quite as happy. Uh, tournaments are a lot of problems because they're playing against the best and every right. move is almost, almost every move is a problem at a certain level. So uh, yeah, so I mean like at certain levels, every move can be, be, be like a problem. And I see that even with the really happy players that uh, do do videos, uh, they they uh, they they're talking and talking and talking, you have a good time, but then all of a sudden, holy smokes, I didn't think about that, you know. So, so they have they have to confront a problem. Uh, yeah. So so the, so the joy has to meld has to blend in with concentration, uh, intense concentration, and. Uh, the uh, that this this intense concentration is uh, relieved. I know in, in in poker, it's relieved by mathematics. You use mathematics to sort of make your job easier, 
And this is what Sun Tzu is talking about. If you use mathematics in the strategy of war, you will, you will, uh, uh, things, things better work outcomes out better for you. Ways. You have better outcomes, yeah. I guess where I was heading with that was to try to uh, move to the psychological aspect of, of the book and to describe the notion that, um, and, and this is perhaps the, the, the question of the better way, the, human, the, the notion of human advancement, is to get beyond winners and losers. And, and how do we do that? Well, when you think, because it's all about the paradigms of-, of Who wants the, that? Who wants that? You know, the other thing is- the other well, thing Hang is, on, you've got to let me finish that point to answer it. Um, uh, it's not a question of who wants, who wants that. It's a question of how is it bounded. Okay, so huh? what I mean, what I mean by that is huh? that I'm not suggesting we do away with winners and losers. I'm suggesting that it's bounded in a different form. Okay, so so what does that mean? Well, that means that um, notwithstanding that uh, the the work that they put in, anyone who re reaches the echelons of uh, of professional sport is a winner. They get paid. Significant amounts of money. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, some won't, yeah. Win, some yeah. won't win to the level of a Jordan. They might just win to the level of being in the league. Yeah, but they're yeah. all winners. Doesn't matter if they win or lose the games. Well, only to the degree of their reputation and 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 yeah. and, the, and the relative measure of how much of how much they win, not whether they're winners in fact by just getting into the league. And so, my point yeah. simply is that uh, in the context of human progress. At the moment, we see winners and losers very much as losers don't get anything anyway. And yet, if you think about um, poetics, Aristotle's poetics and the very notion of of stories, um, well, we can watch we can watch a we can watch a tragedy in a in a in a theatre or on a film, and that could be as entertaining as as a comedy or a, you know a, a drama. It can be it can be a sad film. And yet the participants playing the sad roles can do such a good job of telling that story. They're also winners doing something that's really sad and in well, fact, depicting loss. And, and the, point yeah. I'm trying to make, okay. the point I'm trying to make, point I'm trying to make is that the multi-level, we don't focus enough on human stories. And I'll, I'll finish on this no. point. In these uh. chats that we're having, every time, James, you talk about a personal experience, like you playing poker, or Joe, when you spoke about your memorial and what happened there when we last spoke, you know, every time I we share a personal story about, uh, you know, I talk about Australia and some of the things going on here from my perspective as opposed to just the mechanics of it, it's so much more engaging. It seems to be whenever we get to the stories of our lives and share those, those things, even though they might be um, uh, also stories about mechanics of, of considerations of other domains, it's actually the stories we share between each other that are the most vital. And at the moment, we've got a society because of scarce resources um, uh, that's based on the notion that we, uh, we, we, we create competition that's unbounded. And, uh, you know, the 40 hour work week, as much as that's still followed, is a bounding of competition. Hey, we'll compete within certain times. Footballers, footballers, it football wouldn't be much, uh, much of a career if every day they had to rock up to the field and play a game eight hours a day. They played five games every week, eight hours a game, right? Not much of a, not much of a career, right? But they don't, they play for two hours on, on, you know, once, well, in Australia, it's once a week. I don't know if you play two or three times a week over there, what I know basketballers do. So the point I'm making is it's the bounding of the winning and losing uh, that in fact uh, speaks to the progress of, of the human condition. And, and so to that degree, James, when we talked about warfare and, uh, you know, the, when the book itself, the original book of Art of War talks about warfare, yes, it's talking about battles. But as we progressively move up the scale from armies and cities to, to you know, plans and alliances, uh, where we're moving away from the physical into the conceptual. And the more we move into the conceptual away from the physical, which will certainly be the case when we have robotics and AI doing a lot more of the manual labor that we do now, um, then, of course, it's going to be about stories. It's going to be about the stories that we tell, the experiences we share. It's not going to be about the things that we make per se. There'll be lots of things helping us make it. Though that will be part of our story. I guess what I'm trying to do is to uh, overlay with the psychological uh, the notion of, of a narrative, of, of the story. You know, so much of Sun Tzu's treatise is talking about unifying eyes and ears and deception and all the rest. And yet 
I go, well, every time I watch a film, I'm deceived. I'm deceived by actors portraying roles. <laughs> um, there's there's more to the, there's more to the consideration of the psychological than the than, and and this is where the paradigm of the book is interesting to me because it speaks of a better way. So as you start to work through these thought experiments as ex, uh, thought experiments as you're compelled to if you're trying to do this, as I, I was compelled to when I was doing this work, I had to, and so. I'd keep coming back to well, what does that mean to how these things are depicted. So, in terms of how we, how this work shared, uh, sharing it in a in a in a in an essay form, in a book form, <laughs> uh, you know, is is just using the old way. It's not using a better way. Uh, telling stories, uh, using using it to tell mutual stories with other people, which then in a karate kid way. Remember the old wax on wax off, paint yeah. the fence, polish the car. Remember that. That scene, um, you know, uh, he didn't teach him karate. He taught him, uh, yeah. uh, you know, chores, and then he learned karate. And so it strikes me that it strikes me, and this is, I guess, where I've got to in terms of my project is that so much the, the way this is best brought forth is through a karate kid method of training by telling stories, uh, which then allows mm -hmm. access to the information. So, uh, I. Your poker story is a great time. Sounds like a. But a, a, okay, I, I I kind of agree with you, and I, I think I, I gave you a story that was a little bit downbeat, and uh, I just wanted to sort of like remind you that he in the, among these basketballs, these rich basketball players, there are people that are at the bottom of their league, uh, not sure. only in not only in the the team placement, not only in the team having a low record, but also in their personal. Uh, evaluation so so these people are a little less happy than the michael jordans the michael the michael jordans you know like are just like basically understand you know that they can influence a game almost every time they play and then down at the bottom of the league it's like all this work to develop themselves to this high level uh, sort of like seems to be for naught because they're losing all their games they're thrown in with a, a team that can't seem to win games, or they're actually seeing their own skills being diminutive, diminutive compared to some of the stars on the other teams. So, so this is a kind of like a, a less happy experience. So I just wanted to mention that there is equal unhappiness in any competition. There's almost an equal amount of unhappiness or losing situations or losing propositions as there are to winning situations and 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 winning propositions uh, that, yes, that yes. create that create the satisfaction that create the levels of satisfaction and happiness uh, that are responsible for creating levels of satisfaction and happiness. It's true payday is a happy day. But at the same time when you watch these players on these teams, they don't look as happy. As the as the teams that are actually working together and scoring uh, no, you're absolutely, games, you're absolutely correct. And I'll put it back to something Joe said earlier in an earlier discussion, uh, which is yeah, you, you're describing a Nash equilibrium. I understand that. Um, and 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 what you're talking about is tournaments. You know, it's a tournament example, which results in a Nash equilibrium. Now, from a psychological perspective, uh, I'm not sure that the unhappy, uh, lowly paid player. Is any any more unhappy than the Michael Jordan who has to bust his balls at a superhuman level to achieve what he achieves with the money? Uh, I I'd disagree. Say, I completely oh, disagree. Okay, hang on, hang on. I I'm completely saying, disagree. I don't know. When I watched that documentary about the Chicago Bulls and the psychological issues that were borne by him, the disruption, you know, like there was a lot of issues that were political because of his drive, the way he dragged those people. And, and now, and they were they were all appreciative, but there was also this standoffishness, the cost of leadership, let's call it that. And uh, um, the loneliness of leadership, and um, and and I would simply make the final point by saying that yes, um, uh, two points. I I understand using a tournament example with an Nash equilibrium isn't the best way to make my point, but I would finish by saying the only way to escape a Nash equilibrium is to change the game. <laughs> so the point I'm making is that in, now in Australia we've got a professional football league called AFL, and they're moving at the moment to a model. Um, where they're considering uh, like a retirement package for every player who actually makes the league. So then they get some sort of, uh, you know, uh, retirement pension after because of the issue of concussion and issue of injury. So they're basically given um, 
uh, so, uh, support income from the from the league forever in perpetuity for the rest of their life, right? Now, if you had a league that did that with all players just upon entry, well, then you're changing the game. You're escaping the, the strict Nash equilibrium you spoke of in, in quite rightly pointing out what you did point out in terms of the differential in, in terms of the strategies, the happiness, or, you know, winners and losers, right? Uh, and at the same time, the only escape to a Nash equilibrium is to change the game because then it's not it's not the same game. You're not even in the same boundary. If, if a professional sport changes the game by virtue of a per, uh, an income in perpetuity to all participants that get to the league and qualify, let's say, by playing uh, uh, five games, maybe. You know, after you play five games, you automatically get the minimum amount. It's the same amount for everyone. It's not based on skill. If you're extra skillful, you get the endorsements, all the other stuff that people who are successful get beyond that. Well, I, I like the socialist aspect. I just think that uh, it, it sounds a little bit uh, socially engineered. You know, it well, sounds like is, social I, engineering. Well, you know, we're going to solve problems of yeah. unhappiness in sports by Hang protecting on. the health and welfare of the players. Well, it makes you got, sense. You got, you got player drafts, though. The very act of putting players into a draft and letting teams select players on a, on a socialist basis based on reverse performance to, to equalise equalize mm. the distribution of players. That's capitalist. Uh, That's capitalist. Choosing players because of performance. That's just simply putting a value on their head and admitting I, them I, I, to... I might be talking about two different draft systems. In the Australian Football League, the yeah. way it works is uh, the players go into a draft order, right, um, uh, and, and they do that. Yeah. They do that by virtue of statistics. That is, they do, they do running exercise, jumping, and a series of exercises for telemetry. They get ranked, and then the, the team that perform worst in the league gets the first draft pick. So the, the order of selection in the draft goes in reverse order to the success of the teams in the previous That's year. How every draft works. Oh. It is it is the same in America. Oh, yeah, in every draft. Yeah. Well, here it's That's based on history. There's not. I don't think. I don't. I don't think the telemetry is that important. I think it's because history. Like, um, no, the reverse order he's talking about with the draft. We don't have. We don't have a college football league. You know, you guys have got college leagues, so you're yeah, it's different. Yeah, so that's you right. have, we have college we have feeder leagues. leagues. We don't have a feeder league. Okay, so so our players come from sort of local leagues in a distributed way that don't compete in, as a as a lower level to the main leagues. Right. So then they they get looked at more from a statistical perspective because they're new players entering into the league. Makes sense. Yeah. But that reverse ordering where you're letting the worst team pick the best player in a in a loop that repeats it's a socialist process. Otherwise, you'd say why can't we just let the teams bid for the but most money wins like Premier League and soccer? Most money oh, gets okay. the best players. So there's a lottery. A there's a lottery to it. There's a lottery aspect to it. The Premier League. Oh, well, to, I mean, uh, to who they can take, they have to. They, they, they. I guess what the the way it works in uh, American lotteries is usually the the American uh, drafts is usually they uh, they have to rotate, and that the team with the lowest score the previous year gets the more gets the most first picks. So yes. the, the teams with higher scores, uh, you got the higher higher records get uh, second picks and so on. Yeah, yeah, correct. Reverse order of previous season performance. We in, and I'm sure it's the same in America. The teams are then allowed to trade picks, so they can say, "I'll trade one of my first picks for a, a third and a fifth pick." You know, so they can they can then trade their their prioritizing. Yeah, uh, we picks. do the same thing. Yeah. So, same. but the point I'm making is that that is essentially a socialist process because in in, in Premier League soccer, um, it's simply the team with the most money buys the best players. And and and, and that's the capitalist system at work in terms of draft picks. To, to uh, push it's, not, it's not a socialist process, actually, because it depends on the system that they're functioning in. So in other words, if the teams have revenue sharing, which the NFL does, that, that would be considered a socialist model. And that works for the firm overall, because actually any team at any point in time can actually be good whereas dominant market teams like the yankees or whomever in baseball can have astronomical payrolls now that mathematics has helped level off the player play playing field but it's not necessarily um uh it it, it gets into uh what can the salary be paid yes you get the first pick but you can't keep that pick 
essentially mm-hmm. because that pick that pick ends up playing well, then they'll just go to a higher salary team or a team that can pay more. You don't have salary caps on your teams in Australian football. Every team they has have a- luxury taxes in basketball. They have caps in football. They don't have a cap in baseball. Yeah, we have a cap in football where every team can only pay the same amount of money to the entire team. Then they get to choose how much to pay different players and they can mix it up that and way. Even if you have a cap, the the way the NFL works is at revenue sharing, which is different. So they all partake in the contract with the TV contract. So it's like, you know, that that each team is going to get paid out of this. So they, that's why a franchise like... Uh, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, could be worth as much as one in New York. Uh, so that's where it's an interesting model. It, it's a very interesting model. Um, we, we, because we, have, we have an equalization fund here in Australian football where the league distributes a, a license fees to all the teams. So then the poorer teams uh, are not economically worse off, but the wealthier teams can, in fact, uh, use the extra money they make to, you know, pour back into resources. They just can't get more leverage with players. They can't pay players more and things like that. I guess what I'm trying to say in the discussion of this going from poker to stories to professional sports is to say that it's not strictly socialist, but you'd have to agree that these uh, uh, counteracting measures of sharing wealth, um, allowing the worst team to pick the best players in a draft, these things are not strictly capitalists in their construction. The Premier League that says, hey, no limit to how much you spend on the salary cap. The best teams can buy the best players. The same five clubs at the top of the league every year, which is part of the reason they do this in professional sports, because they understand they maximise the game's revenue, the more people that watch. And, of course, they if you have everyone watching, because every five years there's a chance they can go from the bottom to the top, then across all cities you're going to have many more viewers. If you let the same five teams prevail in a capitalist way, like like, you know, the companies in an oligopoly market, then those teams spectators watch and everyone else has a passing interest. They don't watch with the same fervour or interest that the sport itself doesn't make as much money uh, in totality. So yeah, it's but an... It's, a, it's, a, it's, the theory, it's a theory of the firm, essentially, though. The, the firm being the league. So it's yes. like, I mean, that's all it is. So it's it's... But it's interesting. The reason why it's so interesting is the way the models work, but also it's a closed system with a set of rules. So you can start to actually... But, okay, okay. I'm, I'm learning way too much about sports now, uh, so I'm going to leave. But I want to make my last, yeah, give my last word, go, which is like, it's not the story, it's the player. It's the player that does everything. It's the player, uh, it's the date, it's everything that player does. Uh, from being born, coming into the world, deciding on a sport, uh, becoming good at it, wanting to have a career, getting picked, choosing, you know, choosing, 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 putting, having input into his destiny. That's the, you call that the story? Yeah, I agree, but it's the player, not the story. Sure. All right, guys. With that, I'm going to bed. All right, sure. take care. Good to chat, guys. Uh, Joe, I'll chat. chat to you. I'll chat to you uh, Sunday. Yeah, cool. Sunday. See you then. Bye.